Please take your seats as our program is about to begin. Welcome to the Center for Journalism and Democracy's inaugural Democracy Summit. Please welcome to the stage the president of Howard University, Dr. Wayne A.I. Frederick. Our motto seems to convey a sense of humility, and we simply pursue the truth and use that truth to serve our communities. But there's an audacity to those principles. To pursue truth when there are those who seek to obscure reality requires unflagging courage. And to promote service that appears to compete against others' self-interest requires uncompromising dedication. And to do what is right when there are those who champion what is wrong requires undaunted leadership. There's no profession, no industry that better encapsulates Howard University's mission than journalism. Not only must journalists uncover truths that are so often intentionally concealed, but you are charged with using those truths to fuel your acts of service, to give voice to the voiceless and to strengthen our society so that we can uphold our democracy. Our government is messy, there's no doubt about that, and so is our democracy. But Howard University has continued to be able to lead a caravan of social justice because of, of an initial and recurring act of government. An imperfect government can only work in a high-functioning democracy. On March 2, 1867, the 17th President of the United States, President Johnson, signed a charter to start Howard University, the only federally chartered HBCU. He was a known misogynist and a known racist. And yet still, in that imperfect democracy, he started one of the greatest institutions in America that would give rise to the first African-American female Vice President of the United States. We often say here at Howard, he's probably turning over in his grave pretty regularly. We cannot have government and we cannot have democracy without a robust journalistic enterprise. Journalists are a proof of concept for the type of education that we are trying to cultivate here at Howard University. Of course, we want our students to develop technical expertise and to delve deeply into their chosen fields. But it is also vital that they understand the social context in which their chosen fields operate. And journalists need more than skills, they need knowledge. They have to understand our country's history in order to uncover our society's present day flaws. And you cannot discover truth unless you first have knowledge. One of the primary enemies of progress is misinformation. And journalists play a critical role in our society to counter misinformation and to ensure the foundation of our public debates is grounded in facts. Journalists also elevate the stories and perspectives that often get overlooked. It will be our responsibility to ensure all people have a voice, especially those who are not as well represented in our society. And so when we train journalists, we want to make sure that they recognize the power they have to tell other people's stories. And to do so, they amplify their humanity, because that's why educational institutions like Howard University exist, for the amplification of other people's humanity. The existence of this center and the tremendous impact it will have would not be possible without the dedication, the influence, 
and the tireless effort of Professor Nicole Hannah-Jones. So it is my distinct pleasure to introduce her before she delivers her remarks. Nicole Hannah-Jones is now a member of the faculty of Howard University's Kathy Hughes School of Communications, and she's the inaugural night chair in race and journalism here at Howard University. <laughs> she's a graduate of Waterloo High School in Iowa. She received a Bachelor of Arts in History and African American Studies at the University of Notre Dame, a Master's from the University of North Carolina Hussman School of Journalism and Media, and her work as a journalist took her all around the country. She started with the News and Observer in Raleigh, North Carolina, and in starting her career there, she covered the majority black Durham public schools. During her three years there, she wrote extensively on issues of race, class, school, school resegregation and equity. She worked at the largest daily newspaper in the Pacific Northwest, the Oregonian, where she covered numerous beats, including demographics, the census, and county government. She worked for ProPublica and then spent three years chronicling the way official policy created and maintained segregation in housing and schools. One of the things I like to point out to people is that her work long before the 1619 project was worthy of many awards and had taken her on a journey to uncover truths. An award-winning investigative reporter who covers civil rights and racial injustice for the New York Times Magazine, and obviously the creator of the landmark 1619 Project, an initiative to place the consequences of slavery and the contributions of black Americans at the very center of the story we tell ourselves about who we are as a country. She's won numerous awards, which include Journalist of the Year from the National Association of Black Journalists, a MacArthur Fellowship in 2017. She was named Time Magazine, one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in 2021. She received an honorary doctorate from Morehouse College in 2021. Phyllis Wheatley Book Award for Children's Nonfiction in 2022. Spirit of Justice Award and the NAACP Image Award from the NAACP in 2022. And in 2020, she won the Pulitzer Prize for her commentary work for her 1619 project. So without further ado, I give to you Professor Nicole Hannah-Jones. beautiful and this is beautiful and thank you so much Dr. Frederick. Um, from our first conversation about my coming to Howard University, you have been an advocate, a visionary, and a partner for the work that I hoped to do here. And it is so amazing to see all of you gathered here today. So good morning and welcome to the Mecca. This is a big day for me and a big day for Howard. And I cannot express how much gratitude I feel to see all of us in this space together. We gather here today on what I consider to be hallowed ground. This institution located in the capital of our nation, a capital built in large part by the labor of the enslaved, was founded in 1867, just two years after the abolishment of slavery. This university established to help educate 4 million emancip people emancipated by the Civil War opened with a vision for what democracy in this multiracial nation could look like. In a racist and sexist society, Howard from its start educated Americans regardless of race or gender. We can applaud for that, that's democracy. It is at Howard that in 1924, Zora Neale Hurston, whom I wear uh, on my brooch, um, and Eugene King founded The Hilltop, the oldest black collegiate newspaper in the country. And it was here that the very field of civil rights law was forged in the Howard Law School. My journey to Howard University speaks to the challenges that our society faces. As many of you know, I came to Howard following a tenure battle with my alma mater, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. In a highly polarized political landscape where journalists and journalism were being attacked from the highest offices in the land, I was discriminated against because of the journalistic work that I produced. 
While that experience set me, that set me on this journey was painful, it brought into focus my calling to do more than just produce journalism, but to broaden, expand, and challenge the field at a time when truth, journalism, and our democracy itself were under attack, and newsrooms were struggling to adequately cover what was happening in our nation. Howard is where I am supposed to be in order to provide more opportunities for journalists of color, to invest in black institutions and black journalists specifically, and to push a field that I was called into at the age of 11 years old when my first letter to the editor was published. <laughs> I was nerdy as a child, I still am. But to force our field to really live up to its mandate. And so in coming to teach at Howard, I decided to launch the Center for Journalism and Democracy. And today I welcome you all to our inaugural Democracy Summit. <clears throat> It takes a lot uh, to put on an event like this and to try to build an organization from scratch. It's easy to have an idea. It's hard to bring that idea to fruition. So after more than a year of intense organizational planning, this first of its kind academic institution is here to prepare the next generation of journalists with the hard skills and perspective to cover democracy's modern battles. Using the traditions and perspectives of the black press, we will train journalists at Howard and across the diaspora of HBCUs to engage in historically informed investigative reporting for the common good, reporting that is explicitly pro-equality and explicitly pro-democracy. This center will create visiting professorships to bring practitioners of investigative reporting into the classroom. It will provide training and fin financial support for professors, for students, and campus newsrooms. It will engage student journalists in multi-campus reporting projects that will create the documentary evidence for reparations. And it will convene journalists to collectively learn and plan so that we can produce the type of journalism our fragile democracy requires. A year ago, the Center for Journalism and Democracy was a vision, and so many people have made it possible for us all to be here today. First and foremost, I have to express my gratitude to the three talented and brilliant women who are my colleagues at the center who have been working nonstop for the last few months to launch the center. Ladies, please stand as I call your names. Executive Director Kali Aset Amin. Our Director of Programs, Beverly Turner. And last but never least, my Chief of Staff, Devon Darby, a woman who has been with me since 2017. Wait, wait all thank you all so much. I also want to thank the entire Howard community, especially I am grateful to our provost, Dr. Anthony Wuto. I'm not sure if he's here, but he has been such an amazing supporter for everything that we are doing. Uh, the Dean of the Kathy Hughes School of Communication, Dr. Gracie Lawson Borders. <laughs> Professor Ingrid Sturgis, who is the department chair. <laughs> and all of my colleagues of the Kathy Hughes School of Communications who have welcomed me so graciously. If you're here, could you stand? You all are the beating heart of this learning community, and I'm so honored to be here with you. We all know that historically black colleges have never received the resources and support that they have deserved. So I'm very grateful for the funders who have made this endeavor possible by providing the financial and structural support that can show what HBCUs can accomplish when they don't always have to do more with less. You hear what I'm saying here? Right, these institutions that were, I'm going off script, so let me go back on. <laughs> right, but we are, we are at a place that was designed to deal with the structural disadvantage created through a society built on slavery and racial apartheid. And yet we continue to structurally disadvantage those organizations. And yet, they punch above their weight every time. 
But I was determined when I came to Howard that we were not going to be a program that ran on a shoestring budget that was trying to show the way that we can always make something out of nothing. No, we're going to make something out of something. And that would not be possible without the funders who believed in my mission. I want to thank the Ford Foundation, especially Darren Walker, who was my co-conspirator from the beginning, the MacArthur Foundation and the Open Society Foundation. We are here today because of your faith in the work that we tried to do and your financial support. I want to thank especially the Knight Foundation for your endowment of the Knight Chair in Race and Journalism at Howard University. This is only the second such chair at a historically black college in the nation. So thank you, Knight, for your unwavering support of my work in this role. We are launching the center today with our inaugural Democracy Summit because this is an urgent moment in our country. But the summit is also a reflection of the work that the center is designed to do, to be a convener, thought partner, and incubator for practicing journalists, to insist upon the rigor, skepticism, and importantly, the historical dexterity that must underpin reporting on a democracy that has often failed to tell the truth about itself, to bring budding journalists who reflect the beautiful diversity of America into the profession, I have already begun courses with my brilliant students at Howard, a couple who are seated right here. You want to stand up? <laughs> and I will soon be joined by notable visiting professor, professors who will teach not only Howard students, but those across the center's network of HBCU journalism departments. And so that's why we funded cohorts of HBCU students and journalism educators to be here with us today. So please stand to be recognized as I call out your school. First, welcome to uh, our students, of course, from Howard University. We have students here from the Atlanta University Consortium, Clark Atlanta University, Morehouse College, and Spelman College. Students here from North Carolina Central University. And I have to shout out uh, Calvin Hall. We went to graduate school together. We've known each other for a very long time, so welcome, Calvin. <laughs> Students here from Texas Southern University. And students here from Savannah State University. We also have the Francis Ellen Watkins Harper Fellows from the 19th. It's a fellowship program for graduates of historically black colleges and universities, including my former student, Catherine Gilliard. Please stand. We also have a group of NABJ students from Indiana University and a group of students from Syracuse University. I just met these students when I was out giving talks and told them, you know what, I'll bring you too. So please <laughs> stand up and be recognized. <laughs> it is important when we get in these positions that we don't only secure our own advantage, that we keep that door open and pull others through that door. And these students show the work that we plan to do. We also want to welcome the journalists who were able to attend because the center offered travel stipends to journalists from small and medium newsrooms, as well as journalists that were working for black-owned media. If we want to do our part to save democracy, we have to build spaces that look like democracy. That includes newsrooms, and that includes spaces like these. So we were very careful when we were planning this to try to remove the barriers that are often financial, which of course are a sign of the structural uh, inequality that was built into our nation. So that is why we provided these travel stipends um, so that people who wanted to attend and become a part of this could attend. And it wouldn't just be the big national newspapers with big budgets. So I'm grateful to all who are here and that you have an opportunity to learn today along so many seasoned journalists, the many joining via live stream and the more than 200 journalists and journalism students in this room from across the country representing local and national publications and outlets, including black, Latino, and indigenous media. You all, students and practicing journalists, took time to be here because you care about our craft and you care about our country and its people. Thank you. We are here to do serious work together, to learn from panels that look like America, 
The experts we've gathered here are committed to giving you specific, tangible information about the current state of our democracy and the ways in which its foundation and perpetual inequality ring so loudly today. We are here to openly grapple with how our profession has failed, sometimes with intention, sometimes because of blind spots, and sometimes through a misperception of our role. We have failed to stand for a multiracial democracy. And we are here to find a way forward together. I'm so excited about the brilliant historians, democracy experts, and journalists who each bring their own professional expertise and lived experience to the discussion. And lived experience, because here we don't pretend that our lived experience does not shape our journalism, because it does. <clears throat> Which is actually a beautiful thing, right? Because we do all have a lived experience, and it should. That is the point of diversity in a newsroom, is to bring those varied experiences to create a more accurate report on America. We've worked very hard to ensure that the experts before you look like our nation. We have prepared well to cover such ambitious subjects, but there is more to learn than what we can cover today. To that end, the Center for Journalism and Democracy and the Harkin have collaborated to create an online toolkit to strengthen your reporting and support democracy. We provided a printed introduction to the Democracy Toolkit to everyone attending today's summit, and we invite you and our live stream viewers to explore the full toolkit. Inside the printed introduction, you'll see a QR code that directs you to the full Democracy Toolkit. And if you're watching from home, you can access that toolkit at democracytoolkit.press. This toolkit features expanded speaker profiles from the Democracy Summit, a database of organizations that provide resources to journalists, case studies of newsrooms, best practices, checklists, guides, and actionable strategies to strengthen pro-democracy reporting at your media outlet. Because despite the results of the election last week, despite the results of the election last week, the fight for democracy is not over. I worry that the message some of us will receive is that because election deniers were largely not voted in, that everything will be okay. It will not be okay if we don't do our jobs. The American people will depend on us to be a watchdog over our democracy and to expose the continuing efforts to subvert it. And so the times demand that we liberate ourselves from the old conventions about journalism. We need to accept that our profession's narrative about objectivity has never been true, and that what is passed for objectivity has been a reverence for power and a reverence for those who were trusted to run mainstream media's newsrooms until recently almost always white men. It is time to understand that they, like all of us, have their own perspectives and their own experiences. And it is time to broaden and expand the field of investigative journalism to include reporters, to, to newsroom leaders, journalists who look like America, and who understand that democracy is fallible here. We need to accept the culture of balance and covering both sides impedes our ability to accurately convey to the public whether the ideals of democracy are being challenged or whether they are being protected. Our mandate as journalists must be to choose truth over power and to understand that truth is not partisan. Our mandate is not just to write about what we're observing, but to reveal the history of how we got here and why. Our profession must be more open to criticism and more importantly, engage in more honest self-reflection about the work that we do and how we as humans are fallible and so, so is our work. And we must understand that when it comes to democracy and equality, neutrality is an abdication of our duty. That is why. <clears throat> That is why we are gathered here today. I'm inspired that so many of you, like me, care enough about our country and enough about our craft to spend the day learning together how we can better serve our communities and our nation. So thank you all so much for coming. It is going to be an intense day, but I think it will be a day where we all can come away with knowledge and inspiration. So thank you for coming, and I appreciate you all. Welcome to Howard. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce the speaker who will ground our discussion today with his research on the, on the subversion of the democratic process, how it happens, and how to recognize it. 
I first came across um, this scholar when I read the book, How Democracies Die. And it was a book that helped me to put into words what I was seeing and didn't really understand. So please welcome to the stage the co-author of How Democracies Die, Stephen Levitsky. Hey, everybody. It is a great honor to be here. A uh, big salute to Howard University Center for Democracy and Journalism. Um, apologies that Daniel, my co-author, uh, can't be here today. He's actually having a colonoscopy. I don't know if that's too much information, but he would have been here. It's, it, it's, yeah, it's unfortunate. He's going to kill me for saying it. It's unfortunate. See, unfortunately, he, he's the smart one. I just thought of the title of our book. But I'll do the best I can. Democracies, as you all know by now, do not die like they used to die. Democracies used to die at the hands of men with guns. During the Cold War, three out of every four democratic breakdowns took the form of a military coup. Today, most democracies die in a much more subtle way. They die at the hands not of generals, but of elected leaders, presidents, prime ministers, who use the very institutions of democracy to subvert it. So elections plebiscites, constitutional reforms, acts of parliament, court rulings. This is Putin, it's Chavez, Erdogan, or Orban. What is so dangerous about this new electoral road to authoritarianism is that it happens behind a pretty credible facade of democracy. There are no tanks in the streets. The Constitution remains in place. Elections are still held. Congress continues to operate. And as a result, many citizens aren't fully aware of what's happening until it is too late. Now, the threat to American democracy is greater today than when we wrote How Democracies Die. When Daniel and I wrote our book, we did not consider the Republicans an authoritarian party. We argued that they had abdicated their democratic gatekeeping role by nominating and supporting Trump, but we didn't view the party itself as authoritarian. History has forced us to revise that view. Political parties that are committed to democracy must do three things. First of all, they must unambiguously accept the results of elections. Democracy cannot survive if losers don't accept defeat. Secondly, parties must unambiguously reject the use of violence. And third, democratic parties must break completely and unambiguously with violent and anti-democratic extremists. When you look at democratic breakdowns in Europe in the 1930s, in South America in the 1970s, one lesson is crystal clear. When mainstream political parties tolerate or condone violent extremists on their own flanks, democracy is in trouble. Between November 2020 and January 2021, the Republican Party violated all three of these principles. For the first time in the history of the Republic, a sitting president refused to accept defeat and attempted to overturn an election. When that failed, he incited a violent insurrection. This was an attempted coup. But rather than oppose the coup, Republican leaders enabled it by refusing to recognize the results of the election. The Republican Accountability Project evaluated the public statements of all Republican members of Congress elected in the 2020 cycle to see whether they had publicly cast doubt on the results of the election. 86% of them, 86% of them cast doubts on the election in 2020. And of course, nearly two thirds of House Republicans voted against certification of Biden's victory. I cannot stress to you enough how dangerous this is. Democracy absolutely requires that political parties know how to lose. When a major political party cannot accept defeat, democracy is in trouble. The Republicans also refused to break with the anti-democratic extremists behind the January 6th insurrection. They blocked creation of an independent commission to investigate the insurrection. They refused to hold Trump accountable for the insurrection. And nearly all top Republicans, even today, say they will support Trump if he wins the party's nomination in 2024. Finally, Republicans have increasingly embraced violence. During the 2022 primary season, the New York Times found more than 100 Republican ads in which candidates brandished or fired guns. 
I can think of no other political party in any major democracy on earth in which, can, in which so many candidates openly embrace violence. So beginning in November 2020, the bulk of the Republican Party refused to accept defeat, refused to break with forces that attempted a coup, and began to flirt with political violence. These are clear signs of a political party that is no longer committed to democracy. But why the hell is this happening? Why would a mainstream political party like the Republicans suddenly lose the ability to lose? Daniel and I are writing a second book on this question. We think it is a reaction to multiracial democracy. For political parties to accept defeat, two conditions have to hold. First of all, parties have to believe they, have a, they stand a chance of winning future elections. And secondly, parties have to believe that losing will not bring ruinous consequences. When politicians fear they won't be able to win in the future, or when they or their constituents believe that defeat will bring catastrophe, the stakes rise dramatically. In other words, um, or, or when polit yeah, uh, and, and when, when politicians view um, losing as an existential threat, as something disastrous, they will play to win at any cost. In other words, it is an outsized fear of losing that leads parties away from democracy. Think, for example, about the Democratic Party in the South during Reconstruction. Reconstruction brought widespread black enfranchisement. African Americans constituted a majority or a near majority in most Southern states. So their enfranchisement terrified Southern Democrats and their supporters. Not only did black suffrage threaten Southern Democrats' electoral dominance, it threatened the entire racial order. For Southern whites, that was an existential threat. As Ben Tillman, the notorious white supremacist governor of South Carolina put it, we felt the very foundations of our civilization crumbling beneath our feet, that we were sure to be engulfed by the black flood of barbarians who were surrounding us. Facing what they viewed as an existential threat, the Democrats turned to violence and authoritarianism. They used violent terror and election fraud to seize back power across the South, and then, once in power, they rewrote the rules to dismantle democracy. In 1885 and 1908, all 11 post-Confederate states passed laws that enabled the use of poll taxes, literacy tests, property and residence requirements to eliminate African Americans' voting rights. So black turnout in the South fell from 61% in 1880 to 2% in 1912. Unwilling to lose, Southern Democrats stripped the right to vote from nearly half the population, ushering in nearly a century of authoritarian rule in the South. I say that, or use that example, because Daniel and I believe something similar is happening to the Republican Party today. That process began with America's second attempt at multiracial democracy, following the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act and the 1965 Voting Rights Act. For nearly a century, roughly 90 years after the failure of Reconstruction, the Democratic and Republican parties had, had maintained a political system that was less than democratic, one that excluded most non-white citizens from the political arena and kept civil rights off the political agenda. America became what is sometimes euphemistically called an ethnic democracy, a democracy for white people, which means it wasn't a democracy. You don't have to be a critical race theorist to uh, to arrive at that conclusion, right? By any, by any standard political science definition of democracy, America became a democracy in 1965. Now, the civil rights revolution transformed American politics. The Democratic Party's embrace of civil rights created an opportunity for the Republicans, who at the time were the country's minority party. Many white voters were ill at ease with multiracial democracy. They opposed, they even resented policies aimed at reducing racial inequality, things like busing, affirmative action, economic redistribution. These guys were what we euphemistically call racial conservatives, white voters who were angered by efforts to break down the old racial hierarchies. Republican politicians looked out at the political landscape in the mid-1960s, and they calculated that they could win over these racial conservatives, especially in the traditionally Democratic South, they could become a majority party. So they decided, in Barry Goldwater's words, to go hunting where the ducks were. And the Republicans hunted those ducks relentlessly for two decades. 
Goldwater opposed the Civil Rights Act and campaigned across the South with Strom Thurmond in defense of states' rights. Nixon rolled out the Southern strategy, campaigning against busing and appealing to white fears of black crime and violence. Reagan embraced states' rights, attacked welfare queens, forged an alliance with Southern white evangelicals. And Bush played to white fears with his uh, notorious Willie Horton ad. A quarter of a century of systematic appeals to white resentment paid off. The GOP became America's white Christian party. Never again, never again after 1964 would the Republicans lose the white vote in a presidential election. But it wasn't just any whites who gathered under the Republican tent. It was disproportionately racial conservatives. It was the white voters who were most resistant to multiracial democracy. And this is an important point. Prior to the 1970s, racial conservatives were evenly distributed between the two parties. In other words, both parties had their share of racist voters. But the Republicans spent a quarter of a freaking century recruiting the most fearful and resentful white voters into their camp. They herded the vast bulk of Southern whites from the Democratic Party into the Republican tent. So by the early 21st century, racial conservatives were overwhelmingly concentrated in the Republican tent. Now at first, the Republicans' transformation into America's white Christian party worked wonders at the ballot box. Because America was still overwhelmingly white and Christian in the 1970s, the 1980s, the 1990s, being America's white Christian party was a huge electoral advantage. It allowed the Republicans to become the country's majority party. The Republicans won every single presidential election. Every single presidential election between the passage of the Voting Rights Act and 1988, except for the 1976 Watergate election. That's a pretty good run. But over the long run, the white Christian strategy created a monstrosity. Because, white, because at the same time that, white, that the Republicans were consolidating their white Christian coalition, American society, of course, was changing. It was becoming less white, and it was becoming less Christian. Whereas 80% of Americans identified as white and Christian in 1976, only 43% did so in 2016. In other words, white Christians lost their majority in the 21st century. This had two very important implications for the Republican Party. First of all, it posed an electoral threat. As recently as 1994, when I was in grad school, I'm not that old, Recently as 1994, white Christians were three quarters of this country's electorate. Three out of every four voters considered themselves white and Christian. By 2016, it was down to 43%. So even though the Republican Party kept on winning the white Christian vote, the white Christian vote was a rapidly declining share of the overall electorate. Never again after 2004 would Republicans win the popular vote for the presidency in the United States. By the early 21st century, you could no longer be an exclusively white Christian party and win electoral majorities in America. Think about it, 1980, Ronald Reagan won 55% of the white vote, and that translated into a landslide 44 state victory. In 2012, Mitt Romney won 59% of the white vote. He did better than Reagan among whites, but still lost the election. When Republicans realized that they were winning the white vote but losing the American vote, they started to panic. As Michelle Bachman put it during the 2016 presidential campaign, I don't want to be melodramatic, and I quote, I don't want to be melodramatic, but I believe without a shadow of a doubt that this is the last election. It's a math problem of demographics and a changing United States. If you look at the numbers of people who vote and who live in this country and who Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton want to bring into the country, this is the last election when we'll even have a chance to vote for someone who will stand up for godly moral principles. This is it. But the problem is not just that the Republican Party may face a bleak electoral future. The problem runs deeper than that. The deeper problem is that the Republican base has come to view defeat as catastrophic. For much of the Republican base, the rise of multiracial democracy in the 21st century feels like an existential threat. Because white Christians are not just any group. For two centuries, they sat on top of all of this country's social, economic, 
political and cultural hierarchy. They filled the presidency, Congress, Supreme Court, governor's mansions. They were the CEOs, the pundits, the celebrities, the college professors. For more than 200 years, every single president, vice president, House speaker, Senate majority leader, chief justice of the Supreme Court, Federal Reserve Chair, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the United States was a white man. Every single governor was white until 1989. Every Fortune 500 CEO was white until 1987. White Christians also defined America's national identity. Be, to be American was, for many people, for most people in this country, to be white and Christian. All of that is changing now. It's changing rapidly. It's changing relentlessly. It's changing right before our eyes. These changes are manifesting themselves and manifesting themselves in the households of everyday white Americans in a multiplicity of ways. Soaring rates of interracial dating and marriage, the growing presence of non-whites and mixed race families on televisions and movie screens, mounting challenges to long entrenched historical narratives that downplayed or ignored America's racist past, declining societal tolerance for racist behavior. Diversity is changing the face of American politics. The number of non-white members of Congress has quadrupled since my bar mitzvah. <laughs> Again, I'm not that old. Since 1980, the number of African Americans in Congress has increased from 19 to 64. The number of Latino members of Congress has increased from 9 to 51. The number of Asian American members of Congress has increased from 6 to 18. In 1965, all nine Supreme Court justices were white men. Today, four out of nine Supreme Court justices are white men. Only six of nine are white. And of course, the 21st century witnessed the election of a black president and a black vice president. This is a big deal. For members of a group that used to be an overwhelming majority and which very recently sat on top of all of this country's social, political, cultural, and economic hierarchies, these changes can be pretty traumatic. Losing one's dominant social standing can be deeply threatening. Many Republican voters feel like the country they grew up in is being taken away from them. They feel like they're on the brink, not just, lo not just of losing elections, but of losing their country. The very idea of a white Christian America seems to be slipping away. And that sense of loss has pushed many rank-and-file Republicans towards political extremism. For me, the first real sign of this extremist turn was the rise of the Tea Party in 2009. The Tea Party made Take Our Country Back a mainstream Republican Party slogan. Take our country back from whom? Well, the Tea Party was overwhelmingly white, and it emerged in February of 2009, a month after the first African-American family moved into the White House. They said they were angry about taxes. But survey research subsequent to, to the emergence of the Tea Party shows that the primary driver of support for the Tea Party was hatred for Barack Obama. Donald Trump was another sign of the Republican Party's turn from below towards radical extremism. Don, um, Donald Trump was no accident. Donald Trump won the Republican primaries because he was willing to cross lines that his rivals were not willing to cross. His statements about Muslims, Mexicans, black football players sent a very clear message to Republican primary voters. Trump was willing to defend the old racial hierarchies. That message was the key to his success in the primaries. As Ezra Klein put it, I think very aptly, Trump did not hijack the Republican Party. He understood it. Finally, another manifestation of, again, the, of the Republicans' radicalization is the party's turn towards violence. In a poll last year, 56%, 56% of Republicans agreed with the statement that the traditional American way of life is disappearing so fast that we may have to use force to save it. So this is not just Trump, it is the bulk of the Republican Party. And the Republicans are not radicalizing in response to taxes or Obamacare, they're radicalizing in response to multiracial democracy. So even if Republican elites manage to get rid of Trump this time, they may, they may not, I think the MAGA movement that he represented is likely to remain a powerful anti-democratic force for years to come. Our country today stands at a crossroads. 
America will either be a multiracial democracy in the 21st century or it will not be a democracy. Both roads lie open before us today and there's no turning back. Thank you very much. I don't know what to do now. I, th I think I'd take questions. Right? Yes. Oh, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Vincent Thompson. I'm uh, from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Thank you very much. Um, Donald Trump is announcing his presidency run again today. From what you have indicated, um, that's still the party of power in the Republican Party, those voters. Is it realistic to think that Donald Trump is the front runner to be the Republican Party nominee next year, despite everything the Republicans are saying and, oh, we lost the midterms? But he seems like that hurricane that's just going to continue to go through the Republican Party. So should People really, because I was at the Republican convention and I saw it as a reporter. I saw it. Like, I saw the Trump love. And I told the world, like, it's coming. Then people were like, no, it's not. So I was not surprised. Should we not take him for granted and think despite the losses, he's still going to be the Republican Party nominee? Thank you. Thanks for the question. The uh, political si economists are really bad at predicting the future and political scientists are worse than economists. So don't take any prediction that I make seriously. If our theory is right about where the Republican rank and file is, particularly Republican primary voters, where they are and what moves them, I think you have to take Donald Trump seriously in the primaries. I think if I had to bet a dollar, I would bet on Trump in the primaries. But let me say one other thing which is if Trump loses, if Trump, if he decides to run in the primaries and he's defeated, he will not be defeated to his moderate left. He will be defeated to his right. Somebody will out-Trump Trump. They may not be as quite as loony, they may not be as personally nutty as Trump. They may not be sort of catch up on the wall, but they, in terms of their positions on race and culture, they will, be to, they will outflank Trump to the right. That's where the, the, the energy in the Republican Party base is. So it'll be Trump, or if, if for, from the standpoint of multiracial democracy, somebody worse than Trump who wins the primary. Yes. Oh, sorry. All I heard was poli sci minor. Good for you. <laughs> but sorry. Hi, my name is Jordan Taylor. I am a junior honors journalism major, political science minor from Toledo, Ohio. I would like to ask, um, how, I would like to ask, like, what is your view on the Republican Party's manipulation of race in terms of putting new faces into their party and trying to kind of manipulate the horizon there? Thank you. It's a, it's a great question. I mean, um, since, as uh, political scientist Tali Mendelberg has argued, since 1964, it's, it has not been okay politically to be old school racist, to openly embrace white supremacy. Since 1964, politicians who wanted to make racialized appeals had to use some sort of code. And even Don, I mean, Donald Trump comes about as close to old school open racism as anyone has since, since George Wallace, but even he, Face limitations. I think so. Most Republican voters, although they are hostile to challenges to old racial hi hierarchies, do not ask them. They don't consider themselves racist. They don't like to think of themselves racist as racist. So my guess is that it um, makes them feel awful good to be able to vote for a black candidate um, because they that it, it enables them to say, hey. You know, I, I, I'm, I care about saving America or ta something else. It's not, a, it's not race that's driving my vote if I'm voting for Herschel Walker. Um, that's what I think the strategy is about. Um, sir. Uh, 
Um, my name is Micah Speed, thank you. Um, oh, sorry, I'm Micah Speed. I'm from North Carolina Central University. I am a political science and mass communications major. I had... I'm only calling on political scientists. I'm okay with that. I had a quite interesting question to ask you. How do we prevent radicalization into political extremism from happening to us, especially since the death of democracy is the growing fear that we have? Can I just ask, follow up one thing? Who, who is us? Black thinkers who most often align themselves with the Democratic Party, so the Democrats. Okay, um, that's a great question um, because polarization very often triggers polarization. And there is good reason to think, uh, although people disagree, scholars of democracy disagree, there's good reason to think that a polarized democratic or progressive response um, would worsen things, would, um, would, uh, prob would likely provoke further radicalization and justify violence. I think it's, I don't know how to, I don't know how to get the Democratic Party to do anything. Um, <laughs> I, I'm just a political science professor. But I, but I do think there are good reasons why the Democrats won't radicalize. The biggest reason, there's a huge difference between the Democratic and Republican parties. The Republican party, given how heterogeneous this country of ours is, the Republican party is a remarkably, remarkably homogeneous party. They're not all white and Christian, but they sure as hell are mostly white Christian. And so when, when you are a homogeneous political party, it's very easy to act in a cohesive, in a coherent, cohesive way, to act in a disciplined way, and to, 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 to uh, adopt and maintain a, a clear ideology, a clear platform, and, and a clear set of behaviors. Democrats are the opposite of that. The Democrats are, uh, represent everybody else in this country, which is a very, very heterogeneous, diverse you know how diverse that, uh, regionally diverse, racially diverse, diverse in terms of ideology, diverse in terms of, of wealth, diverse on almost every dimension you can imagine. That makes a lot of things really hard. I mean, during, during an election campaign, you cannot pick up a newspaper, I'm sorry, I'm from the 20th century, I pick up newspapers. Click on, you cannot click onto a newspaper without finding, a, every day, without finding a newspaper column of usually some, some guy older than me complaining about how the Democratic Party can't get a message together and ca is, can't get it together. And it's, it's because the Democratic Party is a huge, heterogeneous, diverse mess. That has pros and cons. It means that they can't ever have a really clear message. It, they can't ever have a really clear discipline strategy. But it also means that the party inevitably is going to be pretty pragmatic, pretty slow moving. And I think that will inhibit radicalization. Yes. Hello, my name is Jasper Smith. I'm a junior journalism major from Phoenix, Arizona, and I'm also the editor in chief of The Hilltop. So. Oh, so my question is, what does it mean for democracy and what kind of precedent does it set for an impeached president, someone who attempted a coup to even rerun for presidency? It's a, it's a terrible precedent. Uh, let me try to say a little bit more. Um, in, a, in a healthy democracy, all major political actors um, play by democratic rules and all major political parties only work with, only align with, only support politicians who play by democratic rules. When a, when a political party nominates somebody who has supported a coup or somebody who has encouraged violence or endorsed violence, um, that is what, what the old political science, Spanish political scientist Juan Linz called semi-loyal democratic behavior. Semi-loyal democratic behavior, supporting or tolerating, backing, political actors who have, uh, who have engaged in anti-democratic behavior 
That is a threat to democracy. It's the kind of behavior that you see preceding the breakdown of democracy. And, and you know, to put this in, in some perspective, I study, my day job is to study Latin America. I study Latin American democracies. You don't even see this sort of behavior in most of Latin America. In Argentina, where I uh, wrote my first book, Argentina had six military coups in the 20th century. It had a really, really uh, difficult time sustaining democracy. It's one of the most unstable democracies in the world in the 20th century. Argentine democracy today gets a higher democracy score from Freedom House than the United States does. And that's because nobody in, none of the major political parties in Argentina would, will or would support a candidate who's tried to overturn an election. This is the kind of behavior that occurs in democracies in trouble. Yes, in the green jacket, yes. Sorry, I don't know how to select questioners. Why don't we do the two of you in order? I'm just trying to make you walk as much as you can, so. Yeah. Hello, my name is Nada Mergani, and I am the editor-in-chief of the Campus Echo at North Carolina Central University. Um, thank y'all, thank y'all. Uh, when I was listening to you talk about violence, I'm sure like similarly to other people in this room, I thought about Paul Pelosi. Uh, so my question is like, we've seen an increase of violence against candidates and their partners and their children, uh, do you believe that this violence will have a limit, or should we as journalists be bracing ourselves for stories about candidates being murdered in 2024? Again, uh, really, really hard to, um, to predict the future. But um, as long, I mean, as, as long as the Republican Party is flirting with violence in its rhetoric to the point where you can identify a hundred different candidates in primaries, brandishing or firing guns in their TV commercials. As long as that's the case, there, and as long as there are as many Americans who are armed as there are, there's going to be a high risk of, of violence. Um, I cannot predict exactly how much, what the trajectory will be, but it will, it's not until Republican leaders come out and unambiguously and uniformly, every single damn one of them, from Trump, to McCarthy, to McConnell, every one of them, when there is a, an act of violence, they come out and unambiguously denounce it, unambig no, none, no ifs and buts, no hiding beneath the table, no, no justification, no winking, no nothing, none of that crap. It's, until the Republican Party stops bringing the McCloskey couple, the, the couple that, that took their guns out in, the, in front of their house during the, in, in St. Louis, and puts them on stage at the Republican convention, until Republicans stop nominating Kyle Rittenhouse for a Medal of Honor, until that shit stops, there's going to be a threat of violence. It's, it's, it's not a, there's no, you know, there's no mechanical relationship, but it creates a climate in which violence is much more likely. If Republicans actually behaved like small d Democrats and consistently, forcefully condemned violence, even from their own supporters, you would see the level of, the level of threat go down. Yes. Oh, wait, 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 no, wait, sorry, I promise we're, we'll get you next. What happened? Um, my name is Denise Clay Murray, and I co-host a show called Philadelphia Hall Monitor that looks at city hall and city politics in Philadelphia, and also statewide and, and nationwide elections. And, for those of you who are students here and are in the Philadelphia area or anywhere close to it, we're going to be looking for interns soon, so please see me before I leave. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about class and what part it plays. Um, right now I'm doing some research on voter turnout in poor sections of Philadelphia, which is considered the poorest big city of its size in the nation right now. But yet you have a lot of these white Christians that also live in Appalachia, where poverty has been an issue forever and ever. So I'm wondering, have, have you, I guess, how do you 
blatantly vote against your own interests like that, is, is proximity to whiteness really that important where you'd rather have people who have basically voted against everything you need running your country? Yeah, I mean, you have mostly answered your question, I think. Um, <laughs> cl cl class matters. Material interests matter. But material interests are not and have never been the only re thing that drives people's votes. People have other interests. And in, uh, unfortunately, people worry a lot about their perceived or relative social status. Status matters. Um, Religion matters, and obviously race matters. And so this is not the first time in the United States that, that uh, class has not been the, the driving force behind the poor white vote, uh, and it probably won't be the last. But in, in the United States, there was, a, there was a slight relationship between income and voting in the, in the late 20th century, um, but in the last few elections, there has been no relationship at all between income and, and voting. And that's because for Americans, other things matter more. What does that mean? I, oh, I can't go. I have to leave the stage. OK. Thank you, everybody. They rejected my request for Nicki Minaj to bring me out on stage. Just playing, just playing, just playing, just playing. Uh, so just quickly, uh, if you are, if you are tweeting or posting on Instagram, the hashtag is CJD Democracy Summit. So please um, share on social. And also, uh, I was remiss when I was shouting out the HBCU cohorts that were here. I didn't mention North Carolina A&T, so North Carolina A&T, please stand. Oh. And apparently, I also forgot FAMU, so Florida A&M University. Please stand, stand, stand. So welcome. OK, so that was, um, you see why I love that book. It's such pertinent information to help us understand the context of what we're seeing today. So our next discussion is going to be led by Howard University School of Law Dean Danielle Holly, who will feature two brilliant observers of how propaganda works, particularly how it works on the media to perpetuate misinformation and disinformation. So there will be a 35-minute discussion with 10 minutes for uh, Q&A at the end. So please welcome to the stage Danielle Holly, Jason Stanley, and Ruth ben Giat. Good morning, everyone. Oh, we can do better than that. Good morning. Good morning. We are so excited to be here this morning to talk about all of the fuel for propaganda and authoritarianism. We have two outstanding panelists with us today. We have Jason Stanley, who is professor of philosophy at Yale University. He's the author of most recently, How Propaganda Works, and how fascism works. We also have Ruth Ben Gayet, who is a scholar on fascism and authoritarian leaders and a history professor at NYU. Ruth is a historian who writes about authoritarianism, democracy protection, and propaganda. She is professor of history and Italian studies at New York University and the recipient of the Guggenheim and other fellowships and advisor to protect democracy. She is an MSNBC opinion columnist a regular contributor to CNN and the Washington Post and provides live commentary on CNN, MSNBC, and other networks. 
She publishes Lucid, a newsletter on threats to democracy, and her latest book, Strong Men, Mussolini to the Present, looks at how illiberal leaders use propaganda, corruption, violence, and machismo, and how they can be defeated. So we'll start this panel with some five-minute introductory talks, first by Ruth and then by Jason. So Ruth, come on up. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, thank you to Nicole Hannah-Jones for organizing this and to all the journalists and journalism students for being here. It's fateful that um, this event takes place the day that Donald Trump might be um, announcing his 2024 run for office. No one did more to change the image of journalists uh, in the negative and debase the truth and fact-based inquiry than he did. And we often hear uh, that Trump was incompetent or lazy, but he's one of the most disciplined and effective propagandists of the 21st century, truly. And so I'm mentioning this because there's going to be decisions made about covering him. Um, propaganda is about changing the way people think. Coming to power in a democracy with an open media environment, Trump had to work really hard and consistently on his goals. And of course, one of these goals was creating a big tent for and elevating racists and extremists of all sorts. And in fact, um, building on what Steve was saying, a through line of my book, Strongmen, is that every time there's been, when to strongmen appeal, it's, been, it's when there's been periods of great strides in racial emancipation, gender equality, workers' rights. And then these guys come up and they say, no, we're gonna turn the clock back. So, he wanted to change the association that Americans had with violence, too. And he used his rallies, and I did a report for the January 6th committee on this. Um, he used his rallies to kind of radicalize people and tell them that violence could be good, necessary, and even patriotic. And of course, he depicted journalists as public enemies. And all of this is consistent with the history of authoritarianism, which evolves around the destruction of transparency and accountability and the suppression of information that can harm the leader. So I want to just say two things about personality cults. They proclaim the leader to be infallible, omnipotent, and a savior of the nation, a defender. So think about Putin with his shirt off. There's a whole lineage of this. But this is important. He has to also be a victim. A cult of victimhood is really important to the strongman. And he takes the hits for the nation, and he is the subject of witch hunts, right? And this is, these are through lines in authoritarianism. And today, Erdogan, is Berlusconi, everybody has to be the victim. I wrote an essay for my newsletter called Always the Victim. So um, this double masculine image of the victim and the brute is very compelling to, to cult followers. And research shows that when um, radicalized followers who have put the leader at the center of their lives, if they feel the leader is going down or endangered, they can be drawn to do violence on his behalf. And that's what January 6th was also about. It was many things, but it was also that. I really saw it as a leader cult rescue operation. And I'm saying this because <laughs> This man is uniquely dangerous, and if he comes back onto the presidential race, we really have to keep all of this in mind. We're in a truly unusual situation. Around the world, we're talking Indonesia, Guatemala, other countries, all leaders who tried a self-coup, which is what Trump's coup was, a self-coup, and failed, they had to go into exile, they were put in prison, they were in disgrace. Only here do we have this guy running around free, and still inciting violence, and maybe will be running for president. So just to conclude, if he declares his candidacy, and there's all this interesting stuff with the GOP forsaking him, perhaps, be ready for anything. Be ready for an acceleration of victimization rhetoric, uh, threats of violence, appeals as being the victim to his followers. And remember that no one is more desperate than a strong man who thinks his time is over. And the reason I was able to predict in my book, uh, which I had to give in in 2020, that he wouldn't leave office uh, quietly is that it's like a psychological death for them. They can't stand to, to, to not have the acclaim anymore, also the money he's fleecing his supporters. And so they will do anything 
to stay in power or get back to power. So I'll stop there. I know we're going to have a lot to talk about. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be at Howard. My mother-in-law and father-in-law were married in the chapel here, and I grew up, I mean, I grew up, but uh, since I was, for many years, I've been hearing about this institution. Um, so I'm going to, uh, I'm going to just, in the bullet point style, list five points that I think that are just in takeaway points that I want to focus on. Uh, and I'll say a little bit about each one, but I'm going to begin by just listing these five points, um, which I think, you know, journalists are teachers, and so, uh, so these five points are things that uh, I try to emphasize in my courses on propaganda, um, and I think they're important to bear in mind. So first, call attention to patterns. Uh, you know, stop acting like stuff is new when it's in fact a pattern. Two, no false equivalences. Uh, three, pay attention to the world. Four, there is an attention economy. And five, there is no such thing as neutral vocabulary. So now let me talk about each one, a little bit about each one. So, uh, so in my, I teach a big lecture course at Yale called Propaganda, Ideology, and Democracy. And we do six weeks just on race and crime, because that is a pattern in the United States. My colleague Elizabeth Hinton calls, calls it the cycle. There's uh, black protest against police violence, uh, followed by uh, revolutions, as she describes it in her book, America on Fire, followed by calls to recognize the problem, and the community says, OK, let's fix things followed by a harsh white backlash. This pattern repeats and repeats and repeats through, through American history. Um, you know, we, we start in my class with Ida B. Wells' Southern Horrors in 1892, Frederick Hoffman's Race Traits of the American Negro, Du Bois's Response. It's all through crime. Change the topic to crime. Um, so this changing the topic to crime uh, is a constant American pattern that, that allows for authoritarianism. Um, because you switch to law and order. Uh, Vashla Weaver, in her famous paper, Frontlash, calls this Frontlash. You, you, after the Civil Rights Movement, there was an intentional changing of the topic to law and order. Uh, in, and then the building of the mass incarceration state. So recognize patterns. Don't fall in for like, oh my god, crime. Uh, and then there's a huge literature on this one. There's, there's a move space. People say, oh, but many black Americans are very concerned about crime. Well, James Foreman wrote a Pulitzer Prize winning book called Locking Up Our Own on this problem. So there's, there's an inform yourself about how these patterns work. Uh, no false equivalences. Uh, look at in, uh, in 2015, the free speech on campus stuff. Uh, oh, look, there's left-wing authoritarianism during the rise of Trump. And opinion, opi the, the leading newspapers were doing this false equivalency. Um, a, a particularly bad false equivalency is the Fox News BLM January 6th false equivalency, which is absurd, because in one case, you're addressing racial injustice. In the other case, you're, uh, you're trying to overthrow the United States democracy. <laughs> so, uh, and also, one was nonviolent, the other was violent. Um, three, pay attention to the world. There are structures and patterns that are all around the world. So Bolsonaro ran against, uh, ran against Paulo Freire, you know, undermining the nation. Uh, here they run against Nicole Hannah-Jones and Kimberly Crenshaw. Like you have to have this cultural enemy that is tarnishing your nation. Um, Malone, the anti-trans campaign. Both Giorgio Maloney and Vladimir Putin said, this is about you know, w preserving womanhood, allowing parent, making sure parents are not parent number one and parent number two. So pay attention to the world. Um, four, there's an attention economy. If you give X percent of your opinion page over to a problem, 
then people will assume that X percent of the importance is that problem. So there is an attempt, and then people respond by saying, oh, well, maybe it's not as important as the other problems, but I'm still going to talk about it. Well, that is just uh, ignoring, willful ignorance of the fact that there's an attention economy. Finally, there's no such thing as neutral vocabulary. So journalists try to come up with neutral terms for, uh, for, for, uh, for phenomena. When and what we philosophers can tell you, there's a long literature on how there's no neutral term for lots of ordinary concepts. What's the neutral term for generous? What's the neutral term for selfish? What's the neutral term for kind? And finally, what's the neutral term for lying or fascism? There is none. Thank you. Very good. So as you've seen, this panel is really about how the media can succumb and promote both misinformation and disinformation and the role that the media really has in fighting back against propaganda and extremism. So I want to focus our first question on that, which is talk to us about how does the media play a role in normalizing both misinformation and disinformation, but also extremism. Um, is my mic on? Yeah. So the point about language um, is really important. We have to be very thoughtful about what language we're using. And I see it's very easy to, um, it's not really laziness, it's just conformism. It's easy to mimic um, the rights language. So these, and, and there's a kind of Orwellian doublespeak that is going on, it's very effective. Think about the buzzword <clears throat> election integrity. The point of election integrity is to prevent actual integrity of elections, to prevent free and fair elections. But the right has been extremely able at finding these buzzwords. And then they get repeated, not only on the right, which has a formidable propaganda machine, um, but they get repeated in other places. And in that way, they get normalized. So <clears throat> we have to be very careful. Um, I don't even like the term culture wars, for example, because it erases the real world violence that results from attacks on people trying to teach us about racism. So that's, that's a point there. Be very thoughtful about the language you use because there are too many people trying to give you a language right now that erases the real problems. So I'm gonna go back to a point, to a, a, an era that I focus a lot in my work, the 1990s, which, so crime starts dropping in like 1991, 1993, but both parties turn to the Republican Southern strategy of, uh, of just, running on crime and violent streets. And, and what happened, super, if you look at like the first line of, of um, John DiUlio's super predator paper, 1995 paper called My Black Crime Problem and Yours, he starts out by saying, crime has been dropping recently. So, you know, the, 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 but keep the champagne cork, champagne cork, because I predict it's gonna shoot up. So when, both political parties uh, uh, take, take on something in order to uh, make it an issue, the journalist is supposed to fact check. The journalist is not supposed to agree that there's a substantial problem there. The journalist is supposed to fact check and see whether what we've got is a, a moral panic, a white backlash, one of these structures. Don't take what the political parties are saying for granted. I would argue that the rash of laws on mass incarceration in the 90s were political extremism. Yeah, I think so much when you, especially are looking at cable news, I think one of, and even I think a lot of paper journalism, the almost fear of talking about authoritarianism and especially relating it to things that are happening in the United States. So can you talk a little bit about why are we so hesitant in this country to talk clearly about authoritarianism and how it can rise in the United States? 
Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that question. I, I was one of the earliest people uh, to call Trump an authoritarian. And in fact, I just fished out an article I wrote in The Atlantic in August 2016 about the danger of Trump being a kind of fascist figure like Mussolini. And that at the very end, they said that um, the dangers at the GOP will be reduced to ruins, that he, would gonna wreck, he was going to wreck the party. And so I was thinking about that the other day. So there's been a huge reluctance to, you know, the, the can't happen here thing. And that can't happen here thing is based on a fantasy idea of America, the oldest democracy, when indeed, you know, the democracy didn't start till the 1960s, and a suppression of knowledge about the, the double identity of America, which which is this incredible experiment in multiracial democracy that is so threatening to many, but also helped to wreck democracies abroad. Um, and I really wanted in my book Strongman to include, I, I chose uh, Chile, the, the US-backed coup, because that they engineered the death of democracy and pioneered a playbook that's being used by Michael Flynn and other people in the United States today. So, but also there's a moral question. If you, if you start recognizing that there is an authoritarian threat, you might have to do something about it, <laughs> right? You, as, as a citizen, <laughs> um, you might also, it's very difficult for the journalistic objectivity. What the hell do you do, right? So I, not being a journalist, was very free to denounce and to name, and naming we know, naming things is really important, right? So, but there's a lot of fear and um, that's why the knee-jerk um, idea that you're an alarmist and you're just destructive. Because there's a lot of fear and a lot of aversion to recognizing what's in front of us. And the final thing I'll say is, so when I wrote Strongmen, which was case studies from all around the world, every culture went through this. <laughs> Nobody wanted to recognize what was in front of them. And so that's, that's something to think about. <laughs> Um, so, in 1995, Toni Morrison gave an address at Howard University called Racism and Fascism, that's incredibly influential on me, where she says, the United States, she, instead of talking about fascist leaders or fascist regimes, she talks about fascist solutions to national problems and fascist practices. And Toni Morrison says, America has often preferred fascist solutions to national problems. So, I, I, feel, I, I, I feel that term fascism, capture, racial fascism, captures the structure, st certainly captures the structure of the second Ku Klux Klan, uh, which overlaps. We know, it, it, you know, I'm, I'm a critical race theorist, so for my conception of ideology is that ideology is formed at it, has, as its basis a nation's laws. And our Jim Crow laws directly resulted in the Nuremberg laws that stripped my father of his citizenship when he was a three-year-old living in Berlin. Those were, um, Jim Whitman shows that the Nuremberg laws, which are sort of the core definitional laws of Nazi Germany, were based on the Jim Crow laws, anti-miscegenation laws, uh, except they thought that the anti-miscegenation laws in the US were too extreme. <laughs> so, uh, so we've had this racial fascist history, it's not clear to me if we've ever had a democratic culture in many of our states. Many of our, right after, right after the civil rights movement via front lash, many of the southern states turned to mass incarceration as a tool, uh, breaking the labor movements. So, so I feel that one barrier is if we started using the term fascist, we'd have to confront our own history and our own ideology more directly uh, World War II, which we fought, by the way, with segregated troops, uh, is our excuse for not facing our history. Uh, and, uh, and that is why, you know, it's, it's too horrific to face that, you know, much of our country has not been a liberal democracy yet. So the term anticipatory obedience Talk to us about what that term means and what the connection between anticipatory obedience is to authoritarianism. Yeah, it's absolutely fundamental. Uh, it's when you, uh, you self-censor 
when you um, normalize um, a sense of threat to the extent that you change your behavior without authorities yet having to do it. So you do the work of the authorities for them. And there are many, um, and here we get to the way that our institutions um, mirror, whether it's, uh, you know, don't be noisy about racism or, or being uh, punished for speaking out about uh, being harassed, sexually harassed or other harassment. And so anticipatory obedience is deciding that, and, and, you, and one receives many prompts, oh, don't do that, you might ruin your career. So just, just obey. But in an authoritarian setting, it's that you, your behavior ends up um, shaping a culture of violence and shaping a culture of corruption. It's very important in corruption, anticipatory obedience. And so you hurry along the norms that are used to repress you. So the paradox of authoritarianism, it's so tragic that people are, you know, at rallies and they're voting for somebody who's going to take their rights away. And anticipatory obedience is crucial in that. So we're seeing anticipatory obedience all over and have been for some years at our institutions. It's an attitude which is like, okay, uh, how do we protect the institution if there's fascism? Uh, we're loyal to the institution. So, okay, maybe let, it's a bit of a shock that our, uh, we're not anymore on this movement towards a multiracial democracy, but we should preserve Yale, you know, uh, because Yale has to survive come what may. All people who run, uh, administrators understand this, all business people understand this. So people slowly get used to, okay, so how do we, well, I was writing for, I mean, I won't implicate the, the newspapers that told me this, but I had many newspapers tell me in 2016, 20, at the end of 2016, okay, we're taking a cautious wait and see attitude, we're not gonna write, accept your flame, flaming editorials for a little while. Uh, so, uh, but it's institutions thinking, okay, maybe we can adapt to authoritarianism. And that actually makes, as, as, as Ruth said, the authoritarian path easier. Can I just add one? Um, I'm really, I'm very, I guess sad is the right word. I'm seeing this uh, in the, the big media companies. And I, and I studied for my book, the case of Berlusconi, who owned TV networks and was an authoritarian president, a huge precursor of Trump. And he created a culture of anticipatory obedience in all the media properties. And so I'm seeing the famous case of CNN, which I'm very attached to because they gave me my start um, doing um, citizen journalism or whatever we want to call it. But um, the things going on there, um, ending, you know, firing Brian Stelter and taking away Don Lemon's show, which I think is a really big deal. I'm putting him in the morning, so he's chit-chat. Those are things that are done out of corporate self-protection. And that is, and, and when you have the political um, climate that we have right now, that is, a, that is an example of anticipatory obedience. Could I say something about a previous question that I think, I, so the question was why are Americans, why is American exceptionalism, why is it so hard to think of authoritarianism as a real possibility here? To which my response was, Authoritarianism, fascism is here, was here. Uh, you know, it's a, that's why our history, that's why 1619 Project, projects like that are so vital. Uh, but it also shows that we have an anti-fascist tradition here. We've been fighting this here. So if you hide the fascism, then you're also hiding the civil rights movement. You're hiding the long history of anti-fascism that other country, countries, frankly, don't have. Really important point. I want to pick up on something that Stephen was talking about earlier, and that is great replacement theory. Um, and I wanted to ask you, explain a little bit more about what great replacement theory is, and what is the connection between great replacement theory and authoritarianism? Uh, so I'm going to start with uh, my colleague Jennifer Richardson's tw and, and a 2014 experiment. Um, so great replacement theory is what uh, Professor Levitsky was saying, like uh, you're, the dominant group's gonna be replaced. What Jennifer Richardson, a social psychologist at Yale showed, is that this, uh, this thinking, just priming this thinking, 
makes people much more right-wing. So here's the experiment. She had three groups of Americans. One group she told in 2042 the U.S. is going to be majority senior citizen. The second group she said in 2042 the U.S. is going to be, the Netherlands is going to be majority minority. And the third group she told in was primed with in 2042 the United States will be majority minority. Then she asked them a series of political questions about affirmative action, about immigration, about defense spending, and about man-made climate, human-caused climate change. The third group, primed with great replacement theory, was much more right-wing on all of them. They, they, were much more, they were more skeptical of human-caused climate change. They wanted more defense spending. So this is why the psychology of great replacement theory Madison Grant's 1916 book, The Passing of the Great Race, that so influenced Adolf Hitler. Um, it, it's a psychological mechanism for making people feel fearful and anxious. So here's the thing. We talk a lot about polarization, which, you know, you get rid of the middle, us versus them. But we're really, great replacement theory is part of what I call survivalism, where it's, it's you or me. It's not us versus them, it's you or them and only one of us is gonna survive because we're gonna be extinct. And so great replacement theory is an example of how, and unfortunately studies of political violence show that if you wanna get people to break taboos and start you know, chopping, off, chopping up their neighbors and their communities and go and do taboo breaking things, you have to get them in a state of mind that they think they're in mortal danger. There's an existential threat. And this goes with the discourse on crime and anarchy and all the Fox News BS that they do to get people in this state. But great replacement theory, which literally says you're going to be extinguished, um, is very, very important. And, and Trump, um, at January 6th, he had a version of this where he said, if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. There'll be nothing left. So we, there are many different... Uh, areas in which we're being bombarded with survivalist ideologies to get people, and that's why we have all these polls. Oh, you know, what percent of Americans think that violence is justified? It's the effect of these survivalist ideologies, and unfortunately, history shows that they work. They do get people into this froth of hatred and anxiety. Um, so, so that's a, part a, of it. A couple more points on this. Obviously, it's a very important pattern because everyone has mentioned it so far today. Uh, and note that the attack on trans, trans communities is great replacement theory. They're going to replace women. They're going to replace genders. They're going to replace women. You know, that's the... Uh, so uh, so th it takes that, that, that form. Um, and, and yes, it's, it is great, great replacement theory is, uh, is genocidal speech, as, as Ruth said. It's the, the fundamental concept of genocidal speech is existential threat. And you, you describe someone as an existential threat, then you can do anything uh, against them. Hence, as Ruth also said, the crime discourse. Good. So, Ruth, your book, Strong Man, um, focuses on cults of personality. So how do we focus on a party versus an individual person? And how much do individual leaders versus a party affect or create anti-democratic movements? Yeah, there is a debate. Um, and when my book came out, I will say it got bashed in the New York Times the day it came out, which I was totally bummed about, by Francis Fukuyama, who now recently published a piece in The Atlantic um, espousing all the things he bashed me for. So that was a, an, a big bummer. But one of them was the focus on leaders. Um, yeah, and then we get into credibility, who's allowed to say, who's allowed to take on a big project about global authoritarianism, all that. But um, the focus on leaders. Leaders uh, are extremely important when you have a charismatic, de charismatic demagogue who relentlessly propagandizes. And what Trump was able to do, the reason I, my, my little speech was a little Trump-focused, is that he truly, he did what strongmen have done in the past, where there's, it's a meeting of circumstance and personality. So people were ready for a Trump. 
because they were so, they never accepted eight years of Obama. They didn't accept what he did. He brought women into combat, legalized same-sex marriage. All of this was like incredibly threatening. And so Trump read the marketplace and he knew he could elevate all the racists. He could tell them he loved them. They were very fine people. And he made this big, <laughs> big, I know. Can you see I've been studying him for too long? Um, he made this big tent for all of them. And he gave a dynamism to this, he created a movement. In fact, he used to call it a movement, right? So he mattered, he hugely mattered. But what he did to the party is just like, it's astonishing. So, because sometimes like Mussolini created his own party, Berlusconi created his own party. Trump comes from outside. In a very short period of time, he domesticates this party because he did it because he was very clear that he was an autocratic leader. No internal dissent, right? And so, so he, he made the party his personal tool to the point where if people voted for him to be uh, impeached, they, Republicans, they had to go by body armor. And there are these reports of senators crying out of fear. And then, of course, look what happened on January 7th. They did not uh, denounce him, right? So the party, he gave permission to people to be lawless. And he gave permission to be a certain kind of president breaking taboos every single day. Um, also with his corruption. So he, these, these figures in history, they liberate these energies that were there, but were in some people dormant. And so that's why um, they, they don't work alone. You have elites, you have parties, but they are hugely uh, influential at certain times in history. Right. Um, if you have a question, we're about to go into our Q&A period, and so pretty soon we will have mics available for you to ask questions of our panelists. I want to ask one last question of the panel. Talk to me about intent. So I think one of the most frustrating uh, things to us as lay people when we watch um, or read media is this search for intent. Is the leader, is Trump in particular, is he doing this intentionally? Is it because of lack of competence? And is this something that's seeping into our coverage for the upcoming presidential election in 2024 as it relates to Ron DeSantis? Do we need to, should journalists be focusing on so much on the intent of our leaders? I, I don't think so because fascism is about power. And so it's a particularly powerful set of strategies to use to win elections. I don't care what's in these people's hearts. They're using scapegoating, great replacement theory, strongman machismo, patriarchy, politics, as Ruth so aptly and ably lays out in her work, uh, to win an election. And uh, some of them, like Orban, are doing it cynically. Uh, you know, Orban was a liberal in the 90s. Now he was, I was just in Poland. These journalists were saying, you, you know, you're saying Poland is fascist, but in Hungary, no journalists would be interviewing you. In other words, the country that are, uh, that were, the Republican Party's looking to, they're looking to because it explicitly crushed its free press. Uh, and uh, so intent, I think, I think intent, if we look at intent, you know, uh, sure, Hitler was a genocidal anti-Semite, but you can easily think of leaders who created, who, who just see uh, that these are methods that will allow them to seize power and enrich themselves. Uh, and if we focus so much on the, on the beliefs, we're missing the very nature of ideology, which is Morrison emphasizes is about practices. Yeah, I agree with all that. Um, the thing about these strongman figures is that <clears throat> they, the reason they, they end up with these like weird constituencies of like gangsters and priests and housewives, and it was the same with M M Mussolini, it was the same with Berlusconi, is because they read the marketplace and they will be, they have no moral code, they're all incredibly opportunist and transactional. And Trump has the same, um, unfortunately for us, he has the same personality as like Mobutu and others, he, the outcome is different. We're not in the 20th century dictatorship thing. But they will be whatever you need them to be. They will say whatever the crowd needs to hear. And in that way, they are opportunists. They do have 
core ideologies and goals, like Trump's always been a racist. And in fact, what he said, the quote I just said to you before about January 6th, that we, if you don't fight like hell, there won't be a nation anymore. He first said it in 2014 to conservatives. So he hasn't really changed. <laughs> he, he, he is who he is. It's just that he found a broader stage for himself. So, but I, I have a, a, a running uh, dispute with Maggie Haberman in our DMs on Twitter. Because she, she, as you know, she doesn't think there's any intent and it's all just making it up as he goes along. And I see the patterns, what Jason said before. Uh, the, the structures of governance with the inner circle, putting the family there, all of these things are intent to defraud the nation. There are goals. His goals were just not the goals of, an, of an, a past president of either party. His goals were making money off the presidency, radicalizing people, launching a race war, and you know having a personality cult so he would be immune from harm and domesticating the party. And there was... There was clear intent with those things. And I just want to point out that um, in the corruption, the Washington Post, and I, I just, I think about this every day, um, between 2017 and when the pandemic shut this down for him, Trump spent one third of his time in office visiting Trump branded properties. That's like, that's planning. Right? It's just that your goals are, the goal, they're not interested in governing at all. He's interested in making money. So one third of his time, he was going to golf courses, wherever, as long as it had Trump's name on it, he was there. And he wasn't in the White House governing. So that's intent. Very good. It's now time, we have uh, questions. So you have your hand up. There should be mics. People coming around with mics. See anyone coming around with a mic? Okay, I don't see, oh, there, I see someone in the back with the mic. Okay, good. All right, I think we have our first question over here. Yes, hello, my name is Sierra Singeti Daniels. I am with City Bureau. We are a civic journalism lab out of the south side of Chicago. Thank you. <laughs> I am particularly interested in like identifying the language we use in order to build power on our side in the multiracial democracy, um, especially when we're considering uh, the new hyperlocal civic information newsrooms that are starting across the country. I think City Bureau is a good example, but Outlier Media in Detroit, uh, Capital B, documented in New York City specifically for immigrant uh, communities. Um, could you speak a little bit to, or maybe share some ideas you have about how we as people that are supporting this multiracial democracy can organize our language um, around this multiracial democracy to kind of combat these terms that you've shared throughout this you know, discussion here? Um, and it's especially when it comes to building power um, with historically excluded communities and newsrooms in those communities. Um, if you have any ideas to share about like what language should we be using and how can we, not only in the hyper-local nonprofit sector, but kind of like these larger traditional legacy newspapers, build this movement together to coordinate our language? Language, everyone. <laughs> the, uh, so, great question. I. Uh, you know, some of us spend so much time focused on the analysis uh, of the problem, we don't focus enough time on building solutions. First of all, local journalism has always been recognized as a cure to propaganda. After World War I, which uh, both figures from Walter Lippmann to Du Bois, you know, uh, propagandized the American public into World War I, uh, there was a, Lippmann himself helped lead a movement to fund local journalists because he recognized that just having one story uh, without local journalists doing their own investigations allowed for, for propaganda. So local, and local journalists can build trust that legacy journalists can't. Um, so uh, so, uh, so that, that's my brief for local journalism. Uh, let me think about, um, I, I mean, I think one thing that we know is labor movements uh, help unionizing, uh, unionizing drives labor movements. There's a strong connection between that and democracy. All fascist movements have targeted labor unions uh, for a reason. Yeah, I think um, we have the language we need. It's just that a lot of it has been appropriated by the right, like patriotism. You know, like these people are are, are traitors. There's there's 
they're doing sedition and loving your country and having a reality based, like the midterm results, for example, I was so heartened by them because all the, you know, 83 Muslim candidates were elected, um, historic numbers of LGBTQ, um, important, you know, uh, firsts for black people. All of this is reality based because we are a multiracial democracy. And these results were actually making, they're going to make government resemble who we really are. <laughs> so we have that language to, to use. But one easy thing is also to call out um, the things that we thoughtlessly um, write, even in denouncing, like woke. What is the opposite of woke? It's to go to sleep. It's to be zombies. And believe me, I, I study authoritarianism and this is the state that people end up in if they don't want to be killed. You have to be silent, you have to be unwoke, like the, you know, the undead, right? And so it would be so easy when DeSantis, who I'm just really worried about, um, it starts talking about the woke mob. Who is, what is this woke mob? And what is the opposite? Do you want everybody to be asleep? So, so, so having the language is also knowing uh, to, to push back and analyze. Now, maybe, you know, your job isn't to push back, but your job is to analyze dispassionately, what the hell does this mean? And so this is, again, we, we take for granted these, um, or election integrity, but the woke is particularly a uh, compelling example. <laughs> Just a quick point on this, switching attention. So if the newspapers are focusing on crime, switch attention to poverty. <laughs> the causes of crime. Switch attention to what's going on in the community and switch, uh, you know, uh, 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 ch change the focus of the ideals. This has worked in multiple countries. Change it from law and order to the causes, uh, and, and that will help. We have time for one more question. Okay. Uh, my name is... Sorry. <laughs> My name is Mario Dunham. I'm with KTSU 2 News. I'm a, a, a student at Texas Southern University. Um, I, I have a question. Uh, aspiring to be a journalist, um, I am a, I'm a veteran, and uh, I'm also a Muslim. And um, so I kind of like mark, you know, mark boxes that aren't b b marked. You know what I mean? And um, my question is for you, uh, as a journalist and... Um, um, putting out statements or, 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 or literary works where it goes against like the grain. How do you, I don't want to say combat, but how do you deal with people? Like for example, you said something to the effect of someone said something or criti criticize your work, but they're saying the same thing. How do you, how do you go about that uh, in a manner of, of professionalism? Because my first thought is to fight, but I, that's not the umbrella anymore. You know what I'm saying? So. Like, how do you go about it without, like, you know, slapping your knee and getting ready to, you know, Twitter fingers going on, you know what I mean? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah, the Twitter, I mean, tw you're trained on Twitter. We're all trained on Twitter. They try to get you to fight, and then they screenshot your fighting and eliminate the context. So it's all, so you got to realize that everything, think, just think everything can be screenshot and taken out of context, uh, you know, that's what, that's the media environment we live in now. Um, I also think, I do think a lot about these issues of power and who, who is allowed to speak about things and who gets to, who, who is enshrined as the savior, um, who is enshrined as the, the seer and who's not allowed. I, I had other reviews that mocked me in the Wall Street Journal. They mocked me for having intellectual ambitions to think that I could be writing about something so big and global. So these things happen. And it takes a lot of discipline to just, you've got to somehow put your blinders on and do your work. And the work is the best um, revenge in a way. And you have to be very tenacious and keep, keep doing that work. And those who need your message will find you and the other lesson is I found um, being a woman with a funny name doing this stuff is um, 
you, it may not be the audience. Like the New York Times has never published an op-ed. I don't think they will, ever will. I've been trying for like 30 years. I've given up. <laughs> so there are certain outlets or elite institutions that may never publish you, but you have a, um, an audience elsewhere. And the people who need you will find you. And you have, um, I really feel this heart-centered mission to reach those people. And that sustains you regardless of what crap reviews or whatever you might get. <laughs> Thank you so much. Please give our panel a round of applause. All right, so you see why I wanted that group on stage. I think that was very illuminating, and hopefully we will take what we heard up here and practice it in our journalism. Um, much attention rightly goes to the 2020 election and efforts to overturn the results, but the dragnet of anti-democratic Demi excuse me, the dragnet of anti-democratic laws, policies, and actions eroding American democracy are at work at every level and every branch of our government, and they didn't begin under Trump. This will be a 45-minute discussion with 10 minutes for questions at the end. So here to share more on that dragnet of current threats to our democracy are Sherilyn Eiffel, Avery Davis Roberts, Rachel Ori, once again, facilitated by Danielle Holly. Please welcome them to the stage. Thank you so much. We are back with this panel that is on threats to democracy. So in this panel, we will lay out the dragnet of anti-democratic laws, policies, and actions eroding American democracy from gerrymandering, Supreme Court rulings, and attempts to overtake election boards and delegitimize elections. We have an incredibly distinguished panel with us for this discussion, and I won't spend too much time introducing them, but I really encourage you to read their bios in your program. We, of course, have Sherilyn Eiffel. <laughs> who we call her the nation's civil rights lawyer. She is a civil rights lawyer and scholar who for 10 years served in leadership as the president and director counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund, the nation's premier civil rights law organization. She was the second woman ever to lead that organization. She's a legend, so I won't read the rest of her bio to you, but please welcome Sherilyn Eiffel. We have Avery Davis Roberts with us. She manages the center's work, uh, the Carter Center, uh, their work on US elections, as well as initiatives aimed at promoting greater political participation of women and youth in Zambia. And for many years, uh, Davis Roberts led the center's Democratic Election Standards Project and has developed several handbooks and methodological tools for elections, observations, and assessments. Please welcome Avery Davis Roberts. Rachel Ori is the Associate Director of the Elections Project for the Bipartisan Policy Center. Um, Rachel uh, works with the organization and is responsible for the organization's election administration policy development, state and federal advocacy efforts, and their Bipartisan uh, Policy Center Task Force on Elections. Rachel's research focuses on evidence-based and data-driven reforms that meaningfully improve our elections ecosystem. Please welcome Rachel Ori. All right. So, we are going to start, as we did in the last panel, with our panelists just really opening up with about three minutes each on 
their work and observations around our threats to democracy, particularly our electoral systems. So I'll start with Sherilyn. Talk to us about what are some of the biggest threats that we're facing in terms of democracy and voting? Well, first of all, thank you, Dean. Um, our, 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 the nation's, the civil rights dean uh, of us all, thank you so much. I'm so thrilled to be here, grateful to uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones for the introduction and to be before all of you. I am only here because my daughter um, found a parking space for me. She is uh, in a PhD program here at Howard, and she's all the way over there. I would love it if she could sit right here. If you, Is there a seat next to you? Could you raise your hand so she can find a way? She's very embarrassed. Come on, babe. Come on. I got to see you. I got to see you. So. <laughs> not easy being my kid, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so listen, uh, I started out as a voting rights lawyer at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund as a, as a very baby lawyer um, uh, in 1988. And um, even though I look very young. And, um, and I started out as a voting rights lawyer and so I'm able to, to, to say that much of what we find we are confronting at this moment is of incredibly um, long-standing vintage. Um, we are not here because something suddenly happened. We are not here because um, of President Trump. We are here because we have an election system that's deeply imperfect in a variety of ways. The one that's most important for my purposes is um, the issue of race and voting and the ability of racial minorities to participate fully and equally in the political process. We needed a whole congressional statute. Well, stop, let me go back. We needed three constitutional amendments to get us to the place where black people could be full citizens and participate in voting. And those were the Civil War Amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. And in the 14th Amendment and the 15th Amendment, um, there are clauses called enforcement clauses. And the power to enforce the provisions of the 14th Amendment and the provisions of the 15th Amendment, the 14th Amendment guarantee equal protection of laws, ensure that black people are citizens, full citizens of this country. The 15th Amendment says you can't deny the right to vote uh, on account of race. And of course, the 13th Amendment ended slavery. Um, but the enforcement clauses gives Congress the power to figure out how to make sure that the, those clauses remain true. Um, and Congress sat on that power for 100 years through Jim Crow until Brown versus Board of Education, the Civil Rights Movement pushed and pushed and pushed, and finally the Selma to Montgomery March um, compelled Lyndon Johnson to put his own effort into helping pass the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So that's the beginning of black people really having access to the franchise. But Congress so well knew this country that in the Voting Rights Act, they created provisions that would protect black people from discrimination before it happened. You may have heard of the preclearance provision of the Voting Rights Act, which made certain jurisdictions have to get permission from a federal authority before they enacted any voting change. And they also gave the power to litigate uh, voting rights claims, which I did as a young lawyer and continued to do. Um, Racial gerrymandering was part of those claims. Racial vote dilution, denial of the right to vote, intimidation, all of those elements are actionable under the Voting Rights Act. We got very little attention for the ongoing reality of this kind of discrimination until it started to have real um, partisan fallout. And in fact, most often you will hear what is happening in our election system framed as a partisan issue. But what lies at the bottom of it has always been the effort to control the black vote, the Latino vote, and to keep racial minorities from being able to fully participate in the political process. When the Shelby County decision happened in 2013, which was the Supreme Court basically gutting that preclearance provision, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, it was like smashing a rock. And it caused the vote dilution and voter suppression that had mostly been limited to the South to not only have a resurgence in the South, but to begin to metastasize across the country. And so Wisconsin and Michigan and other places began to see what the South was doing with voter ID laws and racial gerrymandering, and they, they got in on the fun. 
And so what we now have is a national crisis in our election system. But it has been a longstanding crisis for black people. Um, and lastly, I'll just say what has compounded the moment, and I won't pretend it hasn't compounded the moment, is the effect of Trumpism. Um, is the resurgence of something that we had not seen in a widespread way since the 1960s. And that is the use of intimidation, the use of fear, the use of threats um, to try and intimidate people from counting votes, from adding those votes to the count, um, and from having a professional election system in this country. Um, this is a very, very dangerous moment, and I'm glad we're talking about it today because what I heard after last Tuesday's election and as we've begun to see the results is lots of reporters saying, and even President Biden saying, democracy was saved. Well, maybe the Democrats were saved, but Democrats and democracy are not the same thing. And, and so you're gonna get a lot of people who don't wanna talk about this again anymore because you see, you, you all said it was, you know, Stacey Abrams said it was Jim Crow 2.0, you said there was voter suppression, but look what happened. So every time people overcome the barriers by organizing, by coming out and voting, by standing in line, by doing all the things that we want to do as citizens to make sure our vote counts, they tell us there's no problem. And I'm here to tell you there is a problem. And until we get legislation to fix the problem, which we have not been able to get even from a Democrat-controlled Congress, um, we are not going to solve the problem. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> um, so I guess I would just sort of maybe build on what you were saying, Sherilyn, and go back to some of the points made in earlier sessions just about sort of the, the role of identity at this moment and the way that it overlaps with partisanship and political identity. And one of the things that really concerns me is the way that for so many Americans, the political party affiliation that you have is now a core element of your identity as a person, particularly when there's an overlap with racial legacy, and how that means then that every electoral contest, contest is an existential contest, right? If your identity of who you are is tied to your party, the thought that your party could lose an election becomes an existential threat. And so the stakes become very high in elections, and it's amped up by political rhetoric from parties and candidates who, you know, need this to win, need this to raise money, but it's also exacerbated by social media and mis- and disinformation and some of the propaganda that we were hearing about in the last panel. We also see that this sort of focus on um, party affiliation as identity impacts election administration. We see that unusually in the world, the United States sort of has partisanship baked into our election administration process. We use uh, partisanship as a check and balance at times where we have bipartisan teams of people running elections and that when identity is tied to partisanship, the stakes, even in those contests or in those contexts where people are supposed to be working together to administer our elections, the stakes change and people maybe stop doing the thing that they have taken an oath to do, stop certifying election results. It is eroding uh, our ability to administer our elections. It's also having long-term impacts. You know, we see that there's a feedback loop in gerrymandering, as Cheryl and Eiffel was, was just mentioning, you know, that gerrymandering both sort of exacerbates these issues but also calcifies the way that um, our, our, our voices are, are represented in, in government. And lastly, sort of coming from an international perspective, the Carter Center has worked internationally for the last 35 plus years on elections and only started focusing domestically in the last couple of years. When we look, when we see these kinds of trends, we know that the threat of electoral violence increases, that there are risk factors that have been identified um, from global experience around electoral violence. And some of those risk factors include highly competitive elections where there's a potential for a shift of balance of power. A second risk factor is where partisan division is based on identity. This has been shown globally to increase the risk of electoral violence. A third risk factor is that uh, is having uh, electoral rules that enable winning by exploiting cleavages in societies. 
sounds sort of familiar. And a fourth risk factor is having weak institutional constraints on violence, where perhaps security forces, police, have a bias towards one group or another. So when we look at these factors and sort of think about the impact of identity and how identity is increasingly tied to political party affiliation, I, I am quite concerned and would like us to think together about how we can reshape how we think of ourselves and reshape common identity across other lines than political affiliation. Wonderful. Uh, just want to emphasize everything both of them just said. I, I will try to keep my, my reflections brief. Um, but I focus specifically on the rules of the road for how elections are run in this country, looking very specifically at the policies and practices that, that form and are the foundation of our election administration system. I think these have impacts on you know, voters' access to the ballot, definitely, and looking at how voters are able to exercise the right to vote. Um, but they also form the foundation of a lot of election skepticism in this country. We saw since 2020, Trump and other you know, partisan actors have monopolized and capitalized on a lot of small you know, mistakes or misunderstandings about our election process to, to spread conspiracy theories about election results. So there are three primary threats to democracy that, that I think about often um, in terms of election administration in this country. Uh, the first is concentration of power in state legislatures. Uh, since the 2020 election, we saw you know, more than 30 states uh, act on legislation that would concentrate power over how elections are run, who is running elections in state legislative bodies that are you know, deeply partisan in nature, removing the checks and balances that are really responsible for making sure that our elections are run well and responsibly. So taking that authority away from election officials even giving state legislative bodies, uh, in certain cases, the ability to uh, review and replace nonpartisan election professionals who, for the last several decades, have been the backbone of strong election administration in this country. The second threat is a montage of threats and harassment against state and local election officials. Uh, in 2020, we saw election officials being called out by name by extremely high profile candidates, Donald Trump in particular, but he's not the only one. Um, and as a result, we have seen these individuals be targeted um, at you know, the local, state, and national scale, receiving a significant amount of threats and harassment to the point where many of them and their families have had to leave their homes, being threatened with you know, having their heads on spikes. It's, it, it's incredibly visceral and, and damaging. Um, and many of these threats are racialized or gendered in nature. Um, and that's, that's something that we don't, we don't talk as much about as a, as a community. Um, the third uh, aspect that I think is a, a significant threat to our democracy is the manufacturing of chaos in our election administration system. This is a phrase that um, Edward Perez, who was at Twitter and OSET, uses frequently. But when we see efforts like the coordinated uh, 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 public records requests against election offices in which all of the resources are being dedicated to you know, thousands of public records requests that have nothing to do with the running of an election, taking resources away from giving voters access to the ballot or promoting accurate election administration that makes small mistakes more likely that which are then capitalized by election, you know, conspiracists or form the foundation of later lies about our election administration system. But I think now after the midterm election, as, as Sherilyn and, and Avery mentioned, that we are framing this as a kind of community, as, as democracy one. And so moving forward, my biggest concern is, is complacency um, if we think that the fight is over for, for voting rights, for election administration policy. The next two years, we could see further backsliding in our current legislative framework on elections when really what we need to be doing right now is shoring up our resilience, shoring up the strength of our system against potential election subversion efforts in 2024. Very good. So, Sherilyn, you started off in your opening remarks by mentioning Shelby versus Holder. Um, for the journalists and journalism students in the room, can you talk a little about what has happened, what is the landscape of voter suppression laws and voter suppression efforts in the wake of Shelby versus Holder? And also, talk to us about how voter suppression laws are intentionally designed to consolidate power. Yes, yeah, so um, the Shelby County decision was in June of 2013, and um, the Supreme Court um, 
essentially struck down, as I said, the provision, uh, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. They didn't strike down Section 5, but they sufficiently gutted it so that um, this incredible feature no longer existed. Um, the Voting Rights Act was seen as the most successful civil rights statute of the array of civil rights statutes passed, the big, the big uh, I guess, three or four in the, in the 1960s, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Voting Rights Act of 1965, Fair Housing Act of 1968. And the feature that made the Voting Rights Act so successful was that it was the only one that got to discrimination before it happened. So a jurisdiction would say, we want to move 20 polling places. They couldn't just move those polling places. They had to actually submit that plan, that proposal, to the attorney general, to a federal authority, or to a district court in Washington, D.C., here to get approval. And in the meantime, the federal authority would investigate. They would hear from organizations like LDF, from um, local community leaders, and make a determination about what the effect on the ability of black voters to participate equally in the political process would be. And if it was determined that it would um, inhibit that, then it would be denied and the jurisdiction would not be able to do it. So it would get at discrimination before it happened. Um, most, of the, most of the South was covered, but not just the South. Three boroughs in New York, several uh, counties in California, in New Hampshire, and they were all places that had a history of discrimination. So the conservative majority in the Supreme Court decided that this was a stain on the South. Um, and in their majority opinion, Justice Roberts said, you know, times have changed. Um, this is a st essentially a stain on the honor of the South. Within hours of the decision, um, throughout the jurisdictions that had formerly been covered, leaders began to talk about the plans that they had. Uh, in Florida, the Secretary of State said, we're free and clear now. Uh, the Attorney General of Texas immediately said that they plan to uh, re-up a voter ID law that had been denied preclearance several years before. And that voter ID law is probably the one you've heard of. It was the most restrictive voter ID law in the country. This was the one that um, changed the law that would no longer let state university students who we represented at Prairie View A&M be able to use their student IDs at state university state universities. You couldn't use your tribal ID if you were a member of a tribe anymore. You couldn't use a whole array of state employment IDs, but you could use a concealed gun carry permit. So we challenged that law, and we ultimately won after four or five years. But in the meantime, all these elections were happening for the, for the uh, legislature, for judges, for district attorneys. So that's the difference with Section 5. Section 5 let you get at it before the change happened. With Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, we can still sue but litigation takes long, and it's more expensive for jurisdictions. We did get attorney's fees uh, from that litigation. Um, but now this was removed. And as I said earlier, it began to metastasize. And what we see here is a direct frustration of the Voting Rights Act. And I've never forgotten this, that in the Senate report um, that undergirded the, the enactment of Section 5, what the Senate said was that the provision was designed and the act was designed to get not only at uh, vote denial and racial discrimination in voting that was then currently happening in 1965, but it was designed to get at, and I'm quoting here from the Senate report, ingenious methods that might be introduced in the future. In other words, the Congress in 1965 knew that white supremacy was not gonna stop. They knew that there will be new things that we haven't even thought of. Voter ID laws weren't the issue in 1965, right? Um, uh, giving people water on the line when they're standing on line to vote, that wasn't the issue, right? And so it was designed to get at those, and so we no longer can. And so what we see is this proliferation of uh, voter suppression laws throughout the country. And North Carolina um, passed a year after Shelby County a, a kind of omnibus voter suppression law. There was also a lawsuit challenging that law, and the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals described the efforts of the North Carolina legislature as seeking to identify provisions that would suppress the black vote with surgical precision. That's the line from the federal courts. Not me saying it, it's the federal court saying it. In Texas, they found that the law was created intentionally to discriminate against black voters. The same thing happened in Wisconsin. So there was all of this litigation. And this is what I mean about you know, race versus party and, and how, how these issues are framed. Um, you know, in 2015, I, I used to say, kind of, in my various appearances, that we had a white supremacy problem because of these voter suppression efforts. Um, at that time, white supremacy hadn't made it back into the lexicon yet. We didn't really start using those words until Charlottesville. 
But it is white supremacy and very dangerous white supremacy for whole legislatures to meet and pass legislation designed to keep their fellow citizens from voting based on race. And that's what I mean when I say the problem has been longstanding. Lastly, I'll say that um, what we have seen is an effort by uh, voters to overcome these methods and, and, and quite successfully in some instances. I think one of the most important and noblest moments in this country was 2020, when in the midst of a global pandemic, we had the highest turnout in a presidential election ever in our history. Not since 1919, because women couldn't vote then and black people couldn't vote. Ever in our history, the highest turnout in a presidential election in the midst of a global pandemic. I remember the primary election in Wisconsin in April and all, seeing all of those black people standing on line with masks on. This is April, the very beginning, the deep, the deep really fear of the pandemic. And I remember that at the, the uh, Washington Post had just released a story saying that although the population of, of Milwaukee uh, is 28% black, black people accounted for 85% of COVID infection and death. So when I saw us on those lines, to me it was, it was completely activating for me. This was the noblest moment and we began working on trying to increase the access to absentee voting so that we would not have to risk our lives to vote. And the pushback against absentee voting that you have seen came from that period. Absentee voting used to be a form of voting used most often by Republicans. But when they saw this effort of black voters to participate in the be beginning of the suits that we were filing to expand absentee voter opportunity in the midst of a global pandemic, suddenly you heard this rhetoric that somehow this was an unsafe method of voting. So voters did that in 2020. They came out, they stood in line, and then they came back out in Georgia for the special election. 97% of the voters who came out to vote in Georgia in November for the presidential election came out for the special election. That's unheard of. Special elections are no, low salience elections. So there was this incredible passion about democracy uh, in 2020. Voters stood online in Fulton County, Georgia for nine hours in the primary to vote. The last votes were cast in Harris County in the primary at one o'clock in the morning. And in 2021, what we saw then was the reaction to that. So we saw new voter suppression laws in Georgia, in Texas, and Florida. The reason the Georgia voter suppression law says you can't give water and refreshments to people standing online is because those people stood online for nine hours in Fulton County, Georgia. It is a direct response to what we showed. And so when people say, well, see, there's no problem because we had this high turnout. No, it's every time we refuse to allow ourselves to be held back by the hurdle, they come up with a new ingenious method, right, to push back voting. And we keep having to face these hurdles. And so that's why I'm concerned about the state of how we're talking about this issue now. And I'll give you one example and then stop. All of the conversations that we're having about the House and the House uh, potentially now being controlled by the Republicans. And, you know, I love Steve Karnacki and I, you know, I'm a, I'm a political junkie. So I love all the, you know, the big board and the numbers and all that. I'm totally into that. However, um, when we talk about this as just a numbers game and we talk about, you know, the different candidates and we don't begin the conversation with the fact that there were two jurisdictions where there were successful challenges to racial gerrymanders. They're, they're partisan gerrymanders and they're racial gerrymanders, meaning the failure to create a majority black district that could have been created in Alabama and in Louisiana, Merrill versus Milligan or Don versus Robinson. The plaintiffs, black voters, represented by LDF and others, won in the federal district court, was upheld on the Court of Appeals in Alabama, went to the United States Supreme Court, and on the shadow docket, the Supreme Court said, we're not gonna allow new maps to be drawn um, right now. We're gonna, we're gonna make you wait, and you can just do the election using the old maps this year while we hear the case, and they just heard argument in the case last month. So what that means is that in Alabama and Louisiana, they voted using old maps that were found by federal courts to be discriminatory, which means that there were at least two and maybe three districts that would have been majority black and therefore likely Democrat. And we don't talk about that because we would have to begin the conversation with how race very much has affected what those numbers look like. It's not just about this candidate and that candidate and this party and that party. It is also about race and uh, the racial gerrymanders that occurred in Louisiana and Alabama, and it's also about the racial gerrymander that occurred in Florida, 
when Governor DeSantis took it upon himself, he couldn't even be humble enough to let the legislature do the racial gerrymander. He did it himself and drew his own map. But we don't begin the conversation there. The whole conversation is about 2024, Trump versus DeSantis, and we don't begin the conversation about this racial gerrymander. And so I think this is what is really dangerous, that we are talking about this. When people hear partisan, they think both sides. They think that's just politics. One side does it, the other side does it. Instead of calling it out as racism, which is something that goes to the heart of the poison that infects this country and that is actual, actually a national security issue for this country. And, um, and so I, I'm concerned at this moment that we are once again suppressing that aspect of it, which is at its core, which animates it. It's the easiest thing to manipulate. Um, and we are making that subordinate to what is a much easier conversation, I think, for many journalists, which is to talk about partisan politics. So Avery, let's pick up right there. Talk to us about how do journalists report in an incisive way on threats to democracy instead of just kind of giving us a play-by-play -play of who's up and who's down, what do the polls say, reporting on the next rally or next event or next speech. How do journalists begin to do what Sherilyn just described, which is to step back and have reporting that both talks about what's happening on the ground in terms of candidates, but really goes to these questions of threats to democracy. So I think that's sort of a, I have a two-part response to this. One is I think sort of something that Sherilyn was already saying and that has been mentioned in previous panels, which is sort of taking a step back and taking a more holistic view of the patterns that we see, right? The patterns we see through history and how this may be, a, the things that we see now may be a manifestation of things that have been there always. Um, but also looking internationally and looking at comparative models to really understand, A, that the United States is not alone in the world, um, but that these experiences may be shared in some way in other countries and that there may be things that we can learn. So taking a step back, which of course takes time and resources if you're a journalist, right? You, it's hard to work to deadline and have a more holistic view, but I think we have to think about ways that we can use um, long form work and, and other kinds of medium media to, to really take a step back and, and look for these patterns across time and around the world. But I think sometimes the second part of my answer is that we also need to sometimes talk about the things that are less exciting um, and be less driven by sensationalist headlines and take a little bit of time to talk about the things that are working um, and to talk about what our expectations are of our democracy and of our candidates. So one thing that we have been working on at the Carter Center is what we've called the candidate principles for trusted elections. And essentially what we have done is we've asked candidates in pairs or clusters all running in the same race to commit to some of the norms that Professor Levisky was talking about this morning you know, talk, have them commit to being honest, not sharing mis and disinformation about the election process. Have them commit to being peaceful in their campaigns. A commit to having secure and accessible elections for everyone, right? Not overplaying security as a way to undermine accessibility of elections, like that there, that there has to be a balance there. Having them take responsibility for their followers and for their poll watchers so that they as leaders are really committing to our expectations as voters. And finally, accepting results, right? We want our candidates to accept results. And when we kind of go from the big picture um, this morning of like what parties should do, when we distill it down to candidates, it, it's a really important thing to have candidates commit to this. It's a really important thing that we expect our candidates to do this and that as voters, we tell them what we expect. Does it make a super exciting headline? Not always. But it's important to cover these kinds of stories. It was important that Stacey Abrams and Brian Kemp both agreed to this. They agreed to each other that they would make these commitments, but they also committed to the voters in Georgia that they accepted these policies and these commitments. And so I think, you know, sort of taking a step back to sort of think about what a story could be that isn't a super sexy, sensationalist headline is an important way of sort of building um, narratives that get through, that kind of cut through some of these threats to democracy. Good. So I want to pick up on 
kind of reporting about the midterms. So we mentioned uh, the midterms that happened last week, and we know that there's been increasing coverage since 2020 of the people who run our elections. So everyone from state's attorney general to looking at local election boards. Tell us about what is the coverage missing when we talk about the takeover of election boards or delegitimizing elections at the local level? And what did you think of the coverage of the midterm elections on this particular question? Thank you. I so interesting in terms of what the coverage is missing. And then picking up a little bit on that and a little bit on uh, some of the comments that Avery made, um, we did some survey uh, research recently with Morning Consult, did a national survey with a couple of state oversamples trying to get at who is it that voters trust for accurate election information. And we found the expected kind of partisan divides among party representatives, but what we found is that state and local election administrators were some of the most highly trusted sources for election administration uh, across the country, across demographics, across political party affiliation. Um, but very often, these are the folks who don't make it into those you know, sensationalist national news headlines. So I think sometimes prioritizing the accuracy and the source of election information. Um, I think we, we do, it's a bit of a cliche, but fall into a kind of both sidesism in which, you know, there's this idea in, in journalism that you need to be impartial and you need to present both sides of an argument. But when one side of an argument is a lie, maybe they shouldn't be in your piece. I, I was reading an article recently from the AP that had an original interview with, with Steve Bannon. And I'm like, are we really wanting to give this person more of a platform than, than he already has? Um, so I think that's that's a really important thing to keep in mind. Um, additionally, in, in, in terms of what's missing, I think that when we talk about, we, we use this general phrase, election deniers, quite frequently, um, which I think is a little bit flawed. I, I like to think that there are two classes of election deniers. One are the candidates who are actively spreading what they know to be lies about our election administration system for their own temporary political gain. And the second are the members of the public who are in some times disenfranchised by these lies. They're dissuaded from voting. Um, they're made to believe that uh, you know, our democracy is at risk. They're, they're put at odds with other members of the public who are being seen as their enemies. We have found in our survey research that Members of the public who doubt the results of the election tend to be lower education and lower income. Um, so in many ways, I think that they are victims of a kind of misinformation narrative that is that is fueling on you know distrust and, and resentment. Um, so I think about thinking about which audiences are being reached by our coverage and how we're talking about them uh, is important in, in rebuilding trust in our democratic infrastructure moving forward. Yes, please. I, I do think it's important to add in the, the new feature, which is fear, right? And so we're losing some of the best people um, who actually understand election administration. We had resignations across 12, uh, more than a dozen states um, this year. It took them forever. I don't even know if they still filled it with a permanent person yet, Fulton County. Well, you know, still not, not filled yet. One of the largest electoral districts in the country. This is a plum job that anybody who's been in election administration should want to do. And they can't find anybody to fill the position because people see what has happened. Nobody wants to be, you know, Lady Ruby Freeman and her daughter and have people threaten them and come to their home. Um, nobody wants to be was it Sterling? Who was the guy that, that Donald Trump you know, was, was calling out? Like, nobody wants to be in that position. So I think this is also very deliberate. And so the message is also reaching people who are quite smart <laughs> and who have experience in election administration and who are making a decision that they want to protect their lives and their families and not taking on these jobs. Uh, and, and that should scare us a great deal. The people who are counting ballots, when you see that Detroit polling place that was surrounded in 2020, you know, by protesters telling them to stop the count and so forth, you know, people have to decide whether they want to be part of that. And so I think we just can't deny the reality that the, um, you know, the, the, the flashing of, you know, these weapons, um, you know, and the, the effort to call people out, posting people's information, doxing people, um, this is very frightening to the people that we really need to do the hard work of election administration, which is not something you just walk in off the street and do. It's the people who have experience over time who actually understand how to do the process. And so I don't think we figured out how to grapple with that yet, how to deal with the fear and the intimidation and the loss of, of the brain drain from election administration. 
So we just had almost a year of run up to the midterm elections and I wanted to know what are some of the things that you saw in the run up to the midterms that were most frightening in terms of uh, being antithetical to democracy. So I'll give one example. I saw a commercial in Georgia that literally said multiple times that uh, President Biden is intentionally trying to replace white people and that he had denied uh, white people the, the ability to apply for PPP loans and that if there was an expansion of Medicaid that that wouldn't apply to white white citizens of Georgia. It was a very, I mean, racist and inflammatory ad. And it was shocking to me. I didn't think that was an ad that we would have seen five years ago. Did you see other things during the midterms that you thought were particularly threatening to democracy? Well, I'll, I'll just say exactly what I alluded to earlier. Um, it was watching the January 6 hearings and seeing the testimony of Russ Bowers from Arizona and Lady Ruby Freeman and her daughter in Georgia. And I will never forget that question that uh, Ruby Freeman asked. Do you know what it's like to be targeted by the President of the United States? Um, that is, I mean, if you heard that in any other country, you would know what it meant. You would know what it meant. And we've kind of moved on past that story. When we talk about abuse of power for the President of the United States, President Trump, and, and again, the reason he could convince all his people that these two women were involved in a nefarious scheme to, to steal votes when they were actually, you know, passing a ginger candy to one another during the long hours of counting is because these were two black women and he had already sown this idea that um, we were not to be trusted in the electoral process. That's why he's always talking about, and not just him, but other members of the party, about votes in Detroit and in Philadelphia right, um, and in Atlanta. These are, these are all dog, dog whistles and codes. Um, but hearing that testimony was the most, was the most frightening thing. It, it, it showed me how close to the abyss we are. And just because we didn't go over the cliff doesn't mean that we're not still at the cliff's edge. Um, and so I think we need to be creating the systems that make sure those kinds of things cannot happen with impunity. The person who threatened them is not punished for that. It may be for taking some documents to Mar-a-Lago, but these two women were threatened. People came to their home to make a quote unquote citizen's arrest. So I think um, that's the one that chilled me the most. Yeah, thank you. Um, I agree. I sort of, the, the thing that concerned me greatly was sort of going back to the acceptance of results, right? That, candidates were saying in advance that they might not accept results if they lost, or that any election that they lost was illegitimate, re regardless of anything that actually happened, and the potential for that to, A, lead to sort of catastrophic democratic decline, but also widespread electoral violence that is sort of um, indiscriminate, but also the potential for it to heighten the risk to individuals who are running the election, as Sherilyn was saying and Rachel was saying, that individual people can be targeted by people that they've never seen before, don't know that things can happen to them at their homes or at their office. And so this sort of um, mix of both individualized threat and broader political violence threat was really a concern based on the, the idea that people might just not accept loss, which is a core democratic norm that we have got to reestablish as something that we don't, we should not be congratulating people for a conceding defeat. That should just be the expectation. Yeah, I want to second everything Avery said about the normalization of violence and that being paired with getting election results that candidates want. Um, I saw a couple particularly alarming, uh, you know, candidate campaign videos. One from from Carrie Lake, who who was a candidate for Arizona governor, in which she was smashing a sledgehammer into the into you know the faces of media personalities on TVs while talking about you know the results of the election and the fraud that is taking place, which is you know fueling this idea that right that violence is a normal accepted a part of. A 
a, a candidacy. Um, additionally, Jim Marchant, who was a candidate for Secretary of State in Nevada, who kind of led a coalition of candidates who did not believe the results of the 2020 election for the state's chief election official position. Um, he had a campaign video in which he was uh, you know, holding a rifle and shooting it while talking about uh, election fraud and election results. And, and so pairing that, pairing the outcome of the election with violence and, and at the same time, you know, trying to recruit an army of poll watchers or, you know, join our, you know, war broom against all of these different threats. It, it, it's, it's positioning us, you know, as these kind of two uh, ca categories that are at war with each other, to use their language, which was quite terrifying. Thankfully, there wasn't the widespread violence that we thought there might be, but um, like, like they said, it, we're, we're at the, didn't go off the cliff, but we're definitely still there. Very good. So we are about to take questions. If you, will you raise your hand if you have a question, and I'll let the mics come. While we are finding our first question, Sherilyn, will you give us a kind of one minute summary of Moore versus Harper, the Supreme Court case that made change so much of how we think about the way our elections are run? Yeah, we are really um, drinking out of a fire hose. This is a case that the Supreme Court decided to take. Um, in which um, a theory is posited that first appeared in um, a concurring opinion in Bush versus Gore. Um, and this is the independent state legislature theory. And in summary, the theory is that um, the state legislature has the last word on elections in a state and particularly electors. Um, uh, you know, as it relates to the presidential election, and that there can be no um, review of the decision of the state legislature, even by the state Supreme Court. So even if the state Supreme Court would believe that the actions of the state legislature violated the state constitution, this theory would suggest they are not empowered to review it. It would be like saying that the Supreme Court is not empowered to review any statute enacted by Congress, um, but saying it at the state level. And basically, um, it's an effort to try and control um, the outcome of the next presidential election and the, all the presidential elections to come, um, because state legislatures are overwhelmingly controlled by Republicans, thanks to gerrymandering uh, at the state level, um, and, but moreover, this theory is kind of a crock. It's, it's not real. Um, and I wish I could tell you that therefore the Supreme Court would strike it down. Um, but I could only say that if I was certain, and, and I'm not. I find it shocking that they took the case um, at all. So that's the other threat to democracy that we are facing. Basically, your votes wouldn't matter in a presidential election because the state legislature would be the one to decide who the electors uh, would be assigned to. Uh, th these, are, these are very, very serious things. And we have cracks in the um, foundation of those charged with protecting democracy in all three branches of government. In all three branches. And we're talking about just elections. There are many other elements to democracy as well. But, but certainly as it relates to elections and the political process. Um, and we have to take it very, very seriously. What is important about both the 2020 election and this midterm election is that we have a little bit of breathing room to work on these issues that we've all been talk talking about. That's what the election means. Okay, very good. Let's see, we have our first question right here. Uh, hi there, Chris Ford from the uh, Legal Defense Fund. Sherilyn is not my boss anymore, but <laughs> it's good to see you. Um, I have a question that really uh, picks up on the point that you just made about we have uh, problems in all three branches of our government. And I guess I would ask, you know, how do we check the judiciary? You know, if there's any branch that has uh, laid a direct assault on citizens' rights and, and the, the privileges that we're supposed to enjoy in this country, it's, it's the Supreme Court. Um, but it's not really obvious. You know, they're pretty insulated from public pressure. Um, there are like multiple mechanisms you have to get to actually reach uh, accountability on the court, so it's like, what asks should we be making to the public to check the court? Um, and what asks, you know, generally should we be making of the government as well? Because they're the people who are ultimately empowered with a, a check. Thank you, Chris. Um, well, 
there are aspects of the Supreme Court that are not touchable, you know, easily, right? You need a constitutional amendment to do certain kinds of things, right? Um, but there are other things that are very much within the power of Congress, um, uh, you know, and that includes the size of the Supreme Court and includes the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, what cases they are allowed to hear. I mean, it's actually not true that they cannot be. Um, I think we have a norm against using that power, which is understandable because we don't want to have a rogue Congress, right, deciding to control the Supreme Court. But it's not because technically Congress doesn't have the power. That's why we can even talk about the number, right? There haven't always been nine justices on the Supreme Court. Uh, and so um, I think it's really developing the will and recognizing that we are in unusual times um, and that when norms have been broken in ways that um, undermine democracy, then you, you also have to respond in kind um, and use the power that's available to you. And that, when you say, what can the public do, it's to keep that conversation going. I mean, I don't, I don't believe that the public can't control what happens at the Supreme Court because I think that the public on the right did. They understood that, uh, that the court was important and they voted for Congress people um, in accordance with that so that you know, nominations to the federal bench and to the Supreme Court would reflect their views. They prioritized the court. On the left, not so much. So obviously there is something that the public can do since the right was able to wield that power. And so I think that um, I'm, I'm all for the rule of law and I believe in an independent court. Um, and I take that actually quite seriously. I also believe that um, our judiciary, including the Supreme Court, sits within our democracy, not over it. And therefore, um, they have certain obligations in how they do what they do. I won't like every decision from the Supreme Court, never have liked every decision. But I care very much about whether that decision was made in a way that I can uh, say reflects an independent judiciary. Um, and not, you know, partisan or, or partial decision making. So I think we have some power and we have to really think about what's the moment at which you want to think about how to use it best. Just, I guess, I have long sort of felt that sometimes, in some ways we have become over dependent on the courts to fix our problems, that we assume that the courts will, you know, fix bad legislation or that they will somehow bring us the answers that we want. And I think increasingly it is clear that the power lies with us to vote for the legislators we want in the first place. And so it maybe seems a little trite, but voting is absolutely essential to addressing the imbalance between the branches of government that we have to have. Uh, elected representatives that actually do represent us and our views. Um, so just, you know, a pitch for voting. We have a question over on this side. Hi. Okay. My name's Esse Olumese. I'm a reporter at Reveal from the Center for Investigative Reporting. We recently did a story that y'all can find at revealnews.org um, on the proliferation of election crime legislation. These are bills that would either create new penalties for election crimes, create new agencies, or step penalties up uh, for things like duplicate voting, issues with registration, et cetera. My question is for Cheryl and specifically, would the Voting Rights Act Section 5 safeguard against these laws that we're seeing? And I guess more broadly, what is the universe of things that the Voting Rights Act um, kind of steals us against? What does it govern besides where polling places are and who can administer elections, et cetera? Big fan, by the way, also. I'm um, gonna plug Reveal one more time. Please check out our election crime story at revealnews.org. Thank you. Um, just briefly, the Voting Rights Act covers a wide swath that I think people don't know, um, that it isn't just about the ability to cast your vote, it's also about the ability to have your vote count and have it added to the tally. It's one of the reasons why um, we filed suit um, against President Trump after the 2020 election for his efforts to try to keep uh, the votes of, of black voters in Detroit and other places from being added to the tally. Um, so it covers almost anything that can have the effect of reducing black voting strength. And so you'd have to make the case that those laws would in fact do that. Um, I do think we have to be always worried about, with my other hat, the proliferation of criminalizing conduct. 
um, what that means in a criminal justice system that we know is likely to um, uh, demonstrate racial disparities as it always does. Um, so that's you know difficult, I think, and, and tricky. But I also think that we have to prioritize this, the safety of our elections, um, and particularly, I think, threats to election workers or to voters is one of maybe the, the kind of highest priority issues that cannot be allowed in a democracy. There, there is there's something super triggering about that in particular. So I do think that um, we need those laws. But you know, it's been very interesting since the election. We've talked about you know now that we know kind of what the tally will be, trying to get laws to protect a woman's right to choose, laws to protect same-sex marriage, all of which I think are important because they're obviously under you know, abortion obviously was under threat from the Supreme Court, and I think um, uh, marriage equality is as well, and contraception. But you haven't really heard people talking about a voting rights bill, which, you know, I spent two years and far too many conversations with Senator Manchin um, in an effort to try and persuade him to, to you know, to, to, to give up on it. But you don't hear that front and center. And I think, again, it's because the result has convinced people that see everything as okay. Um, and so I would say that's kind of what we need to make sure we don't fall into. Uh, let's see. I'm going to go, I don't, up here, do we have the mic? Oh, let's see, right here? Okay. Go ahead, if we have someone up here with their hand up. Right up here. Yes, to the right. There we go. Hello, I'm Trinity Webster Bass. I'm a sophomore broadcast journalism major from Jacksonville, Florida, here at Howard University. And this year, I had the privilege of serving as the president for the Ida B. Wells Society for Investigative Reporting. Thanks. Um, so, as I mentioned, I'm from Jacksonville, Florida, and uh, this midterm election, I had. Um, the honor, I guess, of reporting on the midterm elections in my um, county, uh, Jacksonville, Florida, Duval County. And something that we're seeing is um, legislative practices of racial gerrymandering, as you mentioned, that directly mimic the ones that uh, Governor Ron DeSantis was doing earlier this year. Um, and it eliminated essentially two um, districts that were predominantly black districts, and one of which that I lived in. Um, so it just like, I directly felt those impacts. So my question is, um, as a young black journalist, how do we do more of fighting um, these types of practices as journalists? And how do we inspire uh, local constituents uh, to uh, fight back these um, mandates of racial ger gerrymandering um, and voter suppression? Very good. Avery, Rachel, one of you. Want to take that? So that that is under litigation at you know at the at the current time the districts that DeSantis drew. I mean, I guess I would just say it's what I said earlier. It's really the attention um, to these issues, and and in fact, even when we were building up to redistricting, you know, redistricting happens at every level, at the county level, right, at the city level. I mean, there there's a rich you know wealth of material that that could have been mined and could have helped educate voters. Um, but I do think that the way in which you see DeSantis covered, you wouldn't know that that had happened. I mean, you might know about like the don't say gay or the, and the stay woke. I don't even remember what all the, the laws are called, but, but also under litigation, by the way, LDF, thank you. Um, but, but you don't really hear a lot about what he did with those districts. And so I think that that's kind of the issue, is, is really understanding how deeply corrosive this is, how manipulative this is, and how much it hearkens to the period that this country lifts up, including journalists, lifts up as kind of, you know, the pinnacle of this moment of the civil rights movement uh, and of the, of the voting rights movement of the 1950s and the 1960s. This is that same uh, conduct, you know? Um, how were they able to keep blacks from voting? Yes, there was absolutely intimidation. There were threats. There were all the things that we used to see and that if we were reading a history book or seeing a documentary, we would recognize. And just because it's not sepia-toned, somehow we've decided that it's not the same thing. So I'd just like to see journalists really dig into that. And maybe it begins with understanding the civil rights movement as a democracy movement, 
so that you would then understand that that which undercuts it is by its very nature an anti-democracy movement. I'm so thankful for our panel. Please give them a round of applause. Sherilyn, Avery, Rachel, thank you so much for that outstanding panel. All right, um, thank you everyone for your attention and engagement in our discussions this morning. We're going to take a short break uh, while lunch is served, so please go out, uh, use the restroom, make your calls, check your email, whatever you need to do, and return to your seats in 15 minutes for lunch. Thank you.
Thank you. Please welcome back to the stage the founder of the Center for Journalism and Democracy, Nicole Hannah-Jones. All right. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you're enjoying this delicious lunch that we have prepared for you. Servers will continue to move through the room as we resume the program. Uh, we're now going to turn our attention to the screens for a short video. Uh, I am honored to say that President Barack Obama, who's having his own democracy summit this week in New York, uh, sent a message to share on the occasion of the center's launch. So please uh, watch and enjoy the video. Democracy has never been a given. We, as citizens, have to nurture and tend it. And as part of that work, we must recognize the vital role that a free press plays in democracy. Journalists give all of us, as citizens, the chance to know the truth about our countries, ourselves, our governments. That makes us better. It makes us stronger. It gives voice to the voiceless, exposes injustice, and holds leaders accountable. That's why the mission of the Center for Journalism and Democracy at Howard is so important. And I want to thank Nicole and everyone who has worked so hard to make it a reality. The Center will help students learn investigative reporting skills and give them more opportunities to put those skills into practice. But what really sets the Center apart, and this is not surprising given Nicole's background, is a focus on historically informed journalism in service of democracy and equity. As a society, we need journalists who will report not just what's happening, but why it's happening and who's being affected. Journalists who can connect the dots and tell a more complete version of our American story. That's what the Center for Journalism and Democracy will train young journalists to do. And it's fitting that the center will be located at Howard, the place where people like Pauli Murray laid the groundwork for civil rights legal theory, and people like Thurgood Marshall put that theory into practice. So congratulations again to Nicole and everyone who has helped us get to this moment. I cannot wait to see the work you do, and I know our democracy will be better for it. <laughs> I really am trying to play it cool, but I think it's the most amazing thing that uh, President Obama created that video for the launch of our center. And if he wasn't having his own summit uh, in New York, he really wanted to be here uh, at Howard today. So I'm really appreciative of that. All right, so this next portion of the program is a short presentation on a truly special aspect of Howard University, the Moreland Spingarn Research Center. Moreland Spingarn houses one of the most significant and impressive collections of historical documents on black history and culture, including the largest collection of black newspapers in the world. The Center for Journalism, we can definitely clap for that. The Center for Journalism and Democracy, understanding how critical these documents are, has partnered, y'all trying to make me exit the stage? <laughs> 
has partnered with the Moreland Spin Garden on the Black Press Archives Project, an effort to digitize this essential archive in order to preserve this history and to make more widely accessible the journalism that helps us tell a more complete story of American history. So please welcome historian Brandon Nightingale, who is overseeing this essential project. Brandon. Ooh, talk about a tough act to follow, right? Um, you know, it's funny, I, I didn't realize I would be speaking after uh, President Obama. Um, <laughs> forgot to look at that part on the program. Um, I was telling my staff yesterday, I need to leave work a little early, okay? Gotta get to the barbershop, right? Gotta, gotta get the nice suit um, and the nice shoes. Uh, they, they're not gonna catch me in 4K slipping, so. Um, Definitely, definitely excited about that. But in all seriousness, it, it's an honor to be on this stage today um, on such a special day. Thank you to Nicole Hannah-Jones for giving me this platform to discuss the importance of the black press and talk about the great work that is going on inside Moreland Spingarn Research Center, um, and I'll call it MSRC for short. Uh, MSRC is the largest and most comprehensive repository of books, documents, and ephemera on the global black experience. We have the personal and official papers of Paul Robeson, Elaine Locke, Dr. Benjamin Mays, Amir Baraka, just to name a few from the many collections that we currently house. Now, once I arrived in DC in May from Florida to work on the project, I was coming from Bethune-Cookman University where I served as the university archivist for the last three years. And I also wanna note that the founder of Bethune-Cookman University, Ms. Mary McLeod Bethune, was also a member of the black press as she wrote columns for the Pittsburgh Courier and Chicago Defender in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, what I found out when I got here was that it's truly the people inside that research center that make it what it is today. Uh, it's the people that take care of the artifacts like Ms. Leela Sewell Williams, the curator of our manuscript division, or Ms. Sonia Woods, the university archivist, um, Sammy Johnson, our new chief librarian, and of course, our fearless leader, Dr. Benjamin Talton. These are the people and the visionaries that make MSRC what it is today. So if you haven't been, I encourage each and every one of you to come check us out. Um, and so if you, if you notice on the slide here, there's that picture, um, that black and white picture. So that's a picture of the Pittsburgh Courier. Okay, this was taken in 1946. Uh, this is the, at this time, this is one of the top selling African American newspapers in the US. This picture is very symbolic of the work our staff is doing um, on this project. So really quickly, I want to acknowledge my staff, uh, the Black Press Archive staff, would you please stand really quickly? I, I am extremely proud to lead this, this, these group of students. I have an all student staff. Uh, 10 graduate students, four undergraduate interns. When I tell you, we are putting in a lot of work trying to get this project started, and, and we really have lifted it off the ground. So thank you so much to my team. So why am I here? I want to introduce you all to the Black Press Archive Digitization Project, but, but first, I want to talk a little bit about the Black Press. So from the very beginning, in 1827, when the Freedom Journal, which was the first African-American owned and operated newspaper published in the US out of New York, the black press has always served as a model of pro-democracy and journalism. Excuse me. Oh. Sorry about that. Um, so the Black Press Archive, this began as a joint project between the Moreland Spingarn Research Center and the National Newspapers Publishers Association, NNPA for short, in 1973. Uh, this is when Moreland also became an officially a research center. So this past summer, I had the opportunity to attend the NNPA convention in New Orleans. And uh, when I say the work that the NNPA is doing, led by the president and CEO, Dr. Benjamin Chavis, and his staff, is doing to keep the legacy of the black press alive is nothing short of amazing. And it's great to know that the NNPA fully supports the project in every way. So the Black Press Archives collection, this is housed at MSRC. This includes more than 2,000 newspaper titles from thousands of papers published in the US, Africa, South America, and the Caribbean. It includes well-known papers like the Chicago Defender and the Pittsburgh Courier, as well as records 
of black editors, publishers, and journalists. The collection consists of both microfilm reels and physical newspapers. Now, before I go any further, I would like to take this time to recognize and give special thanks to the Jonathan Logan Family Foundation, who is also in attendance today. If you could all please stand also. I had the opportunity to talk with them and they were able to see some of the work that we're doing and we had a really good conversation yesterday as we walked them through Marlon Spingar Research Center. Uh, the Jonathan Logan Family Foundation, they awarded MSRC with a little over $2 million to digitize our newspaper collection and to make, yes, just give it, give it, give it a hand, give it a hand. And to make the material more accessible and provide primary sources at a time when some are trying to whitewash African American history. So why does the project matter, right? Why, why go digital? Uh, there's three points I want to focus on here. The first is the preservation aspect. So we recognize that the newspaper and microfilm won't be here for forever. And so MSRC is taking a step into the future by digitizing these papers. Um, and then we want to talk about accessibility, right? Our, our job as black memory workers at historically black colleges and universities is to increase access to material that documents black history. Material traditionally overlooked and undervalued by these white institutions. Um, and, and then most important, we wanna get it into the hands of the people, right? Um, and then efficiency. So as we scan the newspapers, they are receiving optical character recognition or OCR, which is, makes it searchable. Um, as a researcher, I've been to other institutions. Again, I was just at Bethune Cookman University. They have a, a huge newspaper collection also. And it's very tough, right? Try, trying to dig through those newspapers. Um, and so what we're simply doing is we're simplifying the process, right, for a research. Instead of having to come and dig through all that microfilm reels and dig through the newspaper, we want to be able to just give you the access, right, through, through our website. Um, so we're really simplifying the process. So with the history of the black press, so for three centuries, the black press has def always defended three specific democratic values, equality, freedom and representation. I'm gonna show you some examples here. Uh, first with Ida B. Wells and the anti-lynching campaign. In the 1890s, Wells documented lynching in the US in articles through her pamphlets called Southern Horrors, Lynch Law and in All Its Phases, investigating frequent claims of whites that lynchings were reserved for black criminals only. Uh, the Double Victory Campaign, and I'll show some pictures here in a second. This was a campaign that launched in 1947 and this was an initiative de uh, designed to highlight the plight of African-American military personnel as they worked to fight for American principles uh, overseas during World War II while also fighting for their own rights as Americans in their hometowns. And this was heavily covered in the Pittsburgh Courier. And then we have our very own Nicole Hannah-Jones, right? So in 2019, she released the 1619 Project. This centered slavery as a fundamental aspect of American, econ American economic and political history. She places black people at the center of American history rather than limiting our experiences and contributions to the footnotes as we, as we have often seen in the past. And now here's just, uh, I want you all to get a good visual reputation of what we have in our collection. This is only just a little bit, okay? Just a couple papers. Um, so we got some American representation. Um, the Michigan Chronicle, 1944. One of the headlines here reads, Negroes bid for top UAW posts. So the UAW, this is the United Autos Workers Union. This is a labor union that grew rapidly between the 1930s and 50s. Um, the Caribbean representation. Um, Advocate News, this is a Barbados, okay? The, the headline here is Move Against Multinationals. African representation, so the Le Action uh, in Tunisia, 1977. And so if you look closely, these are all, some of these papers are in different languages, right? So we have a, a, a heavy task on our hands as far as uh, creating the metadata, uh, but it's a task that we're up for. And then here's the lynching, okay? And the Chicago Defender, this is 1921. And these, these all came from our collection that we scanned literally uh, last week. Um, it says, uncover 135 cases of lynching, peonage, and treatment, okay? When I see this, what, I, what, what automatically comes to my mind is I think of HU alum, Dr. John Hope Franklin, okay? When he said, we have to tell the unvarnished truth, right? Uh, so we can't just give you the, the, the good all the time. Um, and that's one thing that we're taking into account as we start to curate some of these papers on our website. We want to give you both sides. We don't want to just show the, 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 the happy images um, in, in these publishers, but we want to show both, both sides. And so this is an example of this here. 
of the Pittsburgh Courier coverage of Hitler, okay? Uh, it says Nazi, this one here says Nazi school uh, bared. Hitler's six point program to enslave Negroes revealed. Okay, so this is some of the stuff that we have in this collection. Uh, 1942, the Pittsburgh Courier, I mentioned the double V campaign. You can see it for yourself there. You see the, the double Vs um, in both of those photographs there. Again, this is some amazing stuff and we're getting some really good scans uh, through, through some of the microfilm scanners that were purchased with the money that the Jonathan Logan Family Foundation uh, awarded to us. So project timeline, I'm gonna kinda quickly go through this here. Uh, so we're gonna, we've already began sorting and arranging and rehousing newspapers um, and then purchasing the equipment, right? That was a big, big task. Uh, we got some very nice equipment. We have our microfilm scanners, as the uh, Logan family saw us yesterday, and we have our newspaper scanners coming in at the 1st of December. And so we're gonna do the training and get everybody in, and then by next year, we'll be up and rolling on both the microfilm and the physical newspapers. Um, year two, we expect to complete 50% of the digitization of the newspapers. Uh, by year three, we hope to arrange the files and manage them electronically. By year four, we'll create an on-site public access system and complete 100% of the digitization of the original newspapers. And then by year five, we hope to have the digital files stored in HU's digital preservation system and about 60% we look to make available to the public um, through our digital Howard, uh, which is MSRC's digital repository. So we're definitely excited about that. And if you notice the date there, 2027, so that will actually be the 300th anniversary of the beginning of the black press in 1827, which I mentioned earlier. So it's, it's all kind of coming together there. And again, this is the timeline and we're hoping to stick to the timeline. So definitely excited about that. The podcast, so we're very, very excited about this. I mean, the students have really been working hard on this. Uh, we are launching a podcast around the project. So with Black Voices, our podcast team plans to identify stories from the black press and interview publishers and experts to examine the importance of these stories and the black press's global contribution. So we're looking to launch that in 2023 um, and, and bring people onto Howard's campus, let them meet the students, let them see what we're doing uh, behind the scenes and then engage in a conversation with them. So definitely excited about that. And we'll be uh, airing that right here on Howard's campus. And I mentioned my team earlier, I mean, I have the greatest staff in the world. I really do believe that, again, I have 10 graduate students um, and they do it all from the scanning, the social media, um, it's, it's just amazing. We were able to take some of the students to the Library of Congress a couple weeks ago and we were able to see how, what they're doing and how they're preserving their materials and we could take that back and not only keep it in-house for ourselves, but we wanna get that information out to other HBCUs that may be in need of some of these resources, which is what it's really all about. Um, so again, here's some pictures here. We don't have a, a full team photo yet, but we, we, we working on it, we working on it. And then lastly, if you could all please take out your phones, um, I, I really want you all to follow us you can just scan the QR code. We are HU underscore black press on everything, okay? We're gonna be on TikTok too, okay? We're gonna, we gonna be on TikTok too. Um, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, please, please follow us, right? Reach out to us. Um, and, and again, I wanna say thank you all for allowing me to uh, share some of the great work that's going on in MSRC, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of the summit. Thank you. All right, so as you can see, that is a fabulous and important project. And if anybody has some loose chains that you wanna to put towards that project, just let us know. So the next panel, this one's gonna be spicy, y'all. I cannot wait for this next panel. Uh, it will provide the historical context of race and white nationalism, which are foundational for so much of what we're experiencing today. This will be a 45 minute discussion with 10 minutes for questions at the end. So please welcome our moderator, Jason Johnson, as well as Anthea Butler, Greg Carr, and Kianga Yamada Taylor. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we have the honor of, of putting together this panel right now while you're eating, which is always the best time to have an in-depth discussion. 
It's, it's either following Barack Obama or while you're still eating chicken. So there we go. That's us. Uh, but anyway, uh, we'll be speaking, as Nicole just mentioned, uh, we'll be having a discussion for about 45 minutes. You can sort of leave us on the background like, you know, CNN. Ha <laughs> ha. Uh, and <laughs> I can do that. Um, and then uh, we'll have about a 15-minute uh, Q&A. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to shoot us with those. So thank you so much. I think I'll start. I'll start up here. Um, okay. It's five mics. <laughs> so... What I, I think is really important to sort of lay out here uh, for today's discussion is we're, we're, this entire conference is about democracy, but this particular panel, uh, despite what many believe, we are not the oldest continuing democracy in the world, and the United States did not have true democracy until 1965 with the passage of the Voting Rights Act, and democracy has always been fragile and contested in this country. Anthea Butler, Greg Carr, and Kianga Yamada Taylor provide the historical context to make the argument that you cannot understand the fight for democracy in America without understanding how race and white nationalism were at the center of it all. I want to do a little introduction to my, my fantastic panelists here. Uh, Anthea Butler, Dr. Anthea Butler is an MSNBC columnist and African American religion African American religion professor at University of Penn State. You Penn? Introduce myself. So <laughs> I just want to make sure right. I get it right. I am the Geraldine R. Siegel Professor of American <laughs> Social Thought and the Chair of Religious Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. I write for MSNBC. Thank you. <laughs> Told y'all this is gonna be fun. I'm just, I'm probably just gonna throw this away after a minute. Uh, we can just do that, huh, Jason? Greg Carr, <laughs> work at Howard University, been here 22 years. Um, what else? I am in the Department of afro American Studies, also teach a class at the Howard School of Law. My former student just got elected to the United States Congress, Summer Lee. <laughs> so we're very happy about that, aren't we, Dean Holly? But at any rate, I'll keep you with that. We're doing this. Um these flowers are incredibly fragrant. Um, <laughs> Kianga Yamada Taylor, uh, I'm the Leon Forrest Pres uh, Professor of African American Studies at Northwestern University. Um, for purposes here, I'm also a contributing writer uh, to The New Yorker. Fantastic. Among others. So what we're going to do is uh, each of our panelists are going to start. They're going to give us a, sort of a five-minute uh, talk presentation about where we are, about the importance of our discussions of democracy, what we do and do not understand, uh, and then we'll begin the discussion. So Dr. Butler, start with you. Thank you so much, Jason. Let me start off by making one very big statement. If I have a room full of journalists, I want to have your undivided attention right now. American democracy is threatened by theocracy. Let me say that again. American democracy is threatened by de theocracy. You all have had a way of doing this in the press that I want to talk about today just briefly. You have assumed that everything religious is good. It is not. You have assumed that evangelicals are good. They are not. You have assumed that the Catholic bishops up the street meeting in Baltimore are benign. They are not. They want power. They want authority. They want to tell the rest of you what to do. This is not new. This is part of the history of this country. It does not matter that people came over on the Mayflower to try to get away from religion in England. It doesn't matter that we say in our documents that there will be no religious test. There has always been religious tests. And if you believe that there is separation of church and state. I got some land to sell you in the swamps of Florida. <laughs> because there is not. So let's set that up right up front. And let me just read something to you briefly because I wanted to get this quote right because I think it gets at everything and you'll recognize it. If we are going to have one nation under God, which we must, we must have one religion, one nation under God and one religion under God, right? All of us working together. You know who said that? That was General Michael Flynn in November of 2021. Everybody thought he was crazy, but he has articulated something that has been in this country for since and before its inception. The way that these conservatives think about America and democracy is not the way you think about it. It is a way in which they see themselves as the arbiter of morality to tell you what to do and to guide the nation. 
It does not matter if you have a thrice married president. It does not matter if he slept with a woman while his wife was pregnant, a porn star. I like her, by the way. What matters is that you must understand that in order to cover this religion and politics, and especially the Republican Party, you must understand religion. You must understand that this is not something benign and that you go to a nice diner and find out what people think and when they tell you God bless America, it sounds the same way as somebody else who tells you that. It's not. What it is is a way to decode what is happening and the power structures that have aligned themselves together. If you believe that the Republican Party is a political party, I got something to sell you too. Because it's not a Republican Party anymore. I said in 2012 in an article that the Republican Party is a religion. And if you understand it religiously and you understand that most religious, especially Christianity, are not about having this way in which you think about egalitarianism, but they operate under authoritarianism, then you will begin to understand what you are up against in this next election cycle. You had a lot of people being radicalized through the reawakening tour. You had people saying that folks would be dead by the end of the year because God had prophesied it. And most, not all, most, of the journalism is going like, oh, this is just crazy people. But now you have those people who speak religiously, you have conspiracy theorists, and you have a party that has embraced all of it. And so what I hope we can do today in the time that we have and the questions that are gonna be asked is to be able to start to understand that religion is a foundational piece of the destruction of democracy in America. And if you don't get that, then you should probably start to think about getting another job. Thank you, Professor Butler. Um, I got a clock here, so I don't need my stopwatch. Five minutes, I understand the assignment. I wanna thank, um, thank Nicole, uh, our new colleague, and thank the new center, because none of this is new to black institutions and certainly not to the black press. I'm glad that we're coming right after Moreland Spengar see uh, Sister Walters nodding her head, Pat Walters, her husband, Ron Walters, for many years writing in that black press, of course. Manning Marable, I think one of his first job might have been in Tuskegee, where he uh, said in exchange for his column along the color line being in all the black newspapers, he uh, wanted a subscription. That's how along the color line from Manning Marable, we all know uh, our brother, now our ancestor Manning Marable, his columns began to appear in the black press. None of this is new to the black press. As my friend and brother and owner of uh, a black independent news media uh, platform, Roland Martin would say, uh, in 1827, Freedman's Journal. No longer do we want others to speak for us. We wish to plead our own case. So it's good to see these young student journalists. Uh, the founder of the student newspaper at Tennessee State, my alma mater, Sam Yet, was on this faculty for many years. He founded it as an undergrad, of course, the great Sam Yet, no question, uh, who wrote a book called The Choice back in the 1970s, where he, he talked about what we're seeing today. But he's not new either. Um, shout out to all the people in Cornerstone who are streaming this. I got to watch everything on YouTube uh, before I got here today. And that early morning session, I think where we laid out this arc of what we face was excellent, how democracies die. With one, I would say one thing, this ain't a democracy, man. It's a settler colonial project. It is part of a global settler colonial project that is dying. And whether it be Hungary, whether it be, you, it, you name a place, and the black press covered this, if even, even if you go to uh, Muhammad Speaks under Malcolm X, you saw an international page. Go back to the black press. When they, when they digitized all this, go look at the black press. We've been telling y'all for years, and our commitment was never to America. That's cosplay. A lot of times, black people put a flag up so you leave us alone. We are for humanity and our community, and we have debates on what that means, what that doesn't mean. But if you want to understand that in the context of what's going on today, there's a professor at University of Pennsylvania Law School, uh, Kermit Washington, who has put it in a nice place and a rhythm. But again, Du Bois is writing about this, Merz Tate from Howard was writing about this, Rayford Logan was writing about it. We go call the role of the HBCU faculty. But Kermit Washington talks about a 1787 constitution. That's the one Sam Alito and them as they're practicing their white nationalism like to quote. And a reconstruction. Constitution. That's the one Katanji Onyika Brown Jackson and Sonia Sotomayor are giving them pure hell 
in the tradition of Thurgood Marshall, who when he would vent, clerks would say to them as he interviewed them, how do you feel about writing dissents? I think that's what Brown Jackson and Senator Mayor and Kagan are doing. They're laying the ground for the next decade or two, if they're still in the United States, which is where I'm gonna end, because I'm looking at the clock. But when you hear the oral arguments over the last several weeks, when you hear the exquisite settler colonialism that was argued last week in Holland versus Brockine, white Christian nationalists with more money than God stealing Navajo Nation babies and the Supreme Court lined up to try to make Indians a race, which they've never been legally, but you gotta move them in that category so you can break every treaty you ever made with them, not that you haven't been doing it anyway. But when you go back to the SFFA case in conclusion, and you hear versus Harvard, versus University of North Carolina that didn't have the good sense to tenure Nicole Hannah-Jones, but we don't care because we want to hear anyway. When you hear Katanji, exactly, when you hear Katanji Brown Jackson asking those questions, she's referring to the Reconstruction Constitution, the 14th Amendment. George Washington would lose their damn mind if they knew that this black woman was arguing the conference notes and the legislative history of the 14th Amendment because that's the amendment that extended citizenship to people who should never have had it in the first place. And you understand to pass the 14th and 15th Amendments, you had to create five military districts in the South and put them under rule. Those were states that don't exist anymore. Go back and read Lerone Bennett Jr., Black Power USA. This is not a democracy. It's never been a nation, and it never can be because there's no common memory. It is set up on settler violence, erasure, and the ability to impose your will on other people. And I'll stop with that, and we'll talk some more in a bit later. Thank you. For the, the sake of clarity, I'm gonna uh, just read through my remarks in five minutes. Um, what are we afraid of? We often talk about the attacks on history, the denunciations of critical race theory, the commitment to forgetting as backlash or animosity, but the organized forgetting, the selective memory has a purpose. What does it mean to actively forget? And by actively forgetting, I mean the absence of slavery in our uh, national memorializations. Uh, literally no monument uh, or, or uh, uh, mention uh, of, of, of slavery. Um, if you look in the Capitol, right, no sense that this was a, a, a foundation of this nation. Um, only in 2020 has there been a national holiday to recognize the emancipation uh, of enslaved people in this country. When we don't remember, we don't fully understand the world that we live in today. Who is on top and who is on the bottom? And why are we in our various locations within this society? Our impoverished sense of history obscures the ways that our society is structured. But even more consequently, when we don't understand the reasons why society is structured in the ways that it is, uh, as a result of racism, inequality, and all of the arrangements and problems that flow from it, then the solutions are weak, often uh, uh, not nearly as impactful as they could be. It is also important to convey that the historical omissions and the occurrences of what one might describe as unfreedom that shaped the black entry into personhood in the United States in the aftermath of the Civil War uh, have been perpetuated thereafter are not simple oversights or unfortunate slips or other kinds of accidental erasures born of ignorance and essentially innocence. They are contrived, mean-spirited, and deliberate. In other words, if we don't talk about and know our history as a settler colonial society that then built its economy around slavery and formed its political system in defense of slavery and the settler colonial land grab, and then 100 years of formal white supremacist rule, then we can't possibly undo its damage. Our comprehension of this history is fundamental not only to a full understanding of the conditions of black poor and working class life, but the basis upon which we demand that something must be done. If we as a society truly understand and absorb the legacies of settler colonialism and the genocide that made it possible, the economic, political, social, and moral distortions created by slavery, the profound exploitation of immigrant labor historically, 
then it would allow us to approach public policy in a more honest and robust way. And of course, that is the point. In our society that worships small government when it comes to social welfare and free market capitalism as the supreme way to organize an economy, then this becomes a point of tension or conflict when it comes to creating the kind of social provision needed to improve the quality of life of the marginalized and oppressed. And so our society became invested in perpetuating mythologies about self-making, rugged individualism, unfettered social mobility, in part to hide the carnage and coerced labor that made American democracy and American freedom possible. And since the end of the black insurgency in the 1960s and 70s, to deny any culpabil culpability in rebuilding public services and public policies to improve the quality of black people's lives. If you ignore our actual history and replace it with a fairy tale about hard work and individualism, <coughs> it isn't just a lie that is being told. It, is built in, it has built in an excuse to blame individuals and communities for poverty, inequality, unfairness, substandard housing, under-resourced schools, while ignoring the role of politics, the wealthy, and a system that thrives on inequality. So, his <laughs> so historical truths, facts, honesty, and sobriety are not just about being better informed that we should always strive to be better informed. But it is also about shaping our demands for the world that we want. It is about strengthening our demands, not just for reparations, but for affirmative public policies and affirmative social services. Thank you. Okay. So we're gonna do now, um, I'm gonna start off with a question to Dr. Butler, but um, once she's done, feel free, uh, <laughs> feel free everybody else to sort of jump in um, before we get to your questions from the audience. So I, I, it's not that what you said was shocking, right? But there are lots of people in this country, perhaps even people in this room, who think that uh, religion isn't inherently good. It's almost always good. It gives people a moral center. It tells them where to go on Sundays and Saturdays and other days of the week, right? So how is religion a direct danger to democracy? Is it a danger to democracy? Because yes, religion in the hands of white nationalist extremists is bad, but is all religion inherently problematic to sort of our, our ideal liberal democracy? Not all religion, but I think that the thing that we need to start off with is that there's a supposition in this country that the church and state have been separated, right? And when Thomas Jefferson wrote that letter to Dan Barry, he understood that, you know, we don't want this to be a part of it. What we see now is religion has been drug into everything. Let's take the Dobbs decision, for instance. This was something over 50 years that has been going on by, you know, pro-lifers with religious means, whether they were Catholic or evangelical or other, right? And now that this has happened, everybody acted as though they were surprised. But this has been a 50-year project with doctors being shot and killed. These were all religious ideas. They didn't start off that way, but they ended up that way. And so one of the things that I really want people to understand is the role of religion in dismantling democracy. Because if you think that American religion and American Christianity or Christian nationalism or white Christian nationalism, as I like to call it, is here to structure a democracy, you would be sorely wrong. And the way that we know this already is slavery. Why do you have the Southern Baptist Convention? Slavery. Why do you have two or three different Presbyterian denominations? Slavery. And so when you think about the number one biggest, you know, if I use a religious analogy, sin of slavery, right? That whole thing was wrapped up in the fact that there were religious people who believed that there were two separate creations, that black people were not really human beings but animals, and that they were meant to be subjugated by white men. And so once we understand that, then we could understand all of these things that have happened since then and understand that these types of religious, this kind of religious fervor is not helpful for democracy. Can I, this, this is very interesting. Thank you, uh, Professor Butler, for laying that out because when you mentioned it, it made me think about the organizational logic of Christianity in this country, as you've said and written about. It's really white nationalism. 
and the state is used to protect it. So there isn't a separation of church state, as you said. After Brown versus Board of Education, places like Prince Edward, Virginia, right down the street, they just closed the schools for five years and then took public tax dollars and siphoned them through vouchers into private schools, many of them which were religious schools. You see a glimmer of that in the main case where they've done something similar in this most recent, or in other words, school vouchers, which is, by the way, the platform of the almost 20 state superintendents uh, elect, uh, races this past election cycle, many of the uh, white nationalist party, the Republican Party, running on vouchers. That was their number one issue. How do you take public dollars? It undermines exactly what Kianga just laid out. Are we talking about building a society for everyone, or will you preserve white nationalism as the central organizational logic of this project? That is in the second redemption period, meaning what? It took us 100 years to fight our way out of the first redemption period. And if you look at the first redemption period, meaning what? The 1880s, 1890s, when they put the apartheid state governments in place that replaced the reconstructed state governments that had all those black people in it. Should have had black women, of course, but black men. What you see is that's when the Klan starts riding. That's when the white nationalists really start their organizational logic. It took us a century almost to work our way out of that, and since the 1960s, the great clawback has been to use the state to protect white nationalism overtly. It's always protected it kind of generally. It's baked into the Constitution. I'll end with this. Our pushback, and by our, because there is no we, I'm now talking very specifically about people of African descent who have either embraced Christianity or more importantly, embraced spiritual traditions that absorbed Christianity, absorbed Islam, absorbed these other traditions into a pre-existing kind of constellation of African thought. So I think of Vaudun, Caromble, Santeria. Those are glosses as far as I'm concerned of Christianity that got absorbed into things we brought here with us and remixed as we were going on. You see this reflected in the black press. In the Reconstruction period, even during the Civil War, one of the battle hymn, the battle hymn of the Republic, yes, Julia Ward, how? But when you hear them Negroes singing, truth is marching, truth is marching, they ain't praying to the same God as these people who are praying to this white Jesus who wants to kill them. If you read Frederick Douglass in the North Star, if you read Martin Robeson Delaney, the Pittsburgh Mystery, then the North Star, if you read the AME Church Review, Professor Butler tell you, when you start looking at these women and men, not just Bishop J.T. Holly, ultimately Pauline Hopkins, the black press will say, we are religious people, but it ain't the God of the whites. Do you understand? And to this day, it's not the God of the whites. And if the state is going to defend the God of white nationalism against us, history shows us that not only are we going to fight you, we're going to win because we don't limit our fight to the four corners of the United States of America. This polity has never defined us. Citizenship, in fact, is probably the villain of the peace if we ever get rent down to it. Our common humanity is probably an enemy of citizenship. We, uh, wait, I'm going to stop there for a minute. But uh, <laughs> Keong. <laughs> I'll just I'll just say quickly that um, you know we talk a lot about the uh, the contradictions with the founding um, of the United States, but uh, one of the advances of the founding of the U.S. was the separation of church and state, um, and that separation was based on the idea that people could rule themselves and did not need the divine intervention. Um, of uh, a, uh, a deity of some sort to make decisions about um, the society. And so you, we can talk about the, uh, the, the contradictions uh, of that and what America actually was, but I think from that we can distill the idea that, um, you know, there is a problem uh, with the kind of deviation that we see increasingly um, of allowing uh, religion to be a guiding force um, in decision making, in which it, 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 the, that sentiment uh, seems to be uh, becoming much louder um, and much more uh, problematic. I think the extremes of that we have seen with uh, the attacks on abortion rights, where it's just open and, and blatant that uh, these sorts of decisions about uh, building on the Supreme Court decision to uh, codify uh, the um, opposition to uh, abortion and really the subordination uh, of women in religious terms. The attack on uh, trans uh, uh, people in particular uh, defined in, in religious terms. And it's really subverting uh, the notion that uh, people 
are the ones who should be making decisions um, based on the rationale of, of law and, and as, as, as the basis of making uh, political decisions um, and not theocracy um, or theoretic uh, considerations. And so I think that is something important to keep in mind in this, in this discussion. I want to stay with you. Um, you've surveyed the, the historical and contemporary ravages of racism and, and the persistence of structural inequality in America. I, I want you to talk a little bit about the specific way that black journalists can fight against these structures. But, but I want to frame it this way. Uh, and, I, and I use an outline, a very dear friend of mine, some of you may see him on TV, uh, Ellie Mistal, who's a, a constitutional journalist, scholar, writer. Um, there are risks when black people speak out about structural racism in journalism. We're not all Roland. We don't all own where we appear. If you speak out, and if you are a person of color, if you are my colleague Joy Reid, if you are my friend Tiffany Cross, if you are Don Lemon, if you are me, if you are Ellie, and you say the wrong thing, fighting against these systems, you'll be silenced. Not canceled, cancel culture is garbage, that ain't real. But I'm talking silenced. They'll cut your check, they'll cut your access, and people have lives to live. So how do we fight these battles against structural white supremacy when oftentimes we are within white supremacist structures when we're trying to do so? That's, a, that's the question. <laughs> um, and I would, I would say that it's uh, journalists and it's also people who have any kind of public profile in talking about some of these uh, some of these issues. I gave a commencement at uh, uh, ha Hampshire College in 2017, and it was six months after uh, Trump's inauguration. And um, this was in May. Fox News thought it was newsworthy um, that I described Donald Trump as a racist, sexist megalomaniac. Um, this was, my speech was 19 minutes. This was, I talked about Trump for about 15 seconds, Fox News played this on a loop for four days in a row um, so that over Memorial Day weekend, so that when I opened my uh, mailbox um, uh, the following Tuesday, it was deluged with death threats. Um, and, you know, it meant that I was, I was in the midst of a, uh, of a book tour. I had to cancel the book tour uh, on the West Coast. So this is... In some ways, it's if you speak out uh, against um, racism, white supremacy uh, in this country, uh, in any public way, um, it puts you, uh, it puts, you know, it, it, it constitutes a threat to some people uh, and makes you vulnerable. And so I think one of the ways, well, I want to separate these two things. One is, is about what uh, black journalists in particular um, can do. Um, and I think this is probably about journalism writ large, but I do think that there is a uh, particular interest that black people uh, take in some of the stories that may not be seen as newsworthy um, about uh, other, uh, you know, from, from other people. And I think that, you know, there, there are several powerful uh, examples of that, but probably um, one of the most powerful examples from our own time uh, is the, the work that has been done about documenting uh, cases of police brutality and police killings. Uh, you know, I think about uh, Wesley Laurie's uh, work in particular um, in uh, creating a database, really, uh, of, the, uh, of police killings of black people. If you can believe that there has been no um, uh, federal effort to keep track of the numbers of people who were killed um, by the police. And, you know, of course, part of the motivation of that is um, if you can't count it, then you're not compelled to do anything uh, about it. And so this was an enormous, not just newsworthy um, contribution, uh, but was enormously important in terms of uh, addressing a uh, uh, a, a hole in, in public policy uh, and uh, really undermining efforts to politically deal uh, with a, a, a crisis. I mean, part of the reason why you get this explosive response 
uh, through Black Lives Matter and the eruption of a social movement is because the inattention from federal officials, even in the, 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 the face of uh, mounting violence, state violence against black communities, the failure to act left it up to, to people who were victimized by this uh, uh, to respond to that. Uh, and so part of the, the effort to um, change this um, and to enact any kind of, of reform um, has, you know, is, is really, this is part of the, the, the root to that. And I think that we can look at policing and, and state violence as only one aspect of it. There's in, numerous stories uh, to be told about, um, to be told about the housing crisis and its particular impact on black families and black women, uh, uh, especially. Uh, this is, uh, a, a story thus far, you, you also have the, the kind of academics who wade into journalistic, um, uh, uh, into the, the pools of journalism as well. Matt Desmond, um, who's a sociologist uh, at uh, Princeton University um, and author of the book Evicted, uh, was one of the first people to really break into this story about uh, evictions and their particular impact on um, on black women. And there are multiple stories that need to be uh, told about this. And so I think that when I talked earlier about the, the consequences of forgetting, in some ways, slavery and formal white supremacy are the, the, the big stories. Um, but there is a way in which the forgetting uh, is institutionalized in all sorts of ways um, in, in our society. Uh, because to not report on, to not write about, right. uh, to not see uh, the victims of inequality and racism in the society means that you don't have to deal with it. Right. And so we think about something like COVID mm -hmm. and the fact that over a million people have died from this disease in less than three years, right? right? Like. These are, these are numbers you don't even hear about in war. Right. And we don't mourn the dead. Why? Because to mourn the dead would compel us to do something about the conditions that created this enormous loss in the first place. And so we don't talk about, we don't talk about black women being evicted because it would compel us to do something about it, right? right? We don't talk about the conditions in school. We have stupid conversations about learning loss, that you live in a country where over a million people died in three years and wonder about learning loss. You know what? There will be learning loss in Ukraine this year, right? right. So we shouldn't, the, this, the, the discussion about that subverts important discussions about what were the conditions in public education in this country that left black children in particular susceptible to learning loss. And so that's, those are the stories that we should be talking about and reporting because it brings people out of the shadows and once they are out of the shadows, their conditions of life cannot be ignored in the ways that they are. I want to add to that and then go talk, talk, I, I, to, Dr., uh, talk to Dr. Butler. You know, one of the things I, I remember in, in studying COVID before the, the vaccine was made available was the idea that if you, looked at, if you look at the COVID death rates in the African-American community prior to the implementation, the sort of shoddy implementation of the vaccine, black people were dying at a higher rate than we died during the Middle Passage. That, that, that was the infection rate. I, I, it, was, it, was, it was that bad. We were getting it and we were dying. And the reporting... Um, completely ignored it in most places. I, I got to write about it. I was at the Grio at the time. But yes, that's, that's one of those examples. Dr. Butler. I just want to tie in what you said about COVID because this is really important. This gets to the religion part. At the beginning of the pandemic, what was happening? All of these religious folks who were conservative were saying this is going to blow away or it's not real or you don't need to take the vaccine because it's going to put a chip in your body. Right? And so all of this helped to excabrate the death. But the most important thing was they didn't really care about COVID because it was killing us. It was killing black people. And so this was why you saw all the white pastors fighting this because they would say it was religious freedom. They needed to have the right to meet. They needed to have the right to get their money. 
This is what was driving that. And so now that we see on the other side where white people have been dying at a higher rate of COVID than others of us because we have gone and gotten the vaccine, it makes for a very different story. One of the biggest stories that really actually needs to be written is how Republicans and right religious conservatives came together to kill lots of people because of COVID denialism. And this is a story that we have not plucked out because we have not talked about how these things work together. One more thing, the education part. When you bring up education, you also have to remember what was the first thing that happened? Segregation academies. What were those segregation academies? For? What were they? Christian schools. They were Christian schools. They weren't non-Christian schools. It was all Christian schools where they could pull together white Christian children away from black in integration and African-American children. So everything, even in this poverty instance, when we talk about poverty, we have to talk about the converse of prosperity gospel, which has snatched up everybody so that you say things like, well, they don't have, they can't be taken care of and they don't deserve health care because they're not right with God. This is actually what a congressperson said. They don't know how to take care of themselves. This same kind of thing went through COVID. So you have to learn how to untangle how these things all are working together to keep people oppressed in this nation. Dr. Carr, um, I, I wanna ask you about this and you can feel free to add on to this, but also want you to address this question. One of the things that uh, I mentioned before, the particular challenges that African-American journalists face, you're on the Karen Hunter show, you appear on Roland Martin show, you say things, I can tell you for a fact, and many of us are like, thank you, right? <laughs> no question, yeah. and we'll never not do that, brother. Exactly. You were able to say things uh, with, 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 with freedom and, 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 and lack of consequence that some of us don't have that freedom. So uh, what I'd like you to talk about is, what is the role of institutions like the Center for Journalism Democracy or Howard University in providing you the basis so that you can have that kind of freedom? Because I'll tell you, my own personal experience, when I worked at a PWI, I couldn't say half the stuff that I say now. I mean, I would. They would just yell at me all the time and threaten to take my office, right? Or give you awards and put you in the pet shop, brother, because well, yeah, sometimes exactly. it's kind of boutique to have a radical exactly. on faculty. <laughs> uh, some of y'all know what I'm talking about. But, go ahead. But yeah, no, you're, you're, exactly, you're exactly right. Uh, you know, they, they, they'll put me on the posters. They just didn't want me to talk. Um, but, but it's very different now being at Morgan State University. You know, when I, when I get the death threats and I get the emails threatening me, um, you know, they, they, they're like, yeah, that's fine. We'll make sure you got security at your office. Well, so, but they, they ain't coming to Baltimore. They ain't coming to North Baltimore, Miss you. Thank you. No I told, I, told, I told somebody that Them once. Cats, I was like, uh, if they, they can get that far in the city. They, they got social media courage, bro. They ain't coming to Baltimore, Miss right. <laughs> but, but talk a little bit about the role that institutions can play in supporting black journalists so that when they say, speak truth to power about this democracy, about this white settler state, they still have a place to go home to and they still have healthcare. Well, brother, let me test the limits of tenure. <laughs> That's what I was going for. <laughs> I know it's what she was going for. <laughs> and you know I was going to go for that bait yeah. too. <laughs> All right. Um, there's a book we read a couple of years ago here at Howard in our freshman seminar course, which has since been restructured. I think maybe this is part of the reason why called uh, The Education of Black People. It was speeches that Dr. Du Bois gave at HBCUs, with one exception. Fisk, uh, Lincoln University of Missouri, different ones. The last talk he gives is at Johnson C. Smith in North Carolina. I know it's a couple of North Kakalaki schools in here, right? A&T, Aggie Pride, I see the Eagles from North Carolina Central, North Carolina's been a while. But he tells these, these social scientists and school teachers he said, these laws are gonna change. This is 1950, 60, just before he and Shirley leave to Ghana. And one of the last notes they wrote was, chin up and fight on, but realize American Negroes can't win. But um, he says, they're gonna change the laws and then you're gonna have to deal with the questions of race and culture. Now, what does that have to do with what you just raised, uh, Jason? This is the challenge of a center like the Center for Journalism and Democracy. Are we gonna have a conversation we have when it's just us in public? I do not envy my colleague, Nicole Hannah-Jones. Because see, I don't know that we're ready to do that because HBCUs, what Du Bois is saying is, if you're not gonna be just a black-faced version of a white school, you're gonna have to ground yourself in the conversation that people are having outside these doors. So if you're at Texas Southern, you got to go over there to the Shape Center, cut like I was over a couple of months ago, and guess what, when you walk in the Shape Center, you see all these black newspapers. That's what the people are reading. 
And the conversation we talking about that you can't have on MSNBC, we have it every day in the black press. Every day. It's not even a thing. The reason I can do that is because as a Negro who went to a field HBCU, Tennessee State, like the one you work at, Morgan State, first my family go to college, that's no accomplishment. I take it as, a, as an obligation to represent those people who will never see the indoors of a school because HBCUs are supposed to be about serving our community, not leading our community. Anybody creating no leaders between 18 and 22 years old? Can you imagine turning the keys over to everything? <laughs> You're a leader. <laughs> no, you are a servant. Some of y'all are going to be reminded when you go home for Thanksgiving and you get crazy and start correcting people's speech and get roasted for it, which as you well should. <laughs> the community source of the black press has always been in this conversation. It doesn't mean we all think alike. Arguments all up and down the line. I mean, think about Pauli Murray, for example, in the 1940s, writing in the New York Amsterdam News, right on the edge of dealing with gender, because she's going to therapy trying to figure out, what am I a man? Because these gonads, can somebody? And she's writing about this in the black press. Ain't no white people writing about it. That's against the law. You understand? Now, how does that relate to not being, not having any restraints? Monday nights, we're in a platform we developed, Karen Hunt and I, some others, called Nubia. I got an introduction to African States class with over 2,000 people in it. You know the obligation? Log in. Universities are not the center of social change. They are never been the center of social change. What COVID did was give us an opportunity to finally ground our work in the place that sent us here to do their work, the community. So, I guess what I'm trying to say is that as this settler state continues to try to save itself, the 1787 Constitution, by the way, set up white minority rule before they knew they would need it. It's called the Electoral College. It's called everybody get two senators. And by the time they got from C to shine and C, they have locked in white minority rule. And we got to play this game every two and four years. The Reconstruction Constitution cracked that a little bit tried to fix what Roger Taney messed up and Dred Scott creating two versions of citizenship. Hey, go look at it. I mean, y'all just made this shit up. What, you know what I'm saying? So he put the 14th Amendment in place to try to extend the franchise, extend citizenship to everybody, and therein lies the source of the fight. They've been trying to claw that back ever since. John Roberts is going through the First Amendment. Not just freedom of expression, freedom of religion, but the idea that I can discriminate because it's my right as an individual. You understand? HBCUs, at least the ones with law schools like Central, uh, FAM, Howard, who am I missing? Miles College, Southern University. You see law students who come to law school determined to break the back of that 1787 Constitution and try to use the Reconstruction Constitution as a battering ram. But what finally we find ourselves challenged with as faculty is giving students what they came for and not trying to be imitations of the white schools. And as far as I'm concerned, brother, I was on MSNBC one time. They came to Cranston Auditorium, Brian Williams, they had this whole conversation. And then they gave me the microphone and I was like, <coughs> I ain't even been on ever since, brother. And guess what? Not only is that just fine, I want to be left alone. Because guess what? Ain't nobody busting down the doors to write for the Washington Informer, Calvin Rolark and them, Denise Rolark Martin. That's a black paper any of y'all want to publish, you can put your column in there right now. Now, I don't know if you can get it in the Washington, uh, what's that white paper in DC? Oh, the Washington Post, right. My question is, why you put the Washington Post before the Informer in the first place? That's the thing we need to talk about, brother. All right. Y'all ready? <laughs> so I've got about uh, 10 minutes. Oh, wait, okay. Looks like we're about, to, we're about to go to our break, I thought. Can we, can we do our questions? Yes, we gotta do some questions. We gotta, this is like a concert, we gotta do some questions. So we're gonna at least get to a couple of questions. Uh, this gentleman here, uh, this gentleman here, this young lady here, these two over there. If we could get about five questions and we could get the microphone to them. Everybody keep your hands up. Stay in line, stay in line. Uh, we'll get our hands to you. Uh, we'll do a couple questions and then we'll do a break. And in, in order to be fair to time and the people who are gonna be following, I'm just gonna have you, I'm gonna have one person answer quickly. So it's gonna be one person answers each question. If you wanna send it to someone directly, say who you wanna ask question. Uh, this isn't necessarily a direct question, but my name is uh, Ozzy Burcell. I'm coming on behalf of Morehouse College, um, contributing writer of the Maroon Tiger. And so my question 
relates to this entire, this entire summit. Everything we've talked about affects the nation's perception and our relationships internationally. Can you all speak towards our roles? And, I'm, and I hope this answer caters to all of the future journalists in the room. Can you speak to our role in, in changing our perception in the media as it relates to international um, relations and, and perception? Want to grab that real quick? I think I want clarification on the question, but I'm going to try to answer it. You're asking a question about how do we change the perception that the international media has of America, or how do we change perceptions in the international media? Correct. That's, that's how do we change right. perceptions in the international media? Correct. Well, first of all, you need to be connected to them. Let me give you an example of this. One of the interesting things about when, um, when the murders happen at, um, why am I just remembering this, when the nine people were murdered, at the Char Charleston, right, at Charleston. I did not get lots of calls from the American press. I got so many calls from international press. F you know, France, Italy, Australia, BBC. BBC was the first place I came on. It was as though Amer the American press could not deal with the fact that a white supremacist had listened to a Bible study and mowed down people in a Bible study. This is what we're up against. So, so in one way, you know, I say to you that maybe the international press is a little bit more hip to the racism in the American press, mm. okay? And so the question becomes, how do we make alliances with black press around the world, with press around the world that is fighting the same kinds of things that we have here? Whether we're talking about India with Hindutva, you know, this is probably gonna get me in a lot of trouble right now. Uh, or um, we're talking about Hungary, or we're talking about what's happened in Brazil with Bolsonaro. All of these places are dealing with similar issues to what we are dealing with here in America. But we are navel gazers. We don't deal with what is happening on the outside. And we need to start to make these alliances, especially as African Americans. Because if we don't, we're, we're a mess. I mean, I could just think about Malcolm X and the Bandung Conference and going to, to you know, Indonesia. When black people were meeting across in the diaspora to talk, black people in the diaspora need to talk journalistically across lines. Next question. Um, yes. Good afternoon. Ooh. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Malika Stewart. I'm a junior English major and photography minor from Spelman College. My question is to Professor Carr. You stated that, sorry, HBC, HBCU should not be making leaders. And I wanted to ask you, what do you think they should be making and where is a good place to start? Well, have you taken uh, my colleague Rich Benson's class down there at Spelman? No, I have not. You know Professor Benson? Some of y'all at AUC, I know you got to know Sam Livingston, Dan Black, all them, right? Them, your people down here, right? And my people, too. I'd be threatening to go to Atlanta like every two weeks because the, the consortium at the Atlanta University Center is, is very important. When the students, when Dr. King was killed, the students at Morehouse, Spelman, ITC, Morris Brown, they, they all marched and they told their respective university, colleges they wanted to bring the AUC together and name it, rename it the Martin Luther King University. Yeah, that didn't fly, because <laughs> Laura Spellman Rockefeller gave too much money to that. But the point is that Vincent Harding left the faculty of Spellman, went to the King Center first, then started something called the Institute of the Black World. He sent one of his lieutenants up here to Howard named Stephen Henderson, started something called the Institute for the Arts and Humanities. Why am I telling you that backdrop? Here's the answer that I will give you very quickly. It's not that any university is training leaders as much as black universities have to be engendering not only a sense of curiosity and wonder and individual aspiration, but collective purpose. See, the universities of Pennsylvania or Princeton University where my colleagues here, and, and Kianga, you said something when you were here a couple of weeks ago for the Writers' Conference, there is no sheltered rear. All these schools are sites of battle. They're battlegrounds. I lived in West Philly for 17 years, so I know Professor you know, like many times up and down there right up on Walnut Street. None of these schools have any difference from each other except the people who are there. And the HBCU has an obligation for us to move collectively. It isn't just about you achieving, it's about how do we free us, to quote Sonia Sanchez, who's living. Now, how does that translate into what should be, you should be teaching and learning at Spelman? Well, I think ultimately it comes down to engendering a sense of collective purpose and what we see now at HBCUs, and I work at one of them that's better at it than anybody, is just as good. 
is engendering this sense that if you achieve as an individual, somehow the race benefited. That's the worst kind of petty bourgeois politics. And that leads us to the type of politicians, the type of journalists who are looking to aspire to escape the people. And they think if you escape the people and they see you on TV or your byline, somehow you represent them. You should run like hell from any professor, any administrator, anybody who tells you that that's the purpose of HBCUs because that's in fact a minstrel school. And I'm telling you at a place where I'm glad Nicole is here because that may buy us a little bit more time to change the attitude here because in terms of neoliberalism, you sitting at one of them. Go ahead, go ahead, Andy. Okay, ma'am, excuse me. Uh, this gentleman and then, and then the woman in the back, him and then her. Good afternoon, my name is, oh. Good afternoon, my name is Micah Speed, and this question is for Dr. Carl O. And I'm from North Carolina Central University. I'm a senior studying mass communications and political No, we got to pass it on. You look, you got to look. Go ahead, Kianga, and I'll come up behind. We got any more time left, but oh, yeah, I, I'm you. listening to you. I asked the question. It's, can we address white supremacy and legislation made from sympathies with its ideologies without radical, radicalizing more whites? <laughs> <laughs> We're all taking notes on this one, because if you have the answer. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm glad you asked that question, because I, I think that's an important uh, part of the, the discussion. Um, I think that, you know, there are lots of things that we can identify that black people need to get free, um, but I don't believe that black people can get free alone. Um, that, you know, I, I was looking at, there's some study that, that people in this country, white people in particular, constantly think that African Americans are like 35 to 40% of the population, and it's not true. <laughs> Black people are 12 to 13% uh, of the population. So um, if we wanna get free in the ways that many of us have talked about, uh, then it really, it's not just about multiracial democracy, it's about building um, multiracial coalitions and movements uh, to actually change the conditions of life um, in this country. And part of that means recognizing, uh, you know, someone raised earlier about uh, white people and, and voting against your own interest and, and, and all of that. And I think, you know, there's an argument to be made about, you know, black people in the Democratic Party and, and you know, the, the kind of disappointment, generational disappointment, uh, and continuing to, um, you know, invest our hopes and dreams in that party and whether or not that is symptomatic of the same kind of disease. Uh, and so I think that there are bridges of solidarity that we have to try to uh, to find, and not by denying uh, racism or downplaying racism, uh, but really fighting to expose the way that racism also undermines the conditions of life for white people. That racism may be our burden, but it's everybody's problem who is not rich, wealthy, and connected um, in this society. And part of that is looking at the, the last several years of what some journalists have identified as um, political scientists and then picked up by journalists, deaths of despair. <clears throat> so for ordinary white people uh, in this country, uh, their life expectancy has gone into reverse, a phenomenon that does not exist in the developed world. And it has gone into reverse because it's driven by suicide, opioid addiction, and alcoholism. These are not the hallmarks of unquestioned privilege in this society. So there, in some obscene way, there is a solidarity of sadness between white people who are drinking and drugging themselves to death and a whole swath of black people who are dying from marginalization, oppression, exploitation. And the, the issue is, is there a political basis upon which we can connect. And that has been the issue. That has been the struggle since the, the, the post-emancipation period. It's certainly been the struggle 
over the 20th century, the ways that racism uh, not only destroys the lives of black people in this country and brown people in this country, but that it also undermines the lives of millions of white people. And part of that also means understanding there's not a universal white experience right. uh, in, in this country. Everybody is not Jeff, Jeff Bezos running around or the, the wealthy members uh, of, 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 of Congress. And so it's a complicated uh, uh, issue, but I believe that if... Our fates, in many ways, are, are, are tied together, and we have to figure out uh, politically what are the basis and, and, and foundations uh, of solidarity to build the kind of multiracial movement that is needed to free us all. Uh, we have time for about one more question. I, I don't want to add to, to what Kianga just said. Um, there are candidates, there, there are public intellectual white people, and there are candidates who have attempted this. Right, there was that guy named Bernie Sanders who had made attempt at this. I have serious criticisms of him. I'm not gonna, this is not Bernie advocacy. But the problem is that when you have people who make these kinds of arguments, who are talking about what she's, she's mentioning here, this idea that like, yo, we actually have to look at the, 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 the impoverished nature of white people and that's why they're radicalized and everything else like that. Whenever there's often white speakers who make that argument, we're like, yes, okay, we get it, we get it, we get it. They're like, if you guys could just, just be quiet about the whole racism thing and then we can all work together and that's where it falls apart. So if there, was, if there was a white political leader who would make that argument and then connect it to what's actually happening to black people and not tell black folks that they gotta shut up and do, you know, we, we can't stand your identity politics, then that coalition would happen. But it hasn't happened in like 70 years. Last question. Hello, my name is Kiana. I'm from Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I am currently a sociology major at Morgan State. Earlier, um, the <laughs> earlier the topic of censorship censor censorship was touched. How is journalist? What strategies do you use to combat censorship when you guys are talking about structural racism or anything that goes against white national white nationalism ideologies? I'll just answer very quickly and get out of my colleague's way. I don't have a whole lot of experience with that because I've made my decision over the arc of my adult life to work in black spaces. <laughs> uh, I think what you're asking is, is what happens when you write something and somebody wants to tone it down, basically, which is what happens to me a lot. There are hills that I will die on. I will just tell people, uh, you, you either get this or you don't or you have this or you don't, and because I can always walk away from something, right? I can always say, I don't care if I get published, I've been doing it enough. I think one of the things that you have to do though, and I, I learned this on a really interesting platform called Twitter, which is about to die, is um, how you say it means a lot, and what you say and how you articulate it says a lot. So in other words, sometimes you have to use the language of your oppressor to get the point across about your oppressor. See, because I know there are two words I can always say in the press or on television that will make everybody go crazy. It just happened on Sunday. White men. If I say white men, I can say white men jumped over the moon with the cow, and it'll be like, she's a racist. Right? But I do it because I need to push that button. If I let them censor me because they are persecuting me in my email and calling my dean and everybody else and saying, you need to shut her up. You know, I only have two choices, to shut up or keep going. And I have decided that I'm gonna keep going because there's, it's, it's not worth it anymore to allow these people with a huge media structure of their own to continue to hold the airwaves. This is what, we did not get to this today, but I wanna say this very clearly. You don't understand the apparatus that is here that fuels this kind of religious and right-wing oppressive behavior. How do you think CRT started? It starts in a little bitty space and it grows into the school board people fighting each other. How do we get trans stuff or bathroom laws? It starts at a little church service or on places like Focus on the Family, a family research council with the mailing to all of their members. And then people get scared, and the message gets out, and that's it. And so the censorship, you have to understand, is not just coming from big organizations. It comes from the bottom up. And then that's how people censor themselves, because you think that that's the way that the public thinks and that you shouldn't say anything. This has been a fantastic discussion. <laughs> we just got the times up. Please give a round of applause to the entire panel.
Uh, I just want to thank everybody. Uh, now seems like a very good time to take a break, so let's take 10 minutes to stretch. Stretch your legs. If you want to chat with anybody up here, feel free. Maybe throw on a mask before you do, and uh, I'll see you guys in a couple minutes.
Please take your seats. As we are about to begin, please take your seats. Please welcome back to the stage, Nicole Hannah-Jones. Boy, you see why I wore these tennis shoes today. All right, so um, I am, hope everybody had good food, yes? That last panel was fire, right? All right, so I am so excited and grateful that our next speaker is joining us to share a few words today. He is an unparalleled thinker, a magnificent writer, and I am one of, he is one of the reasons that I'm at Howard today. He is an HU alum, so everyone please, please welcome my dear friend and colleague, ta Coates. I just um, had, um, <coughs> I'm a little overwhelmed uh, with emotion right now. Um, I've had a connection uh, to Howard University uh, in some capacity uh, for over 40 years now. Uh, my dad worked at Moreland Spingard um, as a research librarian. And um, so I've been coming here literally since I was, you know, like yay high. And I was um, being led by a young lady <laughs> Um, and if this talk is bad, it's her fault. Um, but I was being led by a young lady through the green room and, um, or back to the green room, and she said, have you ever been this way before? I said, no, I've, I've been here for over 40 years, and um, I've never, you know, been this way before. And she said, I, I, I think we were in school together. And I looked at her and I said, yeah, yeah, I do, I remember you. Um, and then we had a conversation that um, I'm not gonna repeat because it's just gonna really embarrass me. Um, it would look bad for me. But, but what I'm trying to say is um, I've been here now <clears throat> as a professor officially on campus uh, since August, and I keep having these emotional moments. And I keep being told that um, at some point it's going to stop happening. And, and it just hasn't stopped happening. Um, and part of why I think it hasn't stopped happening is because this is home. Um, and home is a very, very special place. And when I thought about coming back, and when I thought about coming back home with my good friend, uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones, I, I, I knew in theory that there was nowhere else uh, in the world that I would rather be to continue uh, my time as a professor. I knew that there was nowhere else in the world that Nicole should be to continue her work uh, for the center for journalism and democracy. Um, I, I, I took a trip a few months back. I guess it's been about a month and a half or so. I went to Africa for the first time. Uh, I went to uh, Senegal, to, to Dakar. Um, so I had a very, very different kind of homecoming than the one that I had here. And I, I was trying to think about why it took me all of those years to at last go to Africa. I had you know, traveled at that point to Italy, France, um, I had been all the way around the world to Australia. Um, I had been everywhere except gone back to the place that, that was home for me that, you know, so many of us as, as black people, as people of African descent, feel like uh, uh, we should go around the world. And what I, what I realized was that it was tremendous weight, that, uh, you know, a trip back home could never be a, a, a vacation. Um, it, it could never be tourism. There was so much that, that had to be faced, that had to, to be worked through. I had to go to Gore Island by myself at 7 a.m. and walk around and just sort of take in the feelings and take in all of the emotions. Um, it was not a relaxing trip. 
Um, it was not, uh, uh, as I said, tourism. It was not a vacation, but it, but it was energizing. It was perhaps the most meaningful trip I'd taken in my life. It was a trip that was about something. And when I think about coming back to Howard University, having now taught at a couple other universities, which I hope I'm not slighting here, I feel that same sort of weight. Um, I feel the kind of uh, discomfort <laughs> that anybody that's ever gone to an HBCU probably feels. Um, I have some traumatic memories of standing in line waiting to get validated. Um, I'm, I'm told that uh, there are other HBCUs here uh, in attendance, so I don't think it's only Howard that has uh, these, these issues or this kind of weight that it puts on you. Um, but I also have the tremendous privilege of coming back to a place that has always been about something. There are some very, very illustrious universities uh, in this country with big names and huge endowments. But what we know, and what me and Nicole often talk about, is that those endowments are built and founded very often on the enslavement, the destruction, and the plunder of the labor of our ancestors. So you have one class of university in this country that was founded on enslavement. And then you have another class of universities that was founded to remedy and deal with the attendant effects of enslavement. <clears throat> and when I thought about where I wanted to be and when I thought about where home was, I knew exactly where I wanted to be. I come here and I, and I walk across the yard and I feel the weight of my own memories of being here and, and all of the ambition that I have. I feel the weight of seeing so many uh, intelligent, young, you know, black kids buzzing around. I'm being told I should stop calling them kids. I'm supposed to say students. I'm sorry, I'm not always up on the latest lingo. Um, but I feel all these young, young black students and they're just brimming with ambition. And you know, on, on, on one level, you can tell yourself that you know, we don't believe the lies that are set up about our people that are propagated, about who's intelligent and, and who's not. Um, and yet you come here and you sit, as I do you know, from time to time, right out there on the steps of Carnegie Hall, and you just watch, and you're amazed. And you're ashamed that you're amazed. Because that reveals just how much weight of the thing you're actually carrying. But it's not just the present. The thing that makes Howard University special, and the thing that makes our HBCU special is just this, this tradition of ancestry. You know, you, you walk here and you're enrolled in a struggle. Your, your life is about something. I teach creative writing right over there at Douglas Hall. I'm not just teaching kids how to write beautifully. I'm in the tradition of Zora Neale Hurston. I'm in the tradition of Toni Morrison. I'm in the tradition of Isabel Wilkerson. I'm in the tradition of Amiri Baraka. I'm in the tradition of people who learn to use words as best they could to end that legacy that I was talking about earlier of enslavement. And if I were at Morgan University, or if I was from Morgan University, if I was from Fisk, if I was from Tuskegee, if I was from Morehouse, if I was from Spelman, I could stand up here and give you that same recitation of ancestry. And that weight, that, that being invested was something what, I, what I've come to realize is it really, really is a privilege. It's a privilege to be a professor at Howard University. I got all of this attention, and I, I think both, both uh, myself and, and Nicole got attention. Oh my God, you're making this big sacrifice. You know what I mean? You're gonna go back to an HBCU. Oh, you're so noble for going back to an HBCU. I know you had all these other offers and you went to it. And, and what these people don't realize <laughs> is that we're privileged. We're privileged. You know, I, I, I didn't come back here to give, although I hope that I'm giving. I came back here to receive. And so what, what I can say is um, when we talk about a center for journalism and, and, and democracy, I, I don't know what else you would want to be besides an HBCU. Because the tradition of black writing in this country, the tradition of black journalism in this country is a tradition of truth telling. It's a tradition of Ida B. Wells riding through the South with a pistol on her lap and going undercover. It's a tradition of Walter White 
working to expose uh, 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 lynch mobs. It is not a tradition <laughs> that watches people assault the Capitol and try to overthrow democracy and says, yes, but we need to hear their side too. It's a tradition of moral clarity. It's a tradition that actually believes in things, that believes that you are here to make the world a better place, not merely to comment and to uh, chronicle the world as it tumbles over a cliff. And I, I learned that here at Howard University. I learned that my education wasn't just to you know, get a 4.0, because I certainly didn't get a 4.0. I barely got a 2.0. <laughs> I certainly didn't learn that here at Howard University. But I learned that whatever I did, it had to advance some sort of greater good, specifically for black people. But that meant really the black tradition. And the black tradition in this country was about the opposition to oppression and enslavement. So that it was big enough to open up and welcome all people from wherever they are, you know, who've ever felt like they've had a, a, a foot on their neck. And so I, I just, you know, when I, when I look out on this crowd, um, and I think everybody knows what a Dynamo Nicole is, uh, what, what a force of nature she is. Um, and that, you know, she really had the foresight and the wisdom, you know, to do this here, says something about her. But I, I think most importantly, and I want you guys to really, really, really hear me on this, it says something about you. I have the kind of encounters here every day when I'm walking across the yard, when I'm meeting with a, with a student <laughs> during office hours, when I'm in class where I have 11 students and 10 of them are young black women. And I just get an education every time I'm in that class. I've never had a class like that in my life. So while we're um, certainly the recipients of all sorts of you know, credits and plaudits and accolades and et cetera, it's very, very, very important for me that you guys understand what you've given us and what you've given this place. And that any sort of center that uh, um, is founded on the idea of truth telling and the idea of perpetrating values of freedom and democracy really should be at a HBCU and really should be at Howard University. Thank you, guys. Okay, oh, you're taller than me. Let me move this down. All right, let's give it up one more time for, for Tanahazi coming home. So when, I'm going off script again, but when um, everything went down with the University of North Carolina and I was talking to Tanahazi and I, I told him, you know, I'm gonna go to a HBCU. That's just what I'm going to do. Uh, of course, I couldn't say that publicly because I had to make Carolina do some things first, but I knew I was going to a HBCU. And when I called him, he said, if you go to Howard, I'm coming to Howard. And how could I turn that down, right? Um, this is a place that feels like home. And before you got here, I was saying, you know, we, we are here at this convening on democracy because this is hallowed ground. This is a place that believed in democracy from the beginning. You just talked about the legacy of black writers and black freedom fighters that came out of here. Uh, so it's just a privilege to be here at the same time as, as you and my good friend. And I can finally claim Howard as my home, which has been a lifelong dream. So, um, so for our, uh, now moving on, sorry. <laughs> for our previous panel, uh, Jason Johnson led our experts through a discussion of how white nationalism reverberates in American policy and society today. So for this discussion, panelists will cover the US media's past complicity and the echoes we see today in coverage of things like demographic anxiety, campaigns against critical race theory, immigration, and the trans community as designed by an increasingly anti-democratic major party. So there are echoes to the failures of the American press that we can learn from from the past. So this is a, a, a panel that's going to help us see this kind of continuing struggle that mainstream media has to cover what's happening um, in an often contested democracy. 
policy. So please welcome Jason back. And we also have Jody Rave Spotted Bear, Kathy Roberts Ford, and Maria Hinojosa. Thank you. You know, when you're a kid and you always think about the music that'll be played when you come on stage, it's never anything that majestic. It's more like, you know, Red Man or something. Um, so this is great. This is great. I feel very humble. Um, thank you all so very much uh, for being here. Um, we are going to start. I have had, I've learned my lesson from the last panel. I'm going to let this entire group of extremely talented journalists do their own introductions. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to explain sort of a little bit about what we're going to be doing on this panel. Uh, they'll do their introductions, and then uh, we'll have at it. This should be a very, very, very spirited conversation where we get to take some shots at the press. Um, you know, in, in, in this country, there, there's a long history of blind spots uh, when it comes to the way that mainstream journalism fails to see the dangers of white nationalism, the way its coverage has often legitimized campaigns against marginalized people uh, and the white regular people who push for these kinds of changes. Jody Rave Spotted Bear, Kathy Roberts Ford, and Maria Hinojosa are going to discuss the U.S. media's past complicity and the echoes we see today of the media's complicity in pushing white nationalist themes, whether we're talking about demographic uh, uh, economic anxiety, anti-CRT, immigrant and trans issues, and other anti-democratic forces that are given space and platform by quote unquote mainstream journalism. So we'll start uh, with everyone, do you want an introduction? Yes, hello, my name is Jody Rabe Spotted Bear and I uh, reported for the mainstream press for Lee Enterprises uh, for a good part of uh, more than a decade covering specifically American Indian issues across the United States. And since then, I have um, I moved back to the Fort Berthold Reservation in North Dakota, where I've lived for about the, the last 10 years. And uh, just in hindsight of, of what, was, what I saw not happening in the press, I founded the Indigenous Media Freedom Alliance. And we also publish on, online at Buffalo's Fire. Hi everyone, I'm so grateful to be here with you and learning from you and with you today. Um, my name is Kathy Roberts Ford. I'm an historian of the press and professor in the journalism department at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. I am here today as a representative for a really diverse and extraordinary group of scholars who worked with me to put together this new book uh, called Journalism and Jim Crow, white supremacy, and the black struggle for a new America. And so my presence on this panel today is to be a voice for this group of dedicated historians who have excavated some troubling past of the role of journalism in building white supremacy in this country. My name is Maria Hinojosa, and it is great to be here with Nicole and everybody else. Oh my God, this is such a beautiful day. So, um, well, it's a little cloudy but and freezing, but it's a really beautiful day to be here. And, and also just hearing ta talking about how emotional he gets. Me too, 100%. So, um, I have a, my own nonprofit media company. I'm the only Latina that runs a national newsroom in the United States of America that also has an investigative unit. Uh, we're based in Harlem, USA, on 125th Street, right outside of the A train. Um, so please look at us, uh, look for us. Uh, we're Futuro Media, we do Latino USA, In the Thick, which is a politics podcast that Jason has been on more than once. And that's basically Meet the Press with F-bombs only for journalists of color. It's a lot of fun, um, and we do a lot of things, so you should check out Futuro Media, but uh, we won a Pulitzer in May. <laughs> Low key. <laughs> Low key. So uh, what we're going to do is, uh, similar to the last panel, uh, each of our panelists is going to talk uh, for about five minutes about uh, how the U.S. media throughout history has sort of reinforced white supremacy with their particular focus and expertise. After they've each spoken for about five minutes, I'll sit down, uh, we'll have our questions, and then we'll do our Q&A with the audience. So. Okay, 
<clears throat> but I do want to say that I, I'm really thankful for Nicole creating this event, and I hope that we see similar uh, summits, workshops, seminars across the nation because this work is very much needed. One of the things that I wanted to start off is, is saying that um, for American Indian issues, it's not something that I think crosses a lot of people's minds. When I first was asked to be on the panel, one of the things that just kept coming across my mind was uh, a reference to Felix Cohen, who wrote the Handbook of Federal Indian Law, which really is considered the Bible that talks about all of the all of the tribes across the country, their interaction with the U.S. government and with with Congress. And after World War II, Felix Cohen had had looked at the Nazi Holocaust in the context of American society. And here's, here's what he, he, he told us then, and it's really relevant today. He said, like the miner's canary, the Indian marks the shift from, poison, uh, from fresh air to poison gas in our political atmosphere. And our treatment of Indians reflects the rise and fall in our democratic faith. So our last speaker on, on one of the panels earlier had mentioned that, I, I believe her name is Kianga, had spoke of the need for multicultural coalitions. And I would say that is really true across the board for all races because the issues that we heard today, like voting rights, gerrymandering, racial fascism, assimilation, those, those problems just aren't unique to black American society. This crosses uh, the board for, for all for all races. So if you look at it that in that context, you know, we're looking at white nationalism and, and media relations. So the issues that are happening today were just as relevant, probably more so, are equal then and today. So in 1828, we had the first Native American newspaper established in the country, and that was the Cherokee Phoenix, and the reason that they had started that was there was an assault on American Indian or, or on sovereignty of the Cherokee Nation. So they used that newspaper to write about not only what was happening in their community with their ceremonies and cultural events, but they also used that newspaper to talk about the congressional assault upon their homelands. I think many of you here are familiar with the, with the Trail of Tears. Back when that newspaper was started, the Supreme Court had issued the um, assimilation uh, mandates to force the Cherokee out of Georgia. So that was one reason why they had to start their own newspaper. And you know, not too much later, it, Another example of, of you know, why we need to tell our own stories in the, in the press is because of the stories such as the Bismarck Tribune in 1876 when Custer made the mistake of taking on the Sioux Nation, the Lakota, in the Battle of the Little Bighorn. The headlines in the Bismarck Tribune in 1876 reflected the bias of the media at that point. They called it a massacre of, uh, of a victim, that being Custer. They talked about how there was no one left to tell the tale of, of what had happened in what they, they called that massacre. And on the front page of the Bismarck Tribune, it was headline after headline after headline, and then the final one said, what is Congress going to do about it? And that takes us to where we're at today because we're having a similar assault by Congress against American Indian issues. I was really glad to hear uh, Mr. Carr earlier bring up the Indian Child Welfare Act. If it's not on your radar, it should be. There is uh, Supreme Court uh, hearings, oral arguments were made last week. And what this is is an assault on Native children and, re and removing Native children from their families, not giving Native families the right to keep those children in their communities. 
And the arguments being made by many of the, the white families is that they shouldn't be last in line to keep these native children and adopt them and keep them in their own families. But really, this is just a continuation of the assimilation practices we were seeing way back when the Cherokee Phoenix was started in, in 1826, that assimilation practice is still ongoing. Uh, but in this case, it's more about the taking of native children. This is an assault on native treaty rights and on tribal sovereignty. So that's something that we really ought to be paying more attention too, so I will um, just, just uh, I know my time is probably running out here, but there's also the issue of, um, you know, we talked about critical race theory. Another thing, a really common theme brought up here today was redistricting and state legislatures and why we need to pay attention to those particular issues. So in North Dakota, in 2017, I think North Dakota legislature was one of the first states to try to pass a law that made it lawful for motorists to run over protesters. Since then, you have you know dozens of other states that um, ha are trying to or have enacted similar laws. In North Dakota, last year, they just the legislature just did a ban on critical race theory. Uh, the argument there was. What the um, uh, the people that were supporting critical race theory, they argued, well, we're not even teaching it in the first place, but the legislature's response was that this would be a proactive measure. So that passed in the le legislature by a vote of 76 to 16. Uh, we're also dealing with gerrymandering issues in North Dakota. So we only have two Native Americans in the legislature. Uh, and that is only the result of new subdistricts that were actually created. So my reservation for the first time since 1871, we actually have a subdistrict where we can elect somebody from our reservation to go represent us in the state legislature. Uh, and then as far as gerrymandering, we only had one, the first native woman who was a Democrat elected to the legislature, Ruth Buffalo, she had handily, she had won her election uh, two, four years ago, and she was up for re-election again, but our legislature actually gerrymandered her district, and so she is no longer in, in office. And if it weren't to those, for those two sub-districts, we wouldn't have any representation in the legislature. So that said, I just do want to encourage the uh, multicultural alliances, and I, I look forward to having more discussion about that. Journalism is neither a neutral cultural product nor a neutral institution in American democratic life. That's one of the messages um, of our book, Journalism and Jim Crow, and that's a really important uh, takeaway from the history that I and my colleagues um, excavated in doing this work um, over the course of a number of years. What we show is how democracy died in the US South from 1875 to 1965, which plenty of scholars have done. What they've failed to see adequately, we argue, is that white newspaper editors and publishers in the South were critical political and economic actors in making that happen. This is a kind of shocking and disturbing reality, I think, for a lot of historians and students of, journalists, of journalism and for journalists and for news institutions, primarily historically white news institutions, to understand. It is absolutely vital, it seems to me, that news institutions, because of the role and the uh, constitutional, the role that they play in American democracy and the constitutional protection they receive to play that role, that they, those who have been involved in these kinds of anti-democratic, anti-black, violent, white supremacist building of political economies and social orders in this country come to terms with their role in that history that they make atonement, that there are reparations, that contemporary journalism institutions that are predominantly white 
that may not have a legacy of these particular involvements, that they too understand how history works, how path dependence works, that they um, understand uh, the inheritance today that um, is part of the world we've inherited, and that, they, that we also all understand that the black press from its very beginnings in 1827 through the creation of Jim Crow, the ending of Reconstruction, the creation of Jim Crow, and about a 90 years of a racial terror reign of white supremacist Democrats in the South, that the black press fought this. They documented what happened as it was happening. These black journalists and leaders, news, black newspaper editors and publishers were all activists and leaders in the black community in creating a discursive, a black discursive space as DeWeston Haywood, a contributor to our book and professor at Hunter College, uh, has documented beautifully for us on an absolutely gorgeous chapter about the black press and what they were working toward. This is a history that is poorly understood and we're really hoping that lots of um, black journalists have been quite interested in it. I really hope a lot of more journalists will be interested in this as well. Yeah. So um, I guess I, I wanna say one quick thing, talk long because I really wanna get into the dialogue. Um, <laughs> If you understand like the situation that we have regarding immigrants and, and immigration, um, I think that it's really interesting to think about why are we still stuck, particularly on that issue, and by the way, we know increasingly many of the migrants and refu refugees are black, whether from Africa, Haiti, the black Caribbean. Um, we don't see this because we can't get into the immigrant detention camps and show this, and I think that that's, it's not, it is obviously on purpose. But anyway, if you think about Overwhelmingly, our mainstream media today and forever has been run by, some, some of them are my best friends, right? White, cis male, presenting heterosexual men of extreme means and privilege. But they may be, you know, like our friends and all, but that doesn't mean we all see the perspective through their eyes, right? That's the whole thing, and that's, that's why there is this history, which is, well, objectivity looks like Walter Cronkite, who, by the way, I worked for, and actually would have been really down with the conversation now. But if you understand that they continue to run the mainstream media, then we understand how we are in the situation. Let's just take on the issue of immigration, because they have ra been raised consuming media over the past 50 years that has basically maintained that same narrative. So when they start running news media organizations, they're like, well, yeah, right, illegal immigrants, right? No, there's no such thing as an illegal immigrant. There's no such thing as an illegal human being. It's grammatically incorrect and also wrong. Um, so that gives us a perspective in terms of the longevity, and I so appreciate what Jody, Jody, I need that quote, because I talk about journalists of color today as being the ones who are seeing the canaries on the mine fla fa falling, 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 and we're screaming, and you know, we're being told, can you just calm down? Always, can you just calm down? Um, I, I raised the issue of the mainstream media because, for example, um, Fox News, which would fall into what my colleague was just mentioning in terms of organizations that are purposely misleading and having a political and economic, and economic agenda, that would be Fox News today, that basically um, carried and maintained repeating the lies of a candidate that then became the president that then said over and over again a lie. Right, the way he launched his career, I mean, his campaign. Uh, I don't know what's happened today. I don't really want to know or think about what that person is doing today. But the question for the journalists is, why did you repeat that over and over and over again without a warning? Now, that's without saying, by the way, what you're about to consume is factually incorrect. We know this because we are journalists and we do our work, and we know that there is less crime in immigrant communities than there is in American citizen communities. So the question really is, you know, to our colleagues, some of whom are here, is why? 
I remember when I um, presented a question to a very senior journalist about the Trump White House, in fact, and it was like, you want me to be objective, but how can I be objective when I represent everything that that person hates? And he says it. I'm gonna tell you a little joke so you can laugh, okay? I don't have to say this anymore because he's no longer president, but I'd say, you know, this man, I'm five things that this person hates, right? I'm Mexican, I'm an immigrant, I'm a journalist, I'm a woman, and I'm flat-chested. <laughs> Thank you for the laugh. It, the, the, but the point is, is that, you know, it was like, so how am I supposed to be, quote unquote, objective? Um, that for me is one of the central issues, right? It, for me, the issue of solidarity is key. For me, my entire understanding of my role as a journalist of conscience in this country it really solidified when I read the book News for All the People by Juan Gonzalez and Joe Torres. If you haven't read it, please do. It is the history of journalists of color. And that was when I understood that my founding father as a journalist is Frederick Douglass, and my founding mother is Ida B. Wells. And that, that allowed me to understand the kind of responsibility that I have, which is about uh, telling the truth. And I guess I'll just end like this, because I really want to, this is five minutes, but I do want to say one quick thing. And it's a little bit more political than I normally would, although if you listen to In the Thick, we get pretty political. But in terms of this particular conversation, I think it behooves journalists to understand and point out the relationship between the Black Lives Matter movement of today, which started from the first day a black person was trafficked to this country. Uh, that's when the Black Lives Matter movement started, in my view. But the Black Lives Matter of today tied and connected to what's happening with the pro-immigrant rights movement. Those two things, as journalists, we must put them together because they are the centerpiece of what is happening now. Black journalists assured that prisons, mass incarceration, private prisons, all of this is on the center, center of the conversation. What that has given rise to is immigrant detention camps. There's no legal binding support for any of the people there, and those are the places which are now housing and incarcerating and holding our people, and we can't see them, and they have no rights. Anyway, thank you. I look forward to the conversation. Thank you. I, I want to start with this, and I, I want to sort of do a rapid fire and get an answer from each of you guys. We're going to go through a couple of things like this. One of the purposes of this panel is to, as I said at the beginning, identify blind spots, right? Not just sort of historic blind spots, but also current blind spots in our mainstream media. Um, because we're here at a university, name names, because I'm gonna name names, right? <laughs> and, and I want to hear from each of you an example that you have seen in the last couple of years, whether it's in your area of expertise or just an observation. You're, you're, you're at the gym, you're in the kitchen, and you, 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 that thing that you see on TV or you read it, you're like, what the, how did, how did they get this frame? How did they put this in this particular way? And, 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 and how you sort of responded to that as a journalist. And I'll give you a quick example. Um, I, am, I got my, my doctorate in political science from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, but I, uh, my undergraduate institution is the University of Virginia. And so I remember going on the air um, very soon after the Charlottesville terrorist attack. And I made a point to say on the air, sitting with, it's a great colleague of mine, Chris Matthews, but I remember sitting on the air and saying, this was a terrorist attack, Chris, and the president, President Trump at the time, is a terrorist sympathizer. And he, his reaction was not positive, and again, I like Chris, but he was like, Jason, Jason, I was like, no, 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 this is terrorism, and he's a terrorist sympathizer by saying there's good people on both sides. We wouldn't be having this question in any other context. That's terrorism, and he's okay with it. And there was a tremendous amount of pushback uh, from a lot of, of white journalists, from some black journalists who didn't know no better, and a lot of mainstream news outlets to try to frame Charlottesville as just a riot or just an attack and not recognize it as a terrorist attack that was fomented. I mean, quite literally, the president was as responsible for what happened in Charlottesville as he was on January 6th. You know, it was fomented by what he was talking about. So just each of you quickly, can you give an example of something that you saw the mainstream press was clearly sort of promoting a white nationalist frame 
about some kind of issue without doing the kind of inspection and sort of exemplifying the blind spot that we're talking about. We, we can start with you, Marie. Uh, what happened to that red wave? I'm sorry. One of the basic things that journalists need to understand is how to understand propaganda. In an authoritarian regime, this is one of the basic things. We teetered on authoritarianism, and because of what happened just a few days ago, maybe we've saved ourselves. Maybe. <laughs> okay, it's still, but a teetering a little bit less towards that, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so we do in the thick. We, we created our own political podcast because we were tired of being excluded from the mainstream media conversations and also to challenge these kinds of things because we were like, where's this red wave? It was political propaganda, which... Uh, why are our fellow colleagues using polls that are being sourced by Republicans without double sourcing? What the hell is this? Media Literacy 101. Uh, next from the red wave is the red Latino, Latina, Latinx, Latine wave. No pasó. No pasó. Entonces, we, again, as journalists, we've got to be more astute. That's the real question. That's why democracy and journalism go together, because it is the astuteness to understand everything that we've said here, the canaries in the mind, that we're not going to accept propaganda. And, and all of us, uh, journalists, who raise these questions, as you know, we are always labeled as just two activists, and we have an agenda. And thank God it's not happening to me anymore, thank God, because I have my own company. But I feel terrible because it continues to exist to this day. Yeah. And that is why my students love you and listen to your podcast and write about it in their media reflection journals. And it's meant a lot to them and to me. Um, I think in term, in, instead of focusing on one event, I really just want to talk a little bit about uh, right-wing news media. Because I, I'm sorry to tell us all, <laughs> or to, but I do think that it's mainstream media now and um, the places like Fox News are overly involved in a political project that is anti-democratic and, and white nationalist at the very least, and I think worse than that. Um, and I am deeply concerned about our news ecosystem in which this, uh, kind of particularly Fox News and other right-wing news media, their right-wing news media allies, are aligned with uh, right-wing extremists in, on a, working together on a political project that's anti-democratic. Um, they um, are involved in, of course, very um, unpleasant efforts at gerrymandering and at suppressing the vote and at uh, encouraging anti-CRT legislation and, and much more. This is troubling. We have a, a problem in our news ecosystem in this country. Um, and I'm certainly not going to let the, uh, main, the other mainstream media, the reality-based, fact-based, tethered to reality news media, off the hook. But thank God for them. I think we've got a lot doing some really important, important work. But we need, um, we do need this revolution in journalism standards. We do need the Center for Journalism and Democracy. We do need this Democracy Summit, and all to be talking together about how we escape from news values like impartiality and neutrality that have been used for far too long as a cover for anti-democratic work. Jason, you, you started off this question you know, on point, and that is the reminder that speakers earlier reminded us that we can't neutralize our vocabulary when we're writing about these very tough issues. And I, I found myself doing that. I, I was working on some stories about the, a, a, an opinion piece about the North Dakota legislature. And I found myself censoring myself. It's like, what is a more neutral word for uh, white supremacist here? But it's like, OK, I, I, I resign myself to saying I, I'm going to say it. Because a lot of these people where I live would actually probably em embrace that word. So I don't think I'd be offending too many, too many people. But as far as specific examples, you know, currently, this issue with the adoption of Native children, this has been in the news for, for decades. You know, white families have been fighting for Indian children for decades. And 
<clears throat> I think because the story has been around for decades, you're starting to see a little bit more nuanced reporting on it. I really advise people to look at the This Land podcast by Rebecca Nagel. Slams that story out of the water. Yeah, give her some applause because if you want nuance in what is happening in the history of American Indian lives and children and how Congress has intersected in our lives, I just have to say that, uh, you know, a tip of the hat to Nicole because all of her work is grounded in history and context and bringing that to our reporting. And Rebecca Nagel in that ICWA podcast hits, hits everything right out of the, the park. So, um, but yeah, but to that point, the stories that had been told prior to that were really based in misinformation. Reporters were telling that story as, uh, this is a racial issue and you know, how dare they try to keep <laughs> Indian kids in their homes based on race. But really, it, American Indians, we're, our whole grounding in the US Constitution is, is based on political classification, not racial. Right. And, and that is what the story that the mainstream press had got wrong for a, for a long time. So we're just coming out of, uh, look, I, I contend that, that uh, similar to what Maria said, that the midterms may have just, I don't know, it's like the political groundhog woke up and said, hey, you might have 18 more months of democracy, right? That's about as good as we got out of this. Um, but, you know, Maria, one of the things I want to talk about is that you've covered elections abroad. Um, you went to Nairobi, Kenya in, in 2008. You talked about how the press played a role in sort of fomenting racial violence. And what I want to sort of ask you is, you know, there's, there's occasionally, you'll see it online, uh, somebody will write an article where they'll say, this is how we would cover this if this were happening in another country, right? If what we saw happening in America was happening in another country, every mainstream news outlet would be like, this oppressive regime, this terrible place is keeping certain people from writing. But that's not how the Washington Post covers it. That's not how the Atlantic covers it, right? If, if the 2000 election happened in another country, think about that. If this was Brazil, if this was Spain, if an entire election, presidential election, came down to the district run by the brother of one of the guys running, the America would be screaming about that. We would say that this is a fraud in the country. We'd be calling it a banana republic or some other racially tinged, that's the other term they like to use, racially tinged, uh, some other racist term. So, uh, Maria, I'd like you to talk a little bit about your coverage of elections in Kenya uh, and also what that may have shown you about how our elections continue to sort of frame white supremacy as the norm, whereas you have a bit more freedom sometimes when you're abroad. So I was incredibly lucky to go travel to Kenya after the 2007 elections, which feels like a, such a long time ago. But the 2007 elections in, in, in Kenya actually turned out to be very bloody. There was a massacre of about 15, 1,700 people, massacred in very brutal and ugly ways. Um, and this is after Rwanda. Rwanda is right next to Kenya. So it was like, how could this repeat itself? And in meeting journalists, senior level journalists in Nairobi, um, they talked to me about how post that dynamic, seeing the blood on the streets, right? And kind of like, wow, we literally have blood on our hands because the journalists were fomenting, right? A, repeating things about tribal divisions and fomenting, putting photographs, using headlines that were about creating and sowing the division. Sound familiar? So what the journalists did is that they met up and they said, we're no, we are now gonna practice something that we label peace journalism. Where as a journalist, primary on your mind has to be getting to peace, not selling the most papers or supporting one tribe versus another, but how do we get to peace? And this is something that I remember thinking like, oh my God, this is so radical. If I go back to the United States and talk, uh, talk about wanting to be a peace journalist, I was like, that'll be the end of my career. Because it'll be like, oh yeah, you're so immigrant-y, so Mexican-y, and now you want to be PC? Get out of here. Not PC, but PC. <laughs> so um, I think that this is, again, to me right now, one of the things that I'm obsessed with is I'm a democracy junkie like Jason. This is like, like Nicole, right? Like I live and breathe democracy. And we have to understand that right now, the second largest voting cohort, not a block, but cohort of voters are Latinos and Latinas, Latinx, Latine. 
And this is huge, but we don't really understand that. Like, it's not like you see this being talked about in every single political conversation in the United States of America. And yet, why? Why are we still essentially invisible? Why does that happen? Why does it continue to happen? And understanding that perpetuating that um, is actually the worst possible thing that can happen to a democracy. So the most common age of Latinos and Latinas in the United States right now is 11. You understand what I'm talking about in terms of democracy and getting to voting age and the massive amount of Latinos and Latina voters that are gonna be around. So talking about that, that population, that cohort, understanding, talking politics all the time is what I say to, you know, when I speak, Latinos and Latinas have to be talking politics, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, domestic politics, because we have to embrace this all. So for me, understanding peace journalism, but then also like factual journalism, <laughs> data-based journalism, I still don't understand, like I'm not a data whiz, I'm just saying what's true. I don't understand why people are not kind of running up and saying, oh my God, well we gotta do this in the parties, for example. But that is one of the dynamics that we face today in our country. You know, Kathy, a lot of your work, you, you, your, your book in particular that you were talking about, talks about how the press um, actively sort of fomented and helped maintain um, basically the American apartheid system with housing segregation and Jim Crow. Um, and that, of course, affected language, right? Like, we, we, we're now discussing, like, the great migration in the United States, but it's people leaving the South. It's not people fleeing the apartheid state, which is what was happening in the United States at the time. So given that background, what do you see linguistically in, in journalism today where you see the same tendencies that you saw in, in the sort of soft touch that Jim Crow was given? What do you see now that our main newspapers are using that same kind of language to paper over what is actually an oppressive system? That's an interesting question. Um, you know, oftentimes it's simply avoiding describing the systems and the structures and how they work. And it may not be avoiding it purposefully, but it's avoid, It's not doing that really critical work of describing the, the context in which um, politics happens, uh, po economic and social life happens. So, you know, so many things are sins of omission. I mean, there are certainly linguistic ones. Um, in our book, we're really we, we talk about the soft power of the news that is in the U.S. South, and this is true all over the country, of course, that news narratives shape, they, these stories that are told shape uh, people's attitudes, beliefs, ideas, and certainly in the South for generations after the Civil War, these white newspapers spread ideas about, about black criminality and degradation and spread a lot of disinformation um, and demonization. And they did it for, for a purpose, right? It was just to create this um, racial apartheid system. So these, you know, the news uh, had soft power, but these news, white news leaders had, they exercised hard political and economic power. So, for example, Ethel Barksdale in 1875 in Mississippi helped, he was the editor of the Jackson Clarion. He, he helped plan and execute the Mississippi plan, which was this murderous Democratic Party political campaign to wrest power from the biracial Republican government of Mississippi. And they did this by stealing an election. And part of the stealing of the election was to go around the state and prevent black Mississippians from being able to participate in political rallies, in organizing, and in voting. And they did this with the use of violent paramilitary groups. And they killed, they killed hundreds of black Mississippians. And that is how Reconstruction ended in Mississippi, and it was devised by a newspaper leader. In fact, he used the offices of the Jackson Clarion as an ammunition, an ammunition dump for these paramilitaries. That's just one of the many stories like this that we tell in our book. Josephus Daniels, the editor of the Raleigh News and Observer, he was part of the Democratic Party leadership in North Carolina in 1898 in which they bring, they um, create a political party built 
a political party campaign to wrest power from a biracial group of fusionists, white and poor white and black people in the state of North Carolina joined political fortunes. It was biracial democracy back for this little moment in time in North Carolina. So what happens? You get the Democratic Party leadership with Josephus Daniels, whose newspaper was basically created to be part of this work, to, um, to create a racial pogrom um, that quashed black voting rights and killed black people and intimidated them and kept them from organizing and told all kinds of lies about black men as sexual predators. Talk about linguistics, right? At that time, told these lies. Um, this is the threadbare lie that uh, was used to justify the lynching of black men that Ida B. Wells laid bare as well. Um, so what happens in North Carolina? You have um, black men and women, children intimidated all over the state. Uh, the election is, the state legislature election is stolen. Wilmington, however, is the seat of fusionist power. It's a biracial government in place, and so the Democratic Party um, puts together a paramilitary group, organized group. They walk into Wilmington, and it's a murderous coup d'etat, and they kill hundreds of black Wilmingtonians. A year later, after the Wilmington coup, they institute the Democratic Party as rulers. All this, uh, newspaper guys write at the leadership of this. Uh, a year later, all um, black men in the state of North Carolina are disenfranchised by constitutional amendment. I want to point out, um, I did not learn that story until about three years ago. And I'm, I'm supposed to be a professional smart person. Right? I mean, <laughs> like, like, like objectively, you know, to be more journalists who admit the stuff that they didn't know. Uh, because as far as what we're educated on, right, um, you know, the, the country spent a year, uh, the mainstream press spent a year talking about Tulsa as if that was the only thing that happened, right? And most people figured that out because they saw Watchmen, um, not because it's something that they had been taught in schools. And so, you know, you're right. That same sort of language, um, it, it's terrifying to, ter terrifying to imagine that in 40 or 50 years uh, that, you know, Ferguson will be called a protest. Um, you know, as opposed to an uprising. Yes. Uh, it took 30 years for what happened in Los Angeles to be referred to as an uprising as opposed to just a riot. Um, with this in mind, Jody, I want to ask you this. We've got a couple minutes before we go to our, to our Q&A. We've all been talking about the importance of, of journalism and fighting back against this language and fighting back against these blind spots. But it's interesting, you know, there, there are 34 tribal colleges across the United States. None of them have a journalism program. None of them. And, 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 and so what role does that play that, that, that children who are coming off, children and adults who may be coming off of reservations, who may be going to uh, sort of Native American journalism schools, they're not being taught how to report on their own community? Yeah, that, that's uh, highly problematic. You know, there, there's just kind of one slight caveat to that. Haskell, Indian Nations University, the, the oldest, uh, um, tribal college in the United States does have a, a two-year communication okay. program. However, I, their, their staff was recently cut, and they don't offer a whole lot of like news reporting classes. So, so yes, we have a we, we don't have journalism programs, and I think to me it almost um, seems by design because the uh, so. We don't just have two forms of government in the United States. It is not just state, it is not just federal. We have tribal governments. Our tribal governments have constitutions. Many of our constitutions are just boilerplate language, which does not reflect our cultural backgrounds. And so my tribe, for example, is created by the Indian Reorganization Act. Again, a boilerplate language that does not give us uh, First Amendment protections. We do have the Indian Civil Rights Act embedded into that, and that is where we get the civil, liberty, civil liberties of press freedom and the right to assemble. However, there is nothing to protect us if our tribal leaders decide not to. So the backup for that is, okay, so my civil rights have been violated, then I'm supposed to go to tribal court, but if your tribal council is controlling your judicial branch, we do not have any, any press freedoms in our country. And so that, I say that because it's 
really no big surprise, we don't have any journalism programs. It's just, I think, intentional by design that those abilities for Native people to be heard, to be seen, to have a voice, to have the right to assemble, they're just wiped out. And so that is something, you know, we in journalism have our work cut out for us. All right, thank you so much. All right, can we give a round of applause for our, our panel here? So before we've got a, a few minutes for questions, I want to make sure we get to everybody. I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make this, this quick announcement. Um, so I remember somebody taught me this like a few thousand years ago when I was a student. And, and take this in the love in which it was intended. Um, the, the most dangerous words in these kinds of environments are, I've got a question and a comment. Just ask a question. <laughs> we can, you can sort through it, go through your paragraph, find the nugget of the question. I promise we will get to that. We just want to make sure we can get to as many questions as possible. So uh, we'll start off. Uh, we have our microphone person. Uh, OK, yes, right there. I have matching blazers. Um, hi, uh, my name is Shayla Martin, and I'm a freelance journalist. I have a question about the role of speed in journalistic blind spots. How can we as journalists push back against the pace of journalism today, usually coming from our editors and other higher ups, um, in an effort to get the story right, even if we don't get the story first? <coughs> I'm actually hoping somebody has a cough drop. Anybody? <coughs> cough drop for <coughs> And then I'll answer your question. Oh, oh my god. I love I'll, 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 I'll pop in here real quickly. Um, I don't know that I have the answer. I'm a journalism historian um, and, and not a working journalist. But I do think we, need, we cannot continue to have only uh, the majority of our news media in this country be for profit. We have got to have a publicly funded model, a much bigger one. Um, that allows journalists the time that they need and, and remunerates them, right? Gives them, pays them a good wage to make their lives livable and good and provide opportunity and gives them time to do the work that they need to do and that can interrupt this clickbait and sensationalism um, that unfortunately can happen when we uh, resort to uh, quick frames um, and quick, quick coverage. Yeah, just quickly, I can say that um, we do need more nonprofit media outlets. Uh, Maria has uh, founded one, I founded one. And I think when we're telling our stories from within our own communities, you will have the time to tell those stories, to slow down, to provide the context, and give deeper meaning to that particular story. So more independent media run, by, run and led by people of color. <laughs> You know, our, thanks for the cough drop. You know how that happens and you're just like, I'm dying. <clears throat> so it's interesting because for us, that's not at, at Futuro Media, that's not how we operate. It's, and what we end up finding, <clears throat> and I would use this in your newsroom, right? <clears throat> is that actually the more profound work ends up getting more views. How do you explain that to somebody? How do, you, how do you make that conversation happen in the newsroom? <clears throat> I will tell you one thing that we say now. Sorry my voice is so messy, but it, it's a big idea, but I'm going to throw it at you. Because also, journalists are a very competitive bat, brat, right? We, and I, I love to poke the bear on the issue of comp competition. <clears throat> so what I say in my newsroom is that, to any other newsroom, if you do not look like a representative newsroom, you are not practicing excellence in journalism. You cannot practice excellence in journalism, period. We're not even talking about anything. We're just saying excellence in journalism in your newsroom cannot exist unless you are representative. So the argument to your editors has to be, can we talk, <clears throat> can we talk about the representation and what it actually means for journalistic values? And then take it to the, to the next level, which is actually what we understand, right? The clickbaity thing, it will break your heart. So I love what you said, Jody. It is find the places where you're not going to suffocate with that, but also find the ways that you can fight that argument, right? <clears throat> to just say, I don't know, I always put it in terms of data and in terms of the views. And, and 
We were always considered so radical because we wanted to diversify NPR, for example. <clears throat> and all we were saying was like, do you want NPR to survive in the future? Do you want public media to survive in the future? That's only gonna exist if you are having these communities be a part of it. And public media is, by the way, not yours to share. It's not yours, which is another mentality. I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but I'm giving you bigger ideas that will help you manage your career as you move forward and understand that there are options for you. You don't have to stay in a newsroom where they're gonna squeeze the life out of you. We don't want that happening to you. I'll say this real quick before we get to the next question. The, the other thing, uh, that, to sort of go with what Maria and Jody have said, is um, if you're getting that kind of pressure, if you're getting the get it out before you get it right thing, the safest way to defend yourself is always remember, you're not gonna defend me if I get this wrong. <laughs> so when in doubt, when in, if you're getting pushed, you say, and, and if this is wrong, if this is wrong, are you, am I gonna keep my job? And they never have an answer. So yeah, when in doubt, look after yourself. Next question. Uh, this, this young lady here. Sorry. Hi, my name is Samantha Latson. I'm an Ida B. Wells Fellow and student from Indiana University. When you discuss the issues of the mainstream press, is it time for black and brown journalists to go home and lean into our own media outlets since they aren't changing? Being here has made me wonder if young black and brown journalists should go into what is deemed elite newsrooms or lean into our own like Ida B. Wells and Frederick Douglass? Look, I think, um, you know, my, my career started in the mainstream and I stayed there until my dear friends at 60 Minutes told me to come back after some of the, one of the white guys had gotten sick or died. And I was like, que, que. And then I got on the A train and I cried all the way to Harlem. And then I said, I'm starting my own thing. The way people had said, you should do it, Maria. And I was like, I can't, I, I don't, I'm a journalist. I don't know how to run anything. So if it's in, if you're feeling it, trust that feeling and go with it. It's not for the faint of heart to create your own independent newsroom, but it is absolutely possible. And you're based, are you from Indiana? I'm from Chicago. Well, hello, Chicago, I mean, South Side right here. So, you know, we need to be inspired by the history of independent journalism in Chicago, right, and the Midwest. So, be fluid. If I, you know, if some of my, our journalists, right, end up going to work for the mainstream, which they do, uh, I'm glad because they're walking in with a whole other set of, of rules, frankly. For example, in our newsroom, we don't use the word minority, ever. You're never gonna hear that word. We don't hear, use the term illegal to refer to a human being or an immigrant. Um, so they will take that into mainstream newsrooms and we want that, right? We want newsrooms to be, if you're in the mainstream, to be representative and to be aware. But también, if it comes a time where you're just like, I can't, like I was saying to the young woman behind you, right? You can't lose your soul as a journalist. This is what we don't want you to do. And there are places for you to go. Is it easy? No, but none of it is easy. But most important, we cannot let you lose your soul. Wherever you are, in the mainstream, or if you're being independent, find the people who are gonna be around you to support you because what we do is hard, especially if you're a journalist of conscience. And I hope everyone in this room is a journalist of conscience, and we need you. So don't be frustrated. There wasn't many places for us to go before, but really, in the last two decades, more independent journalism news, uh, newsrooms have opened up, and so there are alternatives. And I want to add something real quick before we get to the next question. The other thing is, there has never been an easier time. I mean, to, uh, to, uh, all of our panelists have basically sort of launch their own way. And one of the things that most successful journalists will do is they'll learn the trade, they'll learn the tricks, they'll learn where the funders are by being at a mainstream outlet, and then they'll launch their own thing. Everything from The Root to Vox to most of the mainstream online press outlets now started by people who were at other locations who left and started their own thing. Next question. Oh, yes, next question. Oh yes, okay, sorry, I didn't see her. I was, the screen was, teleprompter was in my way. <laughs> Thank you. My name's Brielle Robinson. I'm a student at Syracuse University and 
community organizer in education politics in Florida. My question originally was, do you feel that GOP propaganda has steered journalists towards the abandoning of ethics? But after your talk, I now want to know what the historical precedents are that protect journalists from, um, from um, for practicing unethical journalism because a few of my organizers have been doxxed through articles um, published by journalists. And how can organizers protect themselves from this happening? <laughs> That's a tough one. That should not have, that is not ethical journalism, period. Um, and your, your colleagues should not be um, subject <laughs> to that kind of doxing, doxing by journalists. Is this what you're saying? Okay, so she, she was saying, would you would like to just say that really quickly for just a super, just. So um, an article was published about a sit-in that my org had conducted and there were white supremacist parent groups present at the school board meeting and they were do I'm a doxing half of my organizers that are minors and an article was published and that was like disseminated amongst these white supremacist parent organizations. So there were flyers across Miami with our students' faces, their schools, and home addresses. And this was in news media? Yes. So I'm asking how organizers can protect themselves and what allows journalists to do these things. Well, ethics should prevent journalists from doing this. Um, what I recommend is that your group get in touch with the Student Press Law Center, which typically does um, work that supports uh, freedom of the press for student journalists, um, but they may well be reaching out and expanding given the news and media environment that we're in. So this, um, it might be that the student press law um, group can be, of, can be of help. Certainly, um, they do have attorneys there, and I, I, would, I would hope someone could provide some support. Is Any other? I don't have an immediate answer, but I think that the point that you're raising is one that we need to take seriously in the United States of America today, especially after what we lived through on 1-6. Um, violence and threats and intimidation and coercion uh, for journalists of conscience um, is something very real. So uh, we know that um, we're getting ready to drop several pretty intense investigative pieces because, did I forget to tell you that I'm running an investigative unit now? I'm the only Latina that run, has an investigative, national investigative unit looking particularly at Latino, Latina issues um, and, and and writ large, but we are going to be shaking some feathers. Uh, shaking some feathers? No. ¿Cómo es? Shaking. Ruffling, ruffling Ru feathers. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, Latinos, Mexicans, we do that all the time. We're like, you know, shaking in their boots or ruffling the feathers. We mess it up all the time. You're, the you're point shaking. of this story is <clears throat> the issue of safety and security for journalists in this country is one that should be actually a, a, a conversation and also on the question of, of activists. Um, that's not new, Cointel Pro, anyone. So um, thank you for speaking up, which is the other important thing that we need is to hear these stories. Yeah, just briefly, I'd also uh, contact the Society of Professional Journalists. They have fantastic student resources and a legal defense fund, and very orientated towards uh, helping uh, college journalists. Thank you. And I want to add something real quick, um, and, and Maria and several people sort of alluded to it. Um, it, it, ain't, it ain't safe out there for journalists, like in, in addition to activists. Uh, it's not only the threats that we receive, but uh, you know, there are whole networks that dedicate themselves to attacking journalists and anchors at other networks. Um, and so it can be dangerous through and through. What I would always suggest to activists, and I've worked with activists and organizers, is before you embark upon this work, and it's very hard to tell this to, to really young people, you have to basically put on your armor. You need to start scraping your social media. You need to start limiting what you actually put out there. You need to, even if your parents aren't necessarily down with it, telling your parents that this is what I'm about to do. 
because you have to provide, you have to make it difficult for these outside right-wing groups to come after you. Because a lot of times, those aren't journalists. Those are just people who have access to a blog. And they masquerade as journalists, and they call themselves journalists when they're really just white nationalists who have an ISP. So, um, we, actually, we, we actually don't have uh, much time. What I want to do now, uh, thank you guys. Please give another round of applause for our fantastic panel. I want to thank you guys so much uh, for your time, your energy, your patience. Please make sure if you have any questions that you come up and chat with any of the panel. I think we've got to take a quick picture at the step and repeat, but everybody will be here uh, and available. And then in a couple of minutes, Nicole Hannah-Jones will be back up here to introduce the next panel. Thank you so much. Hello. Ooh. We're not actually doing anything at the step and repeat, so we're going to continue to the last panel. You could take your seats, please. All right. I know it's been a lot, uh, but thank you all for paying so close attention to all of these amazing panelists. So, yes. <laughs> We are at our final panel for the day. Oh, no, go back. Not there yet. There we go. So we've talked a lot today about the markers and history of our fragile democracy and the urgency of a more active pro-democracy stance amongst the press. So our final panel today is a 45-minute discussion with 15 minutes of questions, and they are going to uh, dissect for us uh, what the press needs to be doing better and what are some better ways that we can be covering uh, the erosion of democracy in the United States. So please welcome Tremaine Lee, who will be moderating the panel today, Jay Rosen, Wesley Lowry, Ested Herndon, and Cassandra Harmio in a discussion. Okay, welcome. Thank you. I know we have some, some superheroes here, but that was superhero music. <laughs> I have to give it the obligatory, y'all look good out here today. Thank you for sticking around. So give it up for yourselves. Before we get started, I'd love for our panelists just to introduce yourselves for us. Hi, everyone. I'm Jay Rosen. I teach journalism at New York University, which I've been doing since 1986. And I'm a press critic with a focus on coverage of politics. I'm Wesley Lowry. I'm currently a journalist in residence at uh, CUNY's Newmark Graduate School of Journalism, as well as a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist um, uh, covering issues of race and justice. Hi, my name is Estelle Herndon. I am a politics reporter at the New York Times, and I host uh, our, the Times Politics Podcast, which is called The Run Up. Thank you. I appreciate you saying that. Hey, everyone. My name is Cassandra Jaramillo. I'm an investigative reporter at ProPublica, and I cover voting rights and uh, our democracy. Thank you. And I'm a Tremaine Lee correspondent at MSNBC and the host of the Into America podcast. So thank you all again for joining us. Thank you. So we've seen um, in our newspaper headlines, in our podcasts, and on TV, conversations about the fragility or the stability of our democracy, right? And oftentimes, journalists, you know, we have an arm's length kind of vantage point to democracy. And I wonder if there is an argument, and I know you guys will posit the argument for a more pro-democracy kind of journalism, and what that actually means in, in this moment, especially, the stakes are always high, but the stakes seem 
especially high. Let's start with you, Jay. What, what does it mean, like, what does pro-democracy journalism actually mean to you? I'll get to that. About a year ago, Jonathan Carl, who's the chief White House correspondent for ABC News, went on CNN to talk about his new book about Trump. And he was asked, what if he runs again? Which is a current question. And Carl's answer was bleak. Now, remember, this is Jonathan Carl. He's the former president of the White House Correspondents Association. He's known as a down-the-middle guy. He has enormous respect within the profession. And he said, if he runs again, it's going to be enormously challenging because Trump is essentially, this is Jonathan Carl talking, an anti-democratic candidate. He'll be running in a system that he is trying to tear down, said Jonathan Carl. He'll be perpetually lying and trying to use us as a conduit for those lies. John Carl said, what does a debate even look like with Donald Trump in it? How do you even do a simple interview? Almost every interview would just melt down in lies and manipulations from the first question. So he lays out all of these problems and Brian Stelter says, okay, so what do we do about that? And he says, I don't know. So it's in that context where the practices themselves are broken. They don't take account of the kind of challenge that they are facing that this question of pro-democracy comes up. Political coverage in the U.S. rests on a semi-conscious and half-buried picture of American politics and how it works. Two roughly similar parties that operate in roughly the same way but have different philosophies, ideologies, and priorities compete during elections for power with the press standing in the middle between them keeping score. That is the half-buried picture of politics on which most practices rest. This semi conscious picture of how politics works is also responsible for the treatment of politics as a game or as is sometimes called a horse race. But this picture of how politics works has collapsed. Its utility, as John Carl recognized, has evaporated. And today we have a two-party system in which one of the two parties is anti-democratic. And from my point of view, the biggest problem in political journalism today is what kind of consensus can replace this half-conscious picture of democracy that has been used for so long. So when we say the press has to become more pro-democracy, here are some of the things we mean. We mean, first of all, shifting from what are the odds of him winning to what are the stakes? What are the stakes when anti-democratic actors become candidates, when authoritarians uh, run for office, when a political party itself turns authoritarian? Another shift for being pro-democracy would be, instead of teaching the audience to be savvy observers of politics, help them be informed participants a much greater emphasis on participation uh, as opposed to observation would be part of a pro-democracy frame. In election coverage, instead of starting with the candidates and their chances of winning, start with the voters and begin your campaign coverage by asking, what do you want the candidates to be talking about as they compete for votes? What do you want the candidates to be talking about in this campaign? If we can do that enough, then that can be the starting point for uh, campaign coverage instead of uh, who's ahead. By now, it's a well-known story how democracies die. We heard about it at this conference. All of the insights that come out of that how democracies die literature are pointers for press coverage because journalists have to be particularly aware of the various metrics by which a democracy can expire. Those who are attacking our institutions and suggesting violence as a way to be heard have to be placed by journalists in a different category 
with normal candidates. They have to be kind of segregated off from the other candidates and described by the danger they pose to American democracy. So not the odds, but the stakes. Instead of savvy observers, help us be informed participants. Don't start with the candidates, start with the voters. Use the knowledge we have about how democracies die to reform political practices and isolate those who would attack democracy. Put all those things together, and I think eventually we could have answers to Jonathan Carl's questions. Wes, how are you thinking about this? When I think about this question, I think first and foremost, I think it's important to frame it with the understanding that we've never had a pro-democracy press in the United States of America. I think that sometimes we make the mistakes with our institutions that we believe we're trying to reset back to a norm that once existed. Um, when, when we apply historical pressure, what we find, if we're being honest, is that the things we wish existed in our history do not. Um, and so as we think about a, if we're just describing a pro-democracy press as a press that supports the franchise and the right to Republican government for um, the entirety of the citizenry, that's not something that's ever existed in the United States of America, certainly not among the establishment mainstream press. Uh, but beyond that, I think that one of the things we have to think about is zooming outward even one further step. What I think we're talking about, if the last 100 years of American establishment journalism can be described as an era of so-called objectivity and the appearance of objectivity as the theoretical standards, I think what we're talking about uh, under which the organizations for both journalistic as well as commercial financial reasons wanted to project a neutrality uh, because, you know, Republicans buy Jordans too, right? Republicans buy sneakers too. The, the thing I think that we need to shift to in this moment is a values-based journalism. Uh, what we know, and we, those of us who cover politicians and organizations know this, right? Even organizations that portend to be neutral have values. Budgets are, are documents of values. What are you prioritizing? What are you not prioritizing, right? We know journalistically. We talk about our journalistic values, right? And so, we, so I think one of the things we want to think about in terms of a values-based journalism is a journalism that is unafraid to be direct and clear about what our values are. That doesn't mean that we lose rigor. That doesn't mean that we lose fairness. That doesn't mean that we don't seek to collect all of the information, but rather that on certain questions we recognize that we are, that, that we have a stance and, and that we are not disinterested parties in the conversation. And so for, for us, those of us who derive our uh, our professions from the First Amendment, from uh, the idea of a constitutional democracy, well, first of all, we have to remember that's not neutral. There are people who would say the First Amendment shouldn't exist, right? We, but to be pro-First Amendment is to take a political stance, which is something I think most journalists would pause for a second as they think about, but, but it is, right? Um, at the same time that we've grown up with generations of people saying journalists don't take political stances, we've had editors of the New York Times tattoo the First Amendment on themselves. Well, that's a political stance, right? And, and also kind of weird, a tattoo. A, a, anyway. The, so but, it's, a, it's a weird flex? Yeah, a little bit, right? You know, I really believe it. Look I love this government document so much that I'm, you know, but anyway, setting that aside, I, don't, I didn't mean to. But, but the point, rather, is we do. We are actors in our politics. We are actors in our society. And so it's important for us to know what our stances are and what our beliefs are and, and be willing uh, to stand up and advocate for them. I, I think the last thing I'll say um, is I also think we have to remember what our job is as journalists. And our job, first and foremost, is the accurate documentation of what is happening, writing down true things, right? I think that sometimes we can overinterpret the extent to which our job is to force and create change in the short term, to be believed by everyone, to be trusted by everyone, all of which are things I think are important and we want to think about. But Ida B. Wells would not have polled particularly well, nor would Frederick Douglass, nor would any number of people. Right? And their legacy as journalists is that 100 years out, what they wrote it was true. 
right? And I think too often in the conversations about trust and the conversations about mistrust and the conversations about this theoretical, what do we do now that none of the white Republicans trust the establishment press, we get too caught up in the idea that our legitimacy comes from the readers saying that they believe us or they believe we are objective. Our legitimacy comes from if the things we write down are true. And I think we have to remember that. At a time, you know, we stand on the shoulders of journalists who literally had their, their printing presses burned to the ground and were run out of town. And I think we have to have the wherewithal and the understanding that it's okay for us to be unpopular. It's okay for us to be attacked. It is not new. It is not, <laughs> it is not different. Um, and, and it is in some ways our job. Thank you, West Dave. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, it, it's really great to be here, and I think I agree. I mean, I know I agree with a lot of what um, has been said. I think that um, when we talk about pro-democracy in journalism, we are talking about a continuing a legacy of truth-telling, of hard truths, and of specifically a black press that has led the way on always seeing the inherent conflict between racism and democracy in this country. And, you know, Wes said it, but I don't think we have had a press that has been honest about that ever, frankly. Um, and so more, more so, I think that what we are doing is a job of continuing the, that legacy, of putting that in front of people who would rather not see it, right? So I view that as a call as a, as a mission that is incumbent on us. And I do so working in an institution that I know, like many of institutions, has been a part of shedding light on those in, injustices and also perpetuating them, right? Like, that is not just true at the New York Times. That is true across institutions and media that sold advertisements for slaves, right? That, that perpetuated myths about uh, uh, black and brown communities that created the justifications for lynching that is just as true in our media and in our legacies as is the good things that we have done, right? So it is a responsibility that we should take, that we should take very seriously. And, and I think it goes back to that question of accuracy. You know, we, it's not a mystery as to why we have the journalistic calibrations that we do, particularly in political reporting as they described, the view of political journalism as a, a distant observer that only is chronicling uh, a, a game between two sides is a view that served a white elite press that was covering it, right? It is not an accident that that, that viewpoint became the go-to for political journalism. That is a direct that is a direct consequence of the people who are doing said journalism, the people who are working those institutions. It is my role, I think, as a black person in that institution to, to put things um, that go beyond that in a language that folks can understand. Racism is not true, right? And so to me, it is a question of good reporting, right? We can talk about values reporting, we can talk about pro-democracy coverage, but if you do your job, you will prove it as false. You will prove it as, as, as unjust. You will prove it as worthy to be cared about. I cover elections, and I think this is actually an important distinction. I'm fully ranting now. But like, I, I'm a reporter. I don't think there's people you shouldn't talk to. Now, everyone here has different opinions about that. And that's fine, because we all are coming from different places. But I write about elections. And so that's important for me. It felt incumbent on me to go to the Trump rally to go ask them the question and to get them to say it to my face. I do not think that is a space that only white reporters should own. Mm -hmm. I think that's a place that we should own also. And I think that I say that knowing full well that that's not the thing that I think is incumbent on every person to do. That's the thing that comes with real emotional labor. That thing comes with real wild stuff that goes down. But in the same way that there is lack of trust among those communities, I learned how to talk to Trump voters by talking to black people about the legitimate reasons that media has hurt them. Those are the people whose lack of trust taught me how to convince someone to talk for a story, how to tell someone that I'll be accurate and fair and all of those things. But the same way I believe it with those communities, I believe it with everyone. And I think that people feel that from you. And if you're going to be a reporter, 
Not a writer, not a think piecer, not an opinion guy. All of those things are worthy things, to be clear. Those things are worthy things. But if you're going to be a reporter, you have to believe that because people won't talk to you otherwise. Pastor Estead with the good word. <laughs> <laughs> Truly. Sandra, what are you thinking about over there? So uh, first, I just want to say that I was not a political reporter in my background. I came up through local news. I also, um, for most of my uh, professional period in local news, covered cops and courts. And I found myself covering democracy issues when I was a reporter at Reveal from the Center for Investigative Reporting, who's honestly been doing incredible coverage on this topic and, and leading a pro-democracy uh, team of reporting on these issues and everything that's mentioned about political reporting I I hear and frankly it's why I chose a different path as a beat reporter because I just didn't know if I could do that type of work now I have the luxury of time and space to be able to think of systems and Really, when I think about the pro-democracy mandate for journalism, I'm thinking a lot about the criminalization of, of voting, of elections process, and I think as journalists, we should all be extremely concerned by how much this has ramped up, and frankly, I'm not seeing a lot of uh, local newsrooms dedicate the time and resources to have someone do this type of reporting separate from the political reporting that absolutely needs to go and talk to Trump supporters and talk to, uh, you know, Democrat uh, supporters as well. But I just think it's such an important time among local journalism in particular, just because I see that uh, they haven't quite gotten there, I think, um, in designating the needed resources, whereas you see national teams uh, national newspapers start to develop democracy teams, which when I was recruited to ProPublica, it was a newly formed no democracy team to be able to really think about whether it's the legislation that we're seeing or more currently uh, the talk about election integrity units, which one of the first things I would say for pro-democracy reporters is like, let's not lean on the language from people who are trying to restrict people from voting and trying to throw them in jail as a result of a, a mistake. We should be calling these election police and election enforcement units because that's what they are at the end of the day. And so these are the things that I'm thinking about as my role as an investigative journalist reporting on all these really critical um, issues at this time. You know, Cassandra, let's, let's push into that point of what's actually happening on the ground. I know, Wes, you mentioned this idea that the default position isn't a democracy state, right? There are forces, even within our newsrooms, that are actually anti-democratic and create barriers to access to true democracy. And so I wonder when we're having this kind of high-level conversation about what pro-democracy journalism means and centering democracy in our journalism, how that actually plays out in the newsroom. I know we have a lot of veterans here, a lot of young people who are thinking about these ideas too, but don't know how to implement them. How do we actually put into play and into place this idea of pro-democracy journalism? Well, I did not get a chance to have these discussions um, in previous newsrooms that I worked in. I'm glad they are happening in current newsrooms, that uh, the newsroom that I work for now, ProPublica. But I'm thinking about this crowd has a lot of young people and a lot of young journalists, uh, maybe or journalists who will soon go into entry level jobs. And I'm sure everyone on this panel who's been a reporter of color has gone through some serious microaggressions and also accusations of bias just because I happen to be born in a different country and now I'm trying to navigate you know, my space and my worldview in this country and seeing things that concern me just because of my upbringing, right? And so I never got a chance to do this, but what I would recommend any young journalists or journalists who are working in newsrooms that aren't designating the resource for it or aren't having these conversations is that there needs to be a conversation. I think of uh, one incident that happened uh, in 2019 when the state of Texas tried to purge uh, thousands of people from voter rolls. It was a Friday night news dump. And of course, the rhetoric from the press release was that these are non-citizens voting in our elections and it shouldn't be happening. And what happened? We just kind of regurgitated that straight from the press release. And it turned out to be a botched and extremely flawed way to systematically try to get, frankly, mostly Latinos off of the voter rolls. And there were institutions who were very quick 
to not to to run the press releases while there were others who said now wait a minute okay we're the state of Texas is alleging upwards of 95,000 people voting illegally in the election you know i want to give credit to the Texas Tribune which which really took its time on vetting that story and i think had the strongest coverage related to you know an incident like that but i think in retrospect Many news organizations are getting played, whether it's by politicians who know mm -hmm. they will run whatever press release they put out, or they just know that we don't have the resources we once did. And so we're like frazzled and stressed and we got to make deadline and we have a paper to fill. Um, and so we have to really consider that in the newsroom. And I think going back and kind of having those postmortems is hopefully a way to avoid those mistakes. Wes or Jay, what does this look like in practice, but also speak to the, the collision and the tension here when, again, as you mentioned, it almost sounds like a master's house or master's tools, right? Do we actually have the tools in these newsrooms to actually address this? And are there forces pushing back against this idea of democratizing in a way? Well, I, as I think about this conversation, and I was thinking through that example, right, I think one of the biggest enemies of accurate journalism, and therefore one of the biggest enemies of any type of values-based journalism or pro-democracy journalism, is the relative thoughtlessness that goes into a lot of journalism. Uh, that we very often uh, serve as, as simply magnifying glasses for the official statements of official people who have press officers uh, without much scrutiny of whether or not the things being said by them are true. Or, or are not, right, um, that we know, and, and look, I don't want to go all marks on us, right, but we also know that all of these things are because our journalism operates within a capitalistic mindset, right? A deadline is a construct of capitalism. You could just wait and not write the story until you figure out what's true or not, right? What would happen if, if the anchor came on at 8 p.m. and said, actually, we haven't figured out what's going on, so here's a rerun of Judge Judy, right? We'll come back to you and give you the news once we've done the journalism. But that would never happen. Wait, wait, wait. Wait until we've actually done all the work before we send it out to all of our people? We know that, right? All of these things that go into daily journalism are constructs of selling newspapers, right? They're not actually about informing readers in the best ways. It's not actually about, and I think that that, and it's, so it's very hard to divorce the things that don't work from the reality that almost every convention of everything we do is about making the family who owns your newspaper more money or making the guy who owns your cable network more money, right? Uh, we wouldn't do any of those, any of the things we do the way we do them were they not about making money. But, but beyond that, I do think, and so as, as we point to that, I think that the thing we focus on and can focus on is rigor. Do we know, have we called every person, have we talked to all of the folks, have we really done the due diligence to know that the things that we are putting out have, have weighed and balanced all of the available information, are transparent about the information we do not have, um, and have applied pressure in the correct ways? What I also think is true is I think if we had a better, and again, non-capitalistic value, journalistic value system, Right, it's in vogue right now to cover voter purges, a thing that has happened in every election ever. And where were we? Where were our democracy teams? And where were our right? And that's not a, that's not no slight. And a lot of my dear friends who are on those teams, right? And it's a great thing that we're doing them. But in the same way, you know, Tremaine, you and I spent a lot of time on the ground together in places like Ferguson and, and elsewhere, right? And I remember specifically in sometime in August or September 2014, a few weeks after Michael Brown's death, picking up the St. Louis Post-Dispatch and they had a big front page feature looking at the police diversity in all of the different uh, police departments. And I remember thinking both, this is really good journalism and also why did no one do it the day before Michael Brown was dead? That all of this work that we have suddenly decided we need to do, frankly, collectively establishment journalism, we are many days and many dollars short. Uh, we have now reached the crisis and we're going, ah, maybe we should look into how democracy functions in our country, right? And, and, and again, that, I don't mean that to be discouraging, but I think that we have to be willing to accept and acknowledge that a lot of what we have done has not actually serviced the, the, the thing we now claim or now want to claim that we support and that we realize, right? That, look, if... Democracy was on the ballot if it's been brought to the brink. It was brought to a brink in a year that CNN made $1 billion and the Post and the Times were both profitable. 
that doesn't seem like a news environment that feels like democracy is on the brink. It feels like an environment where we're padding cash and revenue and, and having fun, right? That we're having Gatsby parties as democracy burns. And I think that's something we have to be aware of and we have to be thinking about, right? If, if we want to match the, the rhetoric that, that many of us are employing, which I think is accurate and I think is fair, I think we have to be willing to actually behave that way financially. Second, and then I'll shut up, I think we have to be historically informed. And I, I mentioned that earlier, but I think it's hyper important in this moment that too many of us as reporters wake up with amnesia every morning. It's the first time this has ever happened and this is it. And, and the reality is there's nothing close to that, right? That we, even with former President Trump, who we like to believe and like to frame as a singular figure, the reality is he's in no way a singular figure in our politics. Any honest look at, at the rise of the second version of the Klan in the 1920s would, would show that Donald Trump is just the, and his movement is the exact same thing that this country went through exactly 100 years ago uh, following Reconstruction. Um, any honest look at the rise and the appeal, whether it be of David Duke's campaigns in Louisiana or George Wallace's campaigns with just one or two things different, he ends up being the president of the United States. It's very hard for us to have that honest reckoning, I think. And I think if we were, I think as journalists, it's our jobs not to just be students of what's happening today in front of us, but also students of history and to bring that history into our contemporary conversation at a time where literacy rates are falling, where civics are being taught differently, where the average American knows less. I think public history is increasingly a part of what good journalism needs to be. Jay, the ecosystem that Wesley laid out there is, is wrought with all these different forces, not the least of which money and diversity issues, but how do we apply this kind of centering of democracy in our journalism in real life, given, as he laid out, it's, it's, it's a wild landfill out there. Well, I think it's starting to happen a bit in newsrooms that have recruited people of color and, and members of groups that traditionally were not represented in the newsroom. Um, many of those young journalists in places like the LA Times, New York Times, big city newspapers or coast to coast uh, don't have the same ideas as previous generations. And when they are asked to represent a point of view that's been missing from our newsroom, but also show that you can be objective and professional, they uh, react to that as a contradiction, which it is. And there's no guarantee that the succeeding generations of journalists recruited into the American newsrooms are gonna see the problem of objectivity the same way the bosses do. I don't think they do. I think they're starting to kind of revolt against that point of view. And if they do revolt, they're going to find, as Wesley just suggested, that American history has many rich examples of public service journalism that had nothing to do with neutrality and objectivity. In fact, when people say things like the traditional objectivity of the American press, they're actually talking about a, a relatively small period of time, a parenthesis, roughly 1920 to 2020. Before and after that, I think the history looks really different. So if we are going to realize this dream, as it were, of a, of a more explicitly pro-democracy press, we need memory, yes, uh, but we also need to shift the lines of conflict. It's gonna take something like, instead of fixating on Democrats versus Republicans, journalists are gonna to have to start fixating on opponents of elected de democracy and supporters, and bring that conflict into the newsroom with as much um, uh, continuity as they did Democrats versus Republicans. And in that situation, some of what we heard today could be really valuable. Uh, Steve Levitsky, for example, earlier today said in Democracies That Die, um, losers don't accept losing. Uh, they don't reject violence. They um, are unwilling to break with extremists of their, among their supporters. Those are some of the, d the dangerous warning signs. So what we're gonna need in a pro-democracy newsroom is journalists who are alert to those things, 
and are willing to classify politicians as a danger to democracy and train on those people the kind of critical attention that will get the attention of the public. And doing that is very different than simply standing in the middle between Republicans and Democrats and reporting to us who's winning. I said, how do you apply this as a straight up newsman, right? How do you apply this in the real world? It cut from that old good cloth of just, I'm a straight up newsman. <laughs> Uh, news boy. Um, I, I feel like... Uh, I put that on a shirt or a hat, a news boy. <laughs> well, I think that I would be honest with young black reporter. It's hard. Mm -hmm. Like, the story isn't going to be approved. <laughs> it's not. They won't believe you. They don't know the people you care about. And the political parties don't either. Mm -hmm. So that's what you're up against, I would say. <laughs> Just that. Um, I would say that that's still a reason for you to care. That's a, even more so of a reason for you to care. I think that the job of journalism is to know what all those people are missing. And so um, I would first be honest by saying, one, there should not, and someone said this really earlier today, I do not think that there should be a presumption that working in white uh, media is necessary. It's not. Two, if you are, Oh, it's not. <laughs> See, if you're someone who works for the New York Times and CNN, it ain't. Two, um, if you do, it's hard, right? Back to the things that we're going to say. Um, but at the same time, I think that what you have to your advantage is the fact that our politics right now refuses for those issues to be left aside, mm -hmm. right? I came to the Times in 2018. So... And I remember thinking, I, I, here's a true story. Like, I remember going to my first Trump rally in, 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 um, in New Hampshire when I was working at the Boston Globe. And I remember thinking, I am about to show these people how it's done, you know? Like, these people can't write about politics, and I'm about to call out some lies, you know? And then you go there, and it's so much harder. Like, I would suggest you go, honestly. The speaker, the crowd, the atmosphere, you look at the page on deadline and you don't know where to start, right? So, that, so, so, so these are the constructs of what we're doing. I still, think that's a, I still don't think that's an excuse, right? I used to write about crime in, in, in Boston and there was like, and when something happens, you don't have an excuse of whatever, whatever. Like you can't go to that family and say, I only had two hours, that's why I messed up your kid's name. Like, I only had three hours, that's why I didn't include, like, like, a larger thing. Like, I don't think that's a real reason, right? I think it's about prioritizing, but you get better at it by doing a practice of it, and you start to be better in the cadence. Um, I, would also, I, would, I would also say, I do not work from the presumption that people care about the people I care about. That's not my pitch in the newsroom. I am not saying, hey, go cover black people because they matter even though they matter. <laughs> I'm, I'm talking about elections. You should cover them because otherwise you're missing the country. Otherwise, you, you won't know where this election goes, right? We wake up the day after the 2016 election, and it's not just that polls are wrong, it's that political reporting missed the baselines of where both members of the parties were, right? That requires you not just taking the info that the parties are telling you because the parties do not know them either. That requires you going and finding other ways, being more creative to do that work. But your pitch to editors is that when you pull that off, you get the best scoop imaginable. You get a scoop that the parties don't see. You get a scoop that, that the cable news isn't talking about. You get something that is on a pulse of people who do affect stuff. Like, I don't write about Washington, this last thing I'll say, is like, and I don't think I really would be very good at it, frankly. Um, what I like about elections is that everybody's vote counts the same. And so that's the only justification I am looking for, is you cover these people because if you ignore Latinos in America, you will miss every election going forward. If you don't talk about black people, you will literally not know who the Democratic nominee is going to be every single presidential cycle. Like, these are the reasons to do it because they actually matter, but I do not work from the, from the moral presumption because I have learned in my time that that is a losing argument. Mm -hmm. 
Jay, you mentioned something really important in the very beginning of this conversation. You said one of the political parties in this country is anti-democracy, and they're operating as such. And I wonder, as journalists are going out trying to cover these stories, given the, the way partisanship has been weaponized here, is there something at its core of this kind of reporting partisan? And I'm sure more than one person on this panel has been called a partisan hack. I know at least one, right? But how do they grapple with these ideas when one party is actively operating against democracy? Um, it comes up a lot when I try to argue with newsrooms that they have to become more pro-democracy. Frequently, they say back to me, oh, so you mean pro-Biden? No, that's not what I mean. Uh, and I think the confusion there is that um, they assume their worst fear is what we're talking about, which is that the journalist picks sides and becomes an activist, right, for his preferred party, or her for preferred party. And editors and, and other so, uh, self-named traditionalists are constantly trying to avoid that. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about having a single standard of supporting democracy and how it operates for both parties single standard for both parties. And if, in the application of that standard, one of the two parties has turned anti-democratic, it is incumbent on journalists to report that fact. And so you don't need any new values, really. You don't need to go outside of traditional journalism to find the means to become more pro-democracy. It's built in to journalism in the first place. So that's what it is. It's, it's applying the same standards for what it takes to be a democracy to both parties. And if one of the parties fails that uh, standard, then we've got to redesign our coverage because we're in a new situation. And that's what Jonathan Carl was saying. He was saying none of the things that we normally use to, in, to cover presidential candidates can apply to Donald Trump in his second campaign because he's broken all of the conventions. What do you say, Cassandra? Uh, I, as uh, Jay was speaking, I felt, uh, I wanted to give a shout out to the Latin American press corps because I actually think they have been some of the best contemporary pro-democracy reporters in America. And I think back to before January 6th happened, I got a call from my mom, and uh, she was saying, mija, there's going to be a golpe de estado at the Capitol. And a golpe de estado is a, a, a coup. So the Spanish press was reporting already what they found to be a deviation of the standard that was norm in America. And I hope that that model from the reporters at Univision or Reforma and other institutions is acknowledged and looked at as how we can do better and hopefully not repeat some of those same mistakes. Mm. Um, and I'll just close with you know that little shout out because I feel like that's one thing that um, hasn't been talked about as much today and it was uh, really resonating with me when I was thinking about that moment um, when the press kind of acknowledged, I think, in full force, uh, what suddenly became a, a reprehensible uh, day on January 6th, that seemed to have really shocked, I would say, American news institutions, but there were other institutions of journalists who were working in America that were recognizing that the rails of democracy were, were faltering. Stead, how, how do you handle that, especially the way things have been weaponized, and even like poll workers have been, who've been uncontroversial in the past, are all of a sudden mechanisms in this anti-democratic action? I think we have to speak clearly and directly to where the threats from democracy are coming from. Uh, and I think that that is a Republican Party that has been uh, largely taken over by an anti-democratic wing, like that Trump represents. And I think that it's actually, though, I think when we think about democracy coverage, uh, we can be, like, not creative. And I think that leads to the thinking that it will be just the kind of Democrat rah-rah session. Like, the Democratic Party has done their fair share to end up where the system is, where it is. 
Absolutely. And, and that is not hard to say. <laughs> that is not something we should run from saying. And I think under the standard in which we are talking about, it becomes easy to say both of those things. I remember being in a, a, a journalism room that will remain unnamed and arguing for us using um, the word racist. And I remember someone saying, um, uh, bringing up when Joe Biden called Obama articulate. And they were like, well, would you say it then? And they actually thought that was like a stumper question. I was like, duh. You know, like, yeah, that was racist. Like, I mean, like, it's like crazy. Like, as if I, as a reporter, would have any difficulty applying that standard either way. But I think that is, I mean, that's racism, right? That is what we're, that is what we're talking about. I don't really think people think that, um, you know, and I would also say the Democratic Party has benefited from our unwillingness to come at them and race directly. And they actually weaponize, as someone who covered the presidential trail, you will tell a Democrat that the policy they're doing is racist and they will tell us we're not Donald Trump, right? They get away with stuff because of our willing, unwillingness to diversify. They get away with stuff because we don't have a press conference where people can go at them that this isn't actually reflective of black community, right? Like there is a political establishment that is united um, that I think if we were to do our job to the fullest of our abilities, if we were to embrace a democracy standard, if we were to embrace a value standard, if we were to, to, to bring in people who do not have that same lens of objectivity, that would, hurt, that, that, would, that would apply equally to Republicans and Democrats. Well, and I, I would just add really quick to that. I, I think that all of that builds out of, we, t we talk a lot publicly about the idea of access and access journalism. I actually think the public conversation largely misses where this actually shows up in journalism, right? Um, that it ends up being like a big conversation about people's book advances and not a conversation about actual daily journalism as it's created, right? The, the reality is, is, especially as it relates to political coverage, right, but I think also true across the board, right, is that w when it comes to access, we have a manifestation of what I actually think undergirds a lot of the problems in journalism, and it's when our values uh, intersect with our interests. Right, it's in my value to tell the truth about what's happening, but it's in my interest to have this person return my call in the future. It's, it's my value to uh, tell the truth about what's happening, but it's in my interest for you to pick up the paper or to keep watching the television show right now. We just had an election. Uh, election nights are my least favorite nights in all of journalism. The reason I say that is because I sit with the television on for hours and learn nothing. There's nothing that any cable network needs to tell me at 7 p.m. on election night. They don't know what's going to happen. They, like, they literally don't know. <laughs> they also don't know at 8 or at 9 or at 10. There are all types of fascinating, interesting ways you could use all of that time with such a big captive audience. And instead, we're just like looking at this, we're literally looking at a map, refresh. And each time going, well, now everything's changed. Maybe it's different. a remarkably inefficient way of informing anyone about anything. Our value would be about informing people of what's happening in the country, but their interest is, how do we make you watch us? Key race alert, this is going on, just coming in. It's, it's this constant sensational, right? I don't want to pick on our friends in cable news, but, Please don't. but the point, Tremaine doesn't do that. I don't do that. But the point, rather, is, at an actual journalist level, the individual journalist level, much less at the staff level or at a team level, right? The reality is it's in the interest of any major paper, any major outlet to have people who Donald Trump's advisors, much less mainstream Republicans, return their phone calls. Well, what happens when there's a social cost and we know this as journalists of color, women journalists know this, gay journalists, when just being who you are is a thing that a subsection of people are going to use to ascribe to you a bias. I remember talking to a very prominent black political uh, reporter, one of the best, and, and she, I remember we were sitting at, uh, it was three of us sitting at a brunch and, and we were talking about this. All of us worked in Washington, I do the least politics, both of them do more. And, and she's saying, yeah, the reality is when you're a black political reporter and you call a Republican operative, they assume that Black Lives Matter is calling them. It doesn't matter, and this is someone who by any measure would be considered balanced and straight and objective. 
having this conversation with me, someone who constantly gets critiqued for not being that way, that what some of us know by the nature of our lived experiences is that no matter what we do to try to play this game, we end up losing the game. And so because of that, I think that's why so many of us have been at the leading edge of rejecting the rules of this game that do not serve us and do not serve our journalism. And so, again, I think there is a real question. There is a real difficulty. I think it is important that our newsrooms have people who can talk to and get to all types of different people. But, but I think if we're going to have an honest conversation about why we do not describe some of these things accurately, why there is such resistance to adapting a more values-based model, the reality is, is that some of my white political reporter friends had to enforce a set of values in the conversations, they would stop getting their calls returned. And they don't want that. And, and that's why we don't see that happening. As amazing as this has been, I feel like we're just getting started, but I wanna make sure we save some time for the audience. So even though I have questions, I wanna turn it over to you guys. Is there anyone who has a question? I believe there should be mics set up somewhere. I'm not sure where they are exactly. Let's start right here in the front. The young lady with the, uh, the mask. I'm not sure where the mics are. There we go. I think my students say I'm the old lady with the mask. Um, <laughs> my name is Nicole Carr. I'm a reporter at ProPublica. Hey, off Slack. We haven't met in person yet, Sandra and I. And uh, I teach a social justice journalism course at Morehouse College. Um, I teach the students that facts are non-negotiable, but framing is an absolute choice. And that part of your job is uh, creating the first draft of history. So to think of your job in that way. Um, we also share what happens in the field and the emotional toll, the, the toll that it takes to get out there. So if you do not occupy the space, you cannot participate in pro-democracy journalism. My question to the panel is, can you address self-care? <laughs> because none of what we are talking about is possible if we burn out, if we stop believing that there's a point to it, if we fight internally and get offended by being seen as biased or not objective because of who we are. So what do you do to take care of yourself so that you can continue to occupy the space and do the work that you are called to do? This is a big, rich question, so make sure you just kind of keep it tight, though, so we can get to more. Well, I just want to say, personally, for all the journalists, like, journalism should not be your hobby. It shouldn't be the only thing that you do. I'm always very weary of journalists who, like, that's all they got going on. Um, because you need to be a well-balanced person or you will run into burnout and all that, that, that type of stuff. So I would say uh, therapy helps me uh, confront the issues of racism that I deal with on this job, um, as well as running. I'm a big runner. I like to run competitively. That's like my thing. And cooking, you know, find what it is that gives you joy, invest it may be very difficult to invest the same amount of time into those things as you do with journalism, but I, you know, you try to at least have some balance there. I have to disconnect, be intentional about disconnecting. Oh yes, and being intentional about disconnecting, yes. That's it. Oh, I, I, I wish I had healthier things to say. Um, Austin. <laughs> uh, You're great at decor. Oh, thank you. Know, you know, I yeah. saw that, yes. I would say really like, I, my honest answer is I come to stuff like this. Like, black, like, and a BJ every year makes me feel like I can keep going. And I feel like actually being with real people who are like the, who are the people you write about um, inspires me and makes me feel like whatever is happening, whatever it took to do the story is almost always, if it's a good story, is always worth it, in my opinion. Like, I've yet to find a story that I cared about even that took a long and ridiculous process, that if you follow through and it's about folks you care about and you think it's an important story, it'll, it, you'll, you'll, you will feel that at the end. And so I guess, I, I, I guess it can feel really isolating and I think reporting is something that can feel, I think this is particularly true during pandemic where I was covering the trail, I was on the trail, I was at like Trump rally to Trump rally 
like by myself, there was no newsroom, right? All of this stuff. But you're not alone, right? Like we come from a long history and a long community of people who are fighting these fights. And there's people who are, and there's people who it matters for too. So that's what I tell myself at least. Yeah, like I said, I, I typically defer this question to people who have a good answer for it. Um, but I've gotten a little better at it over the years. I do think that community is extremely important and community not just within journalism, but outside of journalism. Uh, I think beyond that, I, I do think it's important. It's not just, this is not just true in our profession, it's true in many professions, but the reality is journalism cannot be your personality. It is your profession. Um, and I think that is something that I, I, frankly, I think at a time when so many journalists aren't being paid the way they should, when we're having to, ex when they're being forced or asked to accept uh, standards that don't really work for them, uh, I think it's increasingly become that uh, as a means to try to justify why we're doing it this way. And I think that's really important. I think that sort of set of perspective is really important at just a personal level, but also in terms of not taking ourselves too seriously. Right? Walking down the street, I walk down the street in my neighborhood, no one knows who I am, and I appreciate that. Right? And that in the real world, no one cares that like I wrote this op-ed and did this thing, like it doesn't matter, right? And I think that that really matters because that's the community I come from, that's the community I care about, right? Um, yeah, so I think that's primarily it. I mean, trying to invest as much in myself, whether it be my time with friends, whether it be cooking, whether it be therapy, like all that is, is important, investing as much in myself as I do into my work and, and being able to say no. Um, and then also, you know, leaning into the things that reward me or refresh me, whether it be music or playing basketball or stuff like that. I just wanted to note uh, really quickly, the, the, if you guys haven't checked it out, Nicole did an amazing investigation earlier this year um, out of Georgia uh, that she published with ProPublica that everyone should make sure to check out. It's one of my favorite things of journalism this year. Excellent. I... Oh, we already have it? Yep. Um, hello, my name is Nicola Carter from um, North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University. <laughs> it's a long title. <laughs> but my question was um, kind of to sum up all of the sessions, and I feel like this is a great way to, um, this is a great panel to ask it. Um, essentially, considering that American is run on a constitution, quite literally a document that never considered marginalized groups to begin with, is it a good thing to, I guess, think that the demolition of democracy is almost inevitable unless it has total reform. Is it inevitable? Who wants to take that one? Jay, I, I see your brain is cranking. I, I didn't hear the end of the, the, the last thing that you said, so I can't. Okay, I was, <laughs> I was basically saying the fact that the documents that are governing this company that we still go by were never made to consider marginalized groups to begin with, which is what democracy is kind of fighting for. So is it, I guess, reasonable to believe that is in, like democracy is inevitably going to demolish unless we totally reform it? It's gonna have to burn down first. I think the, I, the notion that we have been presented with at this event and recently more often is that American democracy really began in 1965. I've come to believe that myself. I think that's true. And we never really had it in the thought we did and we, and we told ourselves that. Uh, I learned as a grade school student about the glories of American democracy, but it was, in a way, it was a lie. And that brings the fight for constitutional democracy into the present. It's like we, we're, we're actually still trying to be a democracy rather than we've always been a democracy. We're still trying to be that. And th that's where I think our professional journalists need to give us a hand, not that they have to become the doers of all the action or that they have to join up and 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 be, and and become part of this side or that side, but that we are still trying to become a democracy and journalists have to learn how to give us help. And I think as journalism has professionalized in the 20th century, it began to take a democratic social order more and more for granted mm -hmm. as if it would always be there no matter what they did. And that was false. It was a mistake, it was a wrong turn. I would also say, and this is not a direct response to your question, but I do think that there can be some idea that only um, 
liberals or only people who believe in democracy are kind of having this discussion. And one of the things that's really, that was really clear in the work that I've done over the last four or five years, but particularly in, the, in this podcast we did the run up, um, which was a lot in a lot of places about Republicans and about base Republicans, they too are having this combo. And it is very, uh, Republicans when you, like Trump voters if you ask them, will really articulate that America was a republic, not a democracy, and that the demographic changes in the country basically means democracy and is an obstacle for them to maintain political power. And that is why they are not into it. Like, it makes perfect logical sense, right? But there can be, the, there can be a, a failure to believe that these people have actively thought about this or that somehow their anti-democracy position is a passive one. It is an active one. And they see it as the central fight for where this country is going. And so Tuesday notwithstanding, it's coming. <laughs> like the fight, the discussion, the openness of it is, cannot be marginalized because it is the organizing principle of the conservative grassroots at this moment. I don't know if we have a hard out, but can we get two more questions? So let's get one more. Is the mic being passed around already? Oh, she got you. Hola, my name is Fernando Soto. I'm the CEO and publisher of Nuestro Estado, which I founded after working for Sinclair Broadcast Group as a gay, undocumented man. Um, and so my question is about accountability, and Cassandra, I really appreciated you highlighting Spanish language media uh, and acknowledging the threats to democracy that we face in this country. But Sinclair owns over 180 local stations. We haven't talked about them. We've been in many spaces where we don't talk about the threat, local news, and the role it has to play in democracy. And after Tuesday, I've seen a lot of Sinclair stations post about Donald Trump repeating the same things they did in 2015 and 2016. So my question is, how do we hold our own colleagues accountable publicly and out loud? A great question. Can I do an ill-advised retweet of this right now? I 100% think a media reporting universe is way too online, focuses way too much on elite media institutions, and completely misses the massive nature of that media story. Anybody else want to take that one? I mean, the stud said it, so I don't have to. Um, the, I, I agree with that. I, I think that, I do think we do a very poor job of this. And I think that we do a poor job of it in part because I think we are naturally, we being the collective journalism world, are very loath to criticize other journalists or other journalism organizations, especially in a time when we feel as if uh, the idea of a free press is coming under attack from bigger and larger forces. But the reality is, I think we all have to confront and deal with the role that the press has played in getting us to this moment. And that is both the elite mainstream press, it, frankly, it is also uh, big major organizations that we have pretended as if are good faith actors when they have very clearly never been. And we've been too willing and it's been too acceptable for us to look the other way and pretend as if that's not true. And, and so I, I agree with the said. I think that, you know, frankly, I, don't, I think the state of media reporting isn't the best in that I, I think that too much of it is too gossipy and too high-end and elite. There's not very much accountability. It doesn't come from a place of values in and of itself. Media reporters are very rarely referees of the media in any way. Uh, there's very little writing about whether or not a piece is good or not. Um, or if it's doing the thing, it's doing the right way. And I think that there could be much more of that. Um, but beyond that, I, I think what we also have to think about, and, and, and this is, you know, going from the last question, and then I'll tighten this up. Democracy is an idea. It's a value. It's not a thing that's created by a document or a constitution. We are not the only ones with it. We didn't invent it. We didn't make it up, right? It's, it's one of the reasons, again, and I don't need to pick up Jill Abrams, said why I wouldn't tattoo a part of a document on myself, because I don't believe, because, because the reality is there's a, there's a world in which the most democratic version of America is one with a totally different constitution that 
ourselves or our kids or our grandkids are rewriting it, are coming up with new rules, right? There's a world where there's a better version of the First Amendment that better grapples with the issues we deal with now around hate speech and difficulty and incitement, right? We are not the only Western democracy. We're not the only people who've grappled with this, right? That our allegiance as reporters and as journalists need to be to ideas and values, not to any specific type of governance or governing, be it the two parties, be it the conventions, be it not. And so I think that, but beyond that, I think that that specific allegiance, the way we've become, so many of us have become allegiant to a very specific thing, the First Amendment as written, the concept of the free press as we understand it currently, the sensitivities to political actors attacking it, I think it's one of the reasons that very often we don't hold our own accountable because we don't want to be seen as anti-First Amendment. Folks, we don't want to be seen as criticizing the media. We sympathize with the media. And what was it really the local news's fault? They don't have any money. What are we supposed to do? And I think we do all of that at our own peril. Y'all are going to get me in trouble with these great questions, but let's get one more. Whoever's passing the mic around. Can we get over here in the green, or you already got somebody? OK. Sorry about that over there. Sorry about that. <laughs> Uh, I'm Calvin Hall. I'm the chair of the Department of Mass Communication at North Carolina Central University. Good to see you again, Tremaine. Uh, my question is, is, I guess it's probably a fairly facile one, but it's about a word that we've, been, we've heard kind of thrown around um, all day, and, and that's truth. Um, what is truth? We talk about it here, and then I'm pretty sure in the mirror universe where there's a pro-fascist summit, they're having the same discussion about truth, but what is it and what informs it from a journalistic perspective? Well, in journalism, truth comes down to a more prosaic routine, which is verification. I mean, the, to me, the religion of journalism is verification. Can this be verified? Do we know it actually happened? If you're the sort of person who asks himself, did that actually happen? You're going to be good for journalism because that's the heart of it, mm -hmm. verification. And truth is a slightly more grandiose, abstract notion that invites people to argue about it, your, your truth, my truth. The people who are great at reporting, which is the basic craft in journalism, are experts in verification. And so when I want to think about truth in journalism, that's where I start. I, I would echo that. I, I think that I think that one of the things we want to be uh, honest about is the humility that that good journalism has to include, right? That there are there are things that we are that there are things we're going to be able to proactively verify that happened, things that were said on this panel that we can verify by finding a recording of it or by talking to a bunch of people and figuring out what they remembered or who was taking the best notes and the, right. But it's, but it's very hard as in writing about what happened on this panel for us to, uh, to land at bigger truths. Was this an impassioned panel? Was it a dour panel? Was it a, well, there's a subjectivity to that. And you may walk out of this room believing that your impression and perception of what happened was X, and this is a fact and this is true, and someone else might walk out of it differently. Right, very often in journalism, it's our job to recreate circumstances at which we were not present and in which multiple people believe different things about what happened. And, and, I, and so I think that we can simultaneously respect the nuances and complexities of human experience while understanding that rigor requires us to apply as much pressure of verification as possible, right? And so... It, it's, it's certainly, and so this is where I think it, it factors in, right? And I think there's a risk. I'm someone who's talked a lot about the need for us to be willing to be truthful. If the weight of the available evidence suggests a thing, we should not pull our punch, right? We know what the definition of racism is. There's a dictionary definition of it, right? Um, if if the, the weight of the evidence suggests a thing stated by someone is racist, we should be willing to describe it as such. But, but what's also true is that there are going to be cases where when we apply rigor and, and the rigor of our journalism, we can't land on a black and white, this definitively is what happened, this is definitively what is true. And in those cases, it's important for us to sit in that nuance and that complexity, right? But I think the thing that 
has plagued our journalism for so long is that things that fall out of the accepted status quo beliefs, and those are beliefs that have been defined by whiteness more so than any other construct in establishment journalism, right? When something cuts against the sensibility of that belief, suddenly the bar is higher. And suddenly, it's, we're not allowed to describe this person as racist. Instead, we need to write a long anecdote about how they happen to stumble in front of us and do something comically racist. Show, don't tell. We, we hear that invoked all the time, which is a remarkable argument against nut graphs. The reality is, as journalists, we do all the reporting, then we write down what we figured out, unless it's about racism, in which case we can't do that. And I think that is the key, and I think that's the key that, and, and again, because of those sensibilities, very often as journalism organizations, we don't even do that rigor, that it falls to Ida B. Wells to go town by town through the South to prove what happened in all these lynchings. Because not only were, was the New York Times unwilling to entertain the idea that they were happening, they certainly were unwilling to invest the resources to figure out the complexities and the nuances as to why. And I think what our generation of journalists are calling for are a recommitment to that rigor. And I think that that, we know, we will never fully know voice of God what happened in a room we were not in. But we do know that when we apply journalistic rigor, much more is knowable than just simply quoting what two different people say has happened. Mm -hmm. I'll try to say things. I agree with all of that they say. I'll try to add some value. Like, I um, remember being in a, um, a DEI session a couple years ago where, yeah, where I was I'm pretty sure the only black person. And yeah, there's the essay right there. And I um, remember there was a question. You have to move your marker over to, like, um, journalists should write about their own experience, write about the experiences they have. They should write their truth. That's, should that, do you agree or disagree? And I remember sitting there like, what is journalism then? You know? Like, what do we, what do we do in this for if you can't trust me to write about other people? I shouldn't be a reporter. Like, the verifiable transparency, fairness, accuracy are the core values. And if you can't live up to that, why are we here? And I feel like that has been the, the, the kind of removal, like to act as if there is an objective standard that's going to come to define what truth is, is both unlikely, and if that standard does come, it certainly won't be a truth that includes black folks. And so I feel like I have removed myself from waiting for that reality to happen. And in that situation, where Wes is totally right, there's a completely higher bar for telling our truths, things that we know to be factual, and we have known it since the day we were born, right? There's totally a higher bar. But I've also come to embrace that higher bar. It's like, I, that is the reason, you know, I wrote a story about us in St. Cloud, Minnesota, about people who wanted to kick immigrants out of their town, kick Somali immigrants out of their town. And that requires me, that requires, to get that story in the paper, I went to St. Cloud, I spent a week with those people. I went to their planning sessions about how to remove immigrants. I went to the parks. They like, they're, 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 they wear these hats. They call themselves trip, like CCC, you know? Like it is all, and, and living with that got me the quotes where they set their explicit racism on record that I could then put in the paper, not use the word racist, but everyone knows. If you want to do that work, it is there for you to be done, but that is the bar we are talking about that you're going to have to clear. I think that puts the onus on reporting, right? And so to me, fine, I will take, I will bet on myself as a reporter that I can go there, they will say it, I can ask the right questions, they will say it, and it will become so clear, I don't need the word or not, you know? But it is wrong that that bar exists. This was indeed a master class. Jay, Wes, Estea, Cassandra, all of you, thank you so very much. A fitting way to end the summer. Thank you very much.
All right, I know y'all were cheering because you're ready to go get these drinks, but just a few more minutes. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you for that amazing panel. Do we still have energy left? This has been a long, but I hope fulfilling day for all of us. Uh, there you, come on, man, bring it back down. Nope, nope, nope. Okay, I wanna thank everyone for spending the day with us today at our inaugural Center for Journalism and Democracy, Democracy Summit. Thank you. This has been a long day of pretty intense learning, and I want to thank you all for your commitment to the work that we are all called to do. As we close, I want to thank the servers and the maintenance staff who made this room beautiful and took care of us all day. I'd also like to thank the event staff because planning and orchestrating this event has been like a wedding and these are the people who make these events special for us. So thank you to the event staff. I want to acknowledge all of our moderators for their stewardship of this converse, these conversations today. This isn't easy to do, so thank you, Daniel Holly, Jason Johnson, and Tremaine Lee. Your professionalism and skill navigating these complex conversations was truly something to behold, so thank you to our moderators. <laughs> and to the practicing journalists and the students who will soon follow into this profession, I hope you feel more prepared to step into our pro-democracy mandate without qualification or apology. I hope you've all learned some important historical and political context that will empower you and strengthen your journalism. And I hope that you will leave here feeling called into our power because we enter this field because we understand how much power we wield. But are we wielding that power for justice? For many of you, this may be your first time at Howard at the Mecca. It may be your first time at a historically black college or university, but I hope it will not be your last. We hope you will join us in the work of the center and partner with the center as we try to reshape our field and provide opportunities for students who have been historically left out. There's much for us to do, but this is precisely the place to do it on a campus where black students and scholars over generations have thrived, believing in the potential of our imperfect democracy and have remained dedicated to making it whole. Today, as always, we are hopeful and we celebrate the possibility of what is to come. So with that, I want to thank you again for joining us. I myself am very much looking forward to toasting the inauguration of the Center for Journalism and Democracy and raising a glass or two uh, those students, you got to show ID, uh, to the fact that democracy lives on to fight another day. So, okay, go ahead. <laughs> no, you all, I mean, you truly, truly honor me and the uh, staff of the center uh, with your presence here. And I have one more treat for you all. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce the Howard University Showtime Marching Band, which will give you an amazing HBCU welcome reception. So please welcome the Showtime Marching Band. You may process out, the band is out in the lobby. I thought they were coming in here, y'all, my bad. 